You're most welcome for colleagues that have already arrived here. Thank you for, for, for timekeeping. We appreciate. And thank you for spending your valuable time. Today, I will be the MC of this science fair, today and tomorrow. I will be, my co-MC will be Sarah, uh, who is there, who will be co-MCing with me this specific function. And we continue to celebrate IDI at 20 years, a remarkable achievement that we have all achieved as a team, as a group. Uh, and the foundation was laid by the founders whom we all know. And the, the science theme for 2023 is derived in line with IDI at 20 celebration, which is celebrate and inspire. So we are celebrating the 20 years and all the achievement we have got, but we aspire for the next 20 years. And this has been possible with the support of our funders, founders first, collaborators, and the staff. The most valuable asset the institution has is actually the, the, the staff. Sorry. So we, we, we are on time. And Edward, how many people are online? I think there should be a hand, over 100 now. There should be over 100 people online. And there are some people streaming on tube. I realized yesterday when we were having executive breakfast, when I came back to the office, many people actually were on YouTube. They were actually updating, updating us on what happened, which was actually remarkable. The power of virtual, <laughs> virtual platforms, accessibility of information, and accessibility of profile. So today's program, I think registration is going on board, it's already going, and I want to encourage the members online. Chris, I don't know, they are supposed to register. Is there a link? They, okay, they automatically register because we need accountability, because at the end we need to produce a report on how this financial attendance was. So we have today's program, we shall have, currently we're in registration, and members, there's a registration desk outside there. So if you're not registered for, for other members, please, Let's have oh, let's pick a sheet and help our colleagues register. We shall have a plenary, an opening plenary session, and this will be the welcome remarks will be made by Dr. Andrew, our executive director, and then we shall have to Dr. Barbara giving a talk about the introduction of the research department. Then we shall move to our keynote address for today, where Dr. Andrew will introduce. Our, f our, our speaker, who is Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell, and then we shall have a break after that. We will then proceed for to other plenary sessions, and that will be shared by Sarah after that. And then after lunch, we shall have other sessions going on board. So we want exactly start at appropriate time, uh, I, 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 because we, are, we, we already have uh, many members online, and we want to keep time. So in about three minutes, we should be able to start with over 100 attendants online. And I want to encourage our colleagues who are outside, our senior management members, that we are starting the next three minutes, that they could come and take, take, uh, have their seats, that we are able to start it appropriately. Thank you so much. In the next three minutes, I will be back here to start the sessions officially. Thank you so much.
Yala. No, one of our cherished values is timekeeping. <laughs> Time is money. So uh, I had to be back here at exactly nine <laughs> because that's what we had the program to start with. And I'm very glad and excited to see the numbers in virtual numbers and also see the presence of our board members, our senior management colleagues, and our IDI dedicated staff, the key resource we have. We are celebrating because of the achievement of all the building blocks each of us has contributed. So we would want to go straight to our opening, opening plenary. Okay, I was trying to look for Dr. Andrew's profile here, but now I don't see, I will, I will introduce him the way I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So in our opening plenary, we, at, we are going to start with opening remarks of the science fair, which is part of the IDA at 20 celebration. And I have an honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew, who by there happened to be my first immediate supervisor at IDI, and uh, we, we worked closely well, and I'm... Um, partly contributed to my development within the Institute. So I, I appreciate that and I don't take it for granted. So Dr. Andrew is the executive director of, the I, of IDI. As all of us are aware, is the one leading the IDA at 20 celebration. Let me take the honor to introduce Dr. Andrew to make his remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My colleague on the senior management team, Dr. Okoboy, who hit a milestone by doing doctoral studies, and I think it's appropriate to congratulate you, IDI at 20, for completing your doctoral studies. The IDI board members present in the room, including the chair of our board audit committee, the community that is joining us online, I had an opportunity to glance at the list. The leadership of Makere University, which is where we are situated this morning, including the College of Health Sciences. Uh, my colleagues on the IDI senior management team who are present. IDI staff, our partners. I should also say the seats in the room were highly preserved for very specific individuals, and we hope they'll be joining us shortly. There are occasions when, at times like this, when your opening remarks are being made, they say, on these hallowed grounds. And I am tempted to borrow from that phrase because here we are on the grounds of Makere University, which is the leading academic center of excellence, not only in Uganda, but in Eastern Central Africa. Makere has just recently celebrated 100 years. Under the theme of leveraging 100 years of excellence to build societal transformation. As you know, IDI is part of the Makere family. And the key thing to note there is the ability of an institution to really touch the lives of people in a very real way. The College of Health Sciences, which IDI is part of, I should say, when I listen to the leadership of the university, is a feather in Makere's cap. Um, to our credit, those of us in the college, we are seen as the most productive unit of Makere. Let me draw your attention to a few contributions of the medical school and the college. The initial work on some of the reproductive health related prostaglandins was described at Makere. Bucket's lymphoma, which is a very common lymphoma in childhood, was described on the Molago campus by investigators, including Makere investigators. And many of us know the seminal work that has been done by Makere-based investigators in the field of HIV, from the initial description to some of the most effective interventions like medical male circumcision. We will actually have the privilege to listen to a leading investigator and a former leader in the college 
for the keynote address today. So it's in that context that IDI would like to continue in that tradition of contribution by using our 20-year milestone to really reflect on the things that we've done, but most importantly, to inspire us to think about the next 20 years. And I hope that many of us are looking forward to the keynote tomorrow by one of our past research leaders challenging us about the next 20 years. And I think on that note, let us recognize the presence of Dr. Manare with us this week. I can tell you there were competing interests to have Dr. Manave with us. There is another re regular meeting that she's committed to, but I was really taken aback when I reached out to her. I think the Americans would use the term at the drop of the heart. Mm -hmm. Yuka agreed not only to join us in person, but to give a keynote. Yuka, I thank you for that. So the idea has made steady progress in terms of research contributions. And I can say that confidently as somebody who was very close to the research program, not only as an investigator, but a past leader of the program. I remember colleagues like Professor Moses Kamia setting the stage by establishing a longitudinal cohort, which in my view was a very foresighted thing to do. That cohort has been the basis of many studies that IDI has done subsequently. IDI has contributed to clinical trials, which I hope will be highlighted in the course of the week. Just to highlight a few, the Ernest, the Nadia study, these are studies that are policy influencing, which is the goal of our program. The IDI has done work on pharmacokinetics to give uh, insight on drug interactions, which are very common occurrences in our setting, given the fact that we do have patients with co-infections. I could go on and on, implementation science, translation of science, and more recently, data science. So we can all be proud that IDI has really um, contributed all this science to the university. And as your current leader, I'm proud to say, we've enhanced the reputation of the university because all these publications translate into the ranking. And I want you to take that credit as a research program. If you look at the program that we have over the next two days, we will both be looking at the past, but also be looking at the future over 20 years. One of the most exciting things about science at IDI is the centrality of the investigator. And in fact, I dare say the centrality of the African investigator. <coughs> and so one of the strands of the program uh, tomorrow is a session dedicated to mentorship because this is a tradition that we have been intentional about to make sure that there's another generation of scientists who will carry on our work. So I want to thank the leader of that session. I think it's Dr. Katriona Waite, who is going to really lead a very important session and encourage the young investigators who are present in the room, but also those who are online, to really be part of that discussion. But I also want to thank Dr. Waite in a special way, and I think I do it on behalf of the leadership of the research program. Dr. Waite is really an embodiment of mentorship, and it's been a pleasure to see her inspiring, particularly women in science. Let's give her a hand clap for that. Um, Dr. Waite is doing a lot of studies on breast milk and how it could be a vehicle both for transmission but also for drugs interacting with children. And it's important to recognize the contribution of investigators like her who have dedicated part of their career in Uganda, not just doing science, but making sure that there's a next generation. So for me, that's a very important strand of what we do to make sure that we are taking care of the next generation. 
And I remember at the breakfast meeting, this was one of the reflections that we think about the next uh, generation. I want to pay tribute as I come to the end of uh, my remarks to our past leaders in the research program because they also exemplify the points I've been making about the science on the one hand, but also the mentorship and the next generation. Uh, many of you are aware that IDI, in a foresighted manner because of the leaders, started a scholarship program where investigators have what we call protected time. So I really want to salute Professor Dave Thomas, who was in many ways the inaugural head of our research program, who obtained resources to establish what was known as the Sewan Kambo Scholars Program. The tenets of that program was to get protected time, multi-year, so that we grow investigators. And Investigators are difficult to grow. They take many years. The return on investment is in years. Let us observe that if you look at the College of Health Sciences today, many of the leaders in the college, in many ways, were beneficiaries of the Sewan Kambo Scholars Program. So let us recognize uh, Professor Dev Thomas's contribution. Um, Dr. Dev Thomas was followed by Professor Manabe, who, in addition to her stellar contributions in many areas, particularly in tuberculosis research, also continued the tradition of mentorship and obtained resources from the NIH through a D43 program on HIV and co-infections. The beautiful story about this is that um, Yuka is really large-hearted and has Africa at heart. That was demonstrated by her willingness and support to transition the leadership of that grant to African scientists, and to me in particular. And so I was very privileged after the first cycle to take on the leadership of the D43 on HIV and co-infections. And I should tell you a short story. In that capacity, I was invited to Maryland. Stephen, I'll be done in two minutes. I was invited to Maryland, and I was put on the program to say a few words as the new PI of the grant. And this is what I told them. I told them that my scientific journey started as a beneficiary of a Fogarty grant under the ATRI program, which was held by Professor Moses Kamia and Dr. Chris Wellen. And then I said, it's amazing that I started off as a trainee, and here I am as a PI. And I think that really shows that if we have leaders like Yuka, who provide growth for African leadership, that that is really commendable. To complete that story, I will be transitioning that leadership to Dr. Barbara Castelnovo. So you can see, um, I think uh, at the risk of being misunderstood, our, our leadership in other spheres can learn from these transitions that leaders come and leaders go. And on that note, let me end by thanking our leaders in research, Stephen and, and Barbara who lead from the front. They are leading areas of research in their own right. Stephen is leading on HIV prevention work in key populations. Barbara is doing work on HIV and aging, and we thank you for that work. So my final comment is to circle back to our mother institution of Makere. Yesterday, the vice chancellor honored us with his presence at the breakfast, and he had many good things to say about IDI. His vision is for Makere to become a research intensive university and he has obtained resources from the government of Uganda through the research and innovation fund. That fund stands at 30 billion US dollars which is a significant amount of money. The money is important but I think the important thing is our government is now putting money on the table 
for research. And we need to support Makere and Professor Nawangwe to show quick results so that the government gives us more money. I honestly believe IDEA is one of those players that can help the university to show quick results for the money the government is giving. So my appeal is to you, the IDEA family within Makere, to do just that. It's my pleasure, therefore, to declare the science fair open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrew, for those kind words and kind, kind remarks. We appreciate your leadership of the Institute, specifically as the past leader of the research program. We know when you talk of transition with D43, last, uh, last week we, we, we are mapping what we call the next generation of scientists at IDI. Wow. And we took them outside and we, we, we are meeting them and trying to get how do we, how do we all together aspire to where we are because the next grant you're transitioning to Barbara is pure about the next generation of scientists because there was this first generation of scientists who are currently running the first idea 20. But now I want to add more to the next idea 20. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that, that, those remarks. I have the pleasure once again. Let's take the opportunity to welcome Professor Sevan Kambu. You're most welcome. Thank you so much. So I still have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Barbara, who's my boss. But for us, we are peers. I don't know whether that, that it's hard for you to find out whose purpose is the other <laughs> because of the way we, we are actually working, the, the collaborative aspects we are, we are working in. So Dr. Barbara is a clinician trained at the University of Milan and based in Uganda since 2020. Imagine since 2020. She's now Ugandan. <laughs> she has officially acquired a Ugandan citizenship. <laughs> so she's Ugandan, Italian, based here. She's working at, she has worked at IDI in, since 2004. And remember, she joined IDI as a medical officer. And now see how the mentorship and the capacity building and the training has propelled her to the, the, the head of department. And she's passionate about mentorship. She's the current head of the research program, and she heads the capacity development the program, which has actually trained over 116 scholars, postdoc and PhD, and she has supervised a number of them. She's a, a recipient of the Senior EDTPC Fellowship on HIV, NCDs, and aging. Dr. Barbara, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the lovely introduction. Um, so maybe let me start by saying that I'm the lucky one as the head of research because I happen to be the head of research at 20. And so <laughs> I'm the lucky one who is empowered to give this speech. Um, in this presentation, I'm really going to focus on uh, um, what was really the research capacity that was built and system and structures uh, in the last 20 years and just a glimpse on the future because we will have leaders of each research group to present really the specific work that they've done and that they are going to do. So I really focused on core functions uh, of the research department. So uh, I just decided to project the mission of, our, of the research department, especially for those who are not conversant, which is to produce uh, outstanding international recognized scholarship in infectious diseases that influences global policy and practice with emphasis on Africa. In the next slide, I'm going to show you this history of the research department and the research capacity, the way I saw it and the way I lived it. So uh, I try to divide really the, the growth of IDI in four periods and then looking at the future. So. The first period, it is 2002 to 2008, was really laying the foundations. And so for those who were here, we know that really there was extensive need for training, not in research, it really also in clinical and HIV care. And that was the time where IDI was a clinical trial site, but we didn't have any capacity of running uh, any trial. Staff was really trained in basic, you know, how to deliver antiretroviral treatment because antiretroviral treatment didn't come, you know, before there was no art free art in Uganda before 2004. 
And also, as uh, already uh, uh, Dr. Kambugu mentioned, uh, there was uh, an effort to look for the first scholar, especially uh, under the uh, Nelson Sewan Kambu Scholarship, and that's where the very, very few scholars uh, were enrolled at IDI. And I think that those very first efforts were actually really successful because if you look at some of the people who were trained in the early days, they are now have leadership position in Makarere. And I would just mention one, the principal. Um, the second period, 2008 and 2013, uh, more capacity was built with dependence from external partners, which were really very important to us. So I'm talking about you know, keep training scholars, but also bringing in, for example, data management system, Datafax, that picture shows the first Datafax team when uh, we were so dependent from NIH to actually run all that program. Uh, translational lab was uh, also equipped and staff trained. That was the time around where um, Dr. Yuka came and trained a lot of staff, and also many international partners really offered to us a lot of equipment in that lab. Um, and uh, so we were also acquiring more grants, but these were really mostly led by partners. So uh, again, it was a great collaboration, but the input from IDI was not substantial at that time, simply we were not ready. And we continue, as I said, training scholars. So next period, 2013-2018, this is really where we will say we have become a bit more independent. Again, we have got, as I said, as already Dr. Kambugu said, our D43 under the leadership of Yuka. Yuka had already left, but she was here, really uh, still training our scholars and uh, more lab capacity was built. Uh, now the grants starting to be co-led with the partners. So still, of course, you need partners, but finally at IDI we were able to write. Uh, and then more and more system coming up, like the research SOPs, the RISE, which is our regulatory automated system, and so on. Um, last period, 2018-2023, I would call this the period of interdependence where we also had a predominant role in our, you know, with our partners, sorry, of period of independence. And so we were actually able to train our local mentors. In the last years, really, the scholars we trained are able to mentor other people. So there is a clear cascade, which I'm going to show you later. We are also able to establish our own IDI uh, REC, which was really, I think, a great step for our institution. More policies coming up, like the research policy that was actually signed just last year. Um, statistical capacity has now really reached the point uh, of uh, being able to independently analyze um, multi-site uh, clinical trials. Uh, there is more capacity for data management in data facts and the red cap, uh, more uh, automation of systems. Uh, I'll show a bit later a glimpse. So as you can see, we are really, uh, I think, growing that. We had uh, also in the last year uh, three uh, IDI staff who got K grants uh, and also three um, R01 grants that were led by IDI. So where is the future is going? Well, in, I don't know, but what I see is really that as much as we say that we are independent, it's clear that you need always to partner with someone. So I think that this journey has been an excellency in partnership and it has to be to continue as an excellency in partnership where we keep working now hand in hand with our partners uh, the capacity was built, I'm not saying that there is no more to build, but you know, we can work really together. And so I think that there is going to be cross-cutting research, uh, groups with global links, uh, IDI being able to be a notional node for some uh, of the local base that needed research, uh, attracting really local talents. And uh, uh, I think again, we need to train to able our trainees will now become mentors uh, to be able to mentor the next generation. Uh, 
I'm sure. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, here. So now that I told you a bit more about what I, uh, the way I saw the growth of the IDI research department, I will just show you some achievements at 20. Uh, these are our publications uh, throughout the year for a total of 1,260. Uh, in yellow, you will see um, publications that are authored by others, while the orange and the gray represent first or other authorship from IDI, other uh, scholar or, or, or staff. So you can see that it is really a steady increase uh, of what is uh, uh, written and published from inside. Um, for those who are not very familiar, I just want to give a glimpse of the research program structure. Um, so the leadership on top, and then we have in blue what we call uh, unit leaders. Um, and then going back, uh, going sorry down, what you see in green, these are actually our um, core functions and uh, our uh, support systems. So for example, if you want to come and bring your grant to IDI and bring your research to IDI, this is what you'll find as a kind of support. You will find a statistic unit, you will find a research office, you'll find people who are able to do data management, capacity building, you'll find established longitudinal cohorts, you'll find um, an, an ethic committee, um, and uh, regulatory and monitoring function. These are, uh, so, and also laboratory, research laboratory uh, capacity. So this is something that it is there. Uh, and it's really, um, I think, really the function of the research program to continue this uh, unit uh, be really the, the backbone of you know, everything that comes in as a grant. And then if you go down in blue, these are actually the thematic areas or groups. Uh, many of these groups, they have leaders that have been really published for the last 20 years in those topics. And going from the left to the right, I put what was, let's say, more, um, so on the left you find what has always been there from the beginning and how things somehow have been adding up. So for example, uh, we always been done HIV prevention research or HIV and TB and opportunistic infection because that was also what was the need at the beginning of the epidemic. And so as you move to the right, uh, you see that more areas actually been added throughout the year. So research in STIs, in uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, more HIV epidemiology, uh, more maternal health. And then moving on again, of recent, we have been more interested really in people living with HIV, transnational research, uh, global health security, and so on. So, uh, Again, these are the thematic groups where we, uh, uh, where we are um, currently, we are really, there is research going on. And this is where really uh, we have our own investigators. Some are IDI based, but some are external based, can be international collaborators or can also be uh, collaborators from a career university. Actually, a lot of people who lead this group are based at Macarena, but they also collaborate and do research with us, with, uh, with the IDI. Uh, again, here, another achievement at 20. I projected the IDI research project. We almost uh, reached uh, 350 research project. On the upper graph, uh, you find the cumulative number in the light blue, and then the dark blue represent the number of projects by year. And uh, the graph down represent actually the income that all these projects have been generating uh, from since in in inception up to now. Uh, the pie chart shows the uh, current project. There are 121. Majority in blue, they are actually observational studies. But in gray, you can also see clinical trials, 10 diagnostic studies, and uh, two implementation science. Uh, I was mentioning before uh, how I was showing some of examples of uh, the research support or the system that have been introduced. So 
on the uh, upper uh, left side. Um, that is a screenshot of uh, uh, a um, regulatory uh, research binder electronic. So we are moving uh, all the regulatory binder to an electronic form that can be accessed by the investigators from anywhere and uh, can also be given remote access to research monitors uh, for a limited time so that they can actually do uh, a monitoring visit at least partially remotely if they cannot access. These of course were some of the innovation that were boosted by the pandemic but we are actually going to maintain them because they have some relevance for example uh, uh, if the monitor or the study is not in the same location. Um, then uh, down still on the left uh, uh, this is the publication on our regulatory uh, system. Uh, the, our regulatory system is a system that sends reminder to regulatory staff and investigator to remind them when it's time to renew their studies uh, or their documents. And it actually shows that since we introduced that, uh, they, there are no delays in renewing any study. And we've never been fined because REC is actually fine if you submit later. So. It was really nice paper that shows this support, and this is one of the system that could ideally be scaled up to other institutions. On the on the um, uh, right upper side, I just wanted to show the turnaround time of our rec. Uh, so, majority of the study, 82 percent, you will get a reply within two weeks. Uh, only four percent, uh, it's actually three weeks. That is the maximum that we've been. I, I think it's a very efficient rec. Thank you to a very efficient REC administrator. And uh, uh, I think this is also going to speed up regulatory processes at IDI because we don't have any more scientific committee. You, go, you come directly to our REC uh, and within three weeks you actually get a feedback. And then uh, down on the right, uh, this image is uh, uh, depicting what you are trying to plan as a e an e-archiving. Again, we really want to move away from paper, it's uh, man saving money, it's uh, saving the environment, and we want really to try to implement uh, uh, archive for research studies that, that are uh, all electronic, and this is actually allowed by the local regulations. Um, so we talked about a bit of the capacity building, and again, probably this is the way I see it, but uh, I, I think there is a kind of consensus in the department. So there is a capacity building pyramid on the, on the left that shows how capacity was built at INDI, and basically one of the first slides that, I, slides that I presented to you was the journey of IDI, where you actually have to come set up structures, starting doing capacity building programs. You go on by training staff, Stuff, uh, uh, and uh, organizing the courses uh, for anything, for statistics, for scientific writing, research methods, and so on. And then uh, you start doing some in-house scientific writing until you're able to publish your paper to get your grant. Again, with the support of most senior people, external collaborators. And then at this point, you reach a certain level of sustainability. When you do that, you have to be able to flip to what is the model on the, on the right side. So starting from the bottom, now you have local scientists that are still of course, collaborating with international collaborators. Uh, and with that, you continue building the capacity and start training now a second generation of uh, coordinators, PhD students, postdoc. Uh, and you make sure, while you do that, that they also understand that they are expected to mentor others once they reach their, their degree or their success or they get their grant. And so that you can continue this one. Now, these models, there's not like uh, that you stop doing one thing and you flip into the other. You know, it's a continuous thing. You have to continuously keep uh, so building sustainability. I'm not saying IDEA is 100% sustainable, and probably it's this concept of interdependence for me is also important. Nobody, you know, wins alone. But then you also have to be able to do some things yourself and not keep calling external collaborators to train your staff uh, when they already spend the last 20 years doing that. 
uh, I just wanted to show this slide that I agree is really busy, but I think it shows uh, how this model has been really productive. So the pie charts actually shows the number of trainees uh, that we've been uh, training. Uh, and the majority are masters followed by PhD, postdocs, uh, and other type of fellows. Now, that busy table on the right, you look it from the bottom, these are some of the IDI trainees. Actually, there are a lot of IDI trainees. And so all these trainees that have been training at IDI through uh, the various, through different programs, uh, mainly in the last year, the D43. And they've been training as masters, PhD, postdoc, and fellows. Now, they reach a upper level where they actually got their independent funding for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, some career grants. So many of them, they actually obtained and they've already completed the GLOCAL, um, other the Global Health Fellowship, other they got CPAC funding, other they get uh, other type of NIH funding, EDCTP and others. So as much as this is really uh, crowded, it really shows, I think, that we are moving into that. Uh, and that people that we train within, they are in fact really able at least to move to the next step. I'm sorry, this is um, so um, f future direction for capacity building and support systems. I think we need to continue building on successful partnership, uh, sustain our capa capacity building model. Uh, and uh, what I see we should do at really at this point is that if this is possible, this should be really exported to other institutions, or at least we should inspire them. Uh, uh, there, uh, as I showed you, there is more, in the, uh, uh, I think we are more able to run clinical trials at level of coordinating center because we do have uh, a lot of, um, a lot of system. We have SOPs, we have a functioning statistical unit, we have data facts. Uh, and in fact, for one of our projects, we will try actually to implement this in the next five years. It's going to be like uh, um, a way to see if we really can demonstrate that. Uh, and then we should, I think, prioritize and promote IDI-led research. So when I say IDI-led research, some of the problems that are relevant for IDI or Uganda, um, they really come, so they, they, these problems and the question and answer they really come within. And the example that we always give uh, is all uh, the issues about scaling up dolutegravir. And in IDI, we have seen some of these issues about, for example, hyperglycemia, which have not been seen anywhere. And so this is a typical example of something that really started at IDI. And uh, actually, we do have like three, four scholars that are being, they are all career on, you know, developing um, research question and answer on dolutegravir toxicity and so on. So this group really should be prioritized and sustained. Uh, and I also think that we have some strengths in uh, our system and administration. And probably again, uh, we should go out and build capacity for other institutions and inspire them. This was my, my last slide, but I uh, first, before uh, leaving here, I just really want to acknowledge a number of people. Um, so first of all, what we always refer to IDI, at our founding father on the top, Professor Nelson Sewan Cambo, Professor Miles Sender, and then, of course, all the academic alliance. Um, the other pictures so show the uh, history of the head of the research. The first of the research was Dave Thomas, but uh, I took the liberty of adding uh, Professor Bob Kolebandes, who was never the head of research because there was no research program, but I think he trained many of us, uh, and so many of us have been his students, and so I think in a way it jump-started, uh, you know, the local interest in becoming uh, scholars or investigators. Uh, I have to also to say that uh, um, I actually think I'm one of the few people in IDI that had the, um, I was so lucky that I was mentored by each of them. So I don't know how many people can say that in this room or in this institute. And I also feel I want to thank personally all of them, not just the level of research capacity, because I think the work that I show you in one of my first slides, when I show you the work of IDI, was also my personal work. 
So one was my personal work from laying the foundation, being trained as a very junior staff, and then move on on that ladder that I show you. And that was possible because things were changing in IDI, but also because all the mentorship that I received at different stage from all of these, uh, uh, these people are ahead of the, of the research program. Of course, uh, I also want to uh, uh, thank you uh, all the international collaborators and uh, local collaborators, particularly the collaborators at uh, Makerere University, and then all the research staff that have contributed to the program for the last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barbara, for working us with the research program. And I want you to appreciate that you, you are lucky to have a mentorship of all the four past, past research leaders who are really accomplished. I think you are really one of the lucky ones. I, I want to take the opportunity to, to, to welcome Professor Damali, the principal of the College of Health Sciences. <laughs> You're most welcome. Your name was cited before even you had arrived here. So now, <laughs> if I can put the face. But also, I'm also privileged to work closely with Professor Damali in our translational lab. Professor Damali is the director of our translation, scientific director, you know, science. Lab is science. If you don't have a scientific lead, <laughs> the science might not come out. Everything might not be as planned. So at this moment, let me invite Dr. Kambugu once again to the floor to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Andrew Yomasoka. Before I do the assignment Stephen has given me, uh, let me give me two seconds to really appreciate Barbara as our current research leader. I had the opportunity <laughs> during the difficult period of COVID-19, I had the opportunity to have a virtual meeting with the research team. And I was amazed at the cohesiveness of that team in a very difficult circumstance. So Barbara and Stephen, Thank you for having a cohesive team within the Institute. I can't introduce the speaker before I really um, again recognize the presence of the principal of the College of Health Sciences. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, we are here at Makere and having Professor Nakan Jako here means even the VC is here with us. So special welcome to you, Professor Damali Nakan Jako. I am sorry I wrote such a long letter. I did not have time to write a short one. These words were written by Blaise Pascal, indicating the power of summary. Professor Sewan Kambo has a long and rich CV, and Stephen has given me a few minutes to introduce him. Can you imagine my dilemma? But let me try. If you look at Mulago today and compare it to the time I joined the medical school in 1992, there's a sea change. If we were asked to nominate one person to attribute the transformation of that campus, it would indeed be Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell. Let me elaborate. <laughs> when Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell was the dean and later principal, he started many groundbreaking initiatives. The Makere Water Reed Project. He was part of the Makere University Johns Hopkins collaboration, the Rakai Health Sciences Program, the Mulago Mbarra Joint AIDS Program, and of course the IDI. If you think of all those organizations and the impact they're having, it's difficult to imagine them without Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell. Uh, because this event is an IDI event, let me just mention quickly that Professor Nelson Sewan Campbell indeed is a founding father for the Institute and in fact was the inaugural chair of IDI's board. 
and we credit him for setting a firm foundation for the Institute. Professor Sewan Kambo is now an emeritus professor at Makere, but I can tell you he's as active as ever, even now. We've been more recently privileged to work with him as he put together like-minded leaders in Africa to create the AfriHealth organization out of the MEPI and NEPI grants to make sure that medical education and research, the momentum is maintained. Before I invite him, let me also mention three things that characterize him. The first one is integrity. Um, I can say, having associated with him in many capacities, that in summary, he does things right. And I, I won't say more. He does things the right way. Secondly, commitment. It's not unusual to find Professor Sewan Kambo in his office at 7 a.m., even now in retirement, when he should be maybe at the beach somewhere, sipping a glass of wine. Finally, for someone with so great accomplishments and the fact that he's really erudite, I think it's right for me to observe that he's modest for all the accomplishments. So I hope I have done some justice and now please join me in welcoming Professor Nelson Sewan Kambo. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Andrew, you've overdone it. <laughs> and I have to I had a few challenges for this morning's presentation. And yeah, I usually like to have the computer here because I may not be able to read <laughs> some of those things. It looks like for this, this presentation was set up to be a test of something, I don't know what. Uh, let me elaborate. <clears throat> I mean, after the director of research, Barbara, has made her presentation about the history of research in this institution, and then you are asked to give a talk on celebrating 20 years of inspired contributions through IDI research, the question is, what is left to talk about? <laughs> and that puzzled me actually last evening as I thought more about this presentation. Uh, also, now when I walked in and looked at the program, please, if you can look at it, it says keynote, uh, keynote address one at 1.30 p.m. <laughs> so you can see where I'm coming from this morning. But anyhow, we will try and see what we can go through. I wish to move closer there because <laughs> that is a typical Yuka comment. <laughs> so, research at IDI, the journey has been long, 20 years. Where and how did it begin? Uh, many people might not know and Barbara might not know, at least that's something new to say this morning, that actually the research of IDI started at Mulago Hospital ISS Clinic, which was being run, uh, which was being led, I 
should say, by my good friend, Eli Katawia. And I called this, him this morning 30 minutes before I came here. I said, I hope I'll find you at IBI. He said, my friend, I'm retired. <laughs> and I'm enjoying my breakfast. <laughs> it made me think I'm doing the wrong thing <laughs> to come and make a presentation here. But that's where it started, in a small room where Eli Katavia was not supported by the hospital. There, were very, there was very little in that place. But the good news is that even in that place, we had started a research project on a drug called Cameron. Cameron was being made in Kenya, and Camry thought that this was their blockbuster discovery uh, that Cameron cures AIDS. And so in East Africa, definitely, it was touted as you know, a new innovation that would bring solutions to, to the region. So together with WHO, or WHO agreed to support us and do that Cameron study. So when we did it, it was, we didn't see any efficacy from camera. And yet people had been spending a lot of money on that drug. Of course, you know, people are desperate, you know, for a cure or something that would improve their lives. When uh, the colleagues from North America came here, we were just completing that study, and they were impressed the way Cameron was done, and the follow-up was tremendous. Nearly all patients had been followed up, and what was not known to them is that we used helicopter a small Volvo car to go and follow up patients, personal car with no fuel from government, from artillery, and so forth. That's the level of commitment we are talking about. So, uh, when our colleagues came from North America, particularly Mal Sunday, uh, we started thinking about formation of the Academic Alliance. AA, uh, read it is as Academic Alliance. So, the Academic Alliance inspired the beginnings of research at IDI, having seen what we could do in very modest surroundings with very little resources, they thought research is possible here. If people are supported and also if they are given the resources to do that. The Academic Alliance members were respected researchers internationally and a people who were high achievers. I was very privileged to rub shoulders with them myself, just like Barbara is proud that she was mentored by all the directors who have come through here, research directors. So these were high achievers and people who were self-driven and want to show results in the shortest time possible. Oh, sorry. So, the next three slides show who these original Academic Alliance members were. Some of the first says, you know, uh, Eric Atavia, who I've been talking about, for those who might not know, this is the guy. And then the others from Canada, from the US. Bob Colabandas, who has been talked about by Barbara, is right here, and others. And this goes on for the second slide. I'm sure Ugandan faces you know very well. Harriet Mayanja, Moses Jorova, Moses come here, and so forth. And uh, the first IDI director Keith, and so forth.
Also, these people were members of the Academic Alliance right from the beginning. But as I emphasize that these were already great achievers, people self-driven and wanted to do things, find solutions to problems. Now, those high achievers, and I put this slide last when showing the pictures for a reason. As the one thing I agree with Andrew in what he said, that I'm probably a very modest person <laughs> and I never want to blow my trumpet. So, those high achievers agreed that we lead them. Mao Sunday was, as it were, representing the uh, North American arm, but later, because we had Europeans as well, so people from our income countries, while for me, I was representing the people in Uganda, and he was the chair of the academic alliance, and I was his co-chair in that academic alliance. Mal Sunday, as you see, he's late. He passed on uh, some years ago. He was a super dynamic man. Wanted to do things yesterday. <laughs> and to take me to getting also to that level, he would bring a bottle of scotch to my office. And at 6 p.m., with a glass and says, why don't we celebrate the day? We've done so much. And indeed, we would take sips. But that's not for the social media. <laughs> <laughs> so the beginnings of research, research at IDI was like a social movement. Just like the rest of the things around I, IDI was like a social movement. So a movement of passionate enthusiasts, people I really enjoyed working with. They were emotionally charged with the issues. And they framed the issue at the time, which was driving us, as scarcity of quality care and availability of antiretrovirals in this country when in the high-income countries those antiretrovirals had started. I say, how do we make sure that there's no scarcity in this country and the region and that people can access quality care uh, using antiretrovirals? So they needed, we needed to build a capacity, but also do research to understand the issues much better. As I said, these were passionate, enthusiasts, determined to get results. Uh, the discontent was the division between the high-income countries and here in these regions. As I've said, no resources, no antiretrovirals, and, and so forth. So that discontent became a movement, but with a vision and a path for solving the problem. We thought that we can do it, despite the circumstances that we are in. By we, I mean this partnership in the academic alliance. And our purpose, to pursue greatness of service for people living with HIV. And here came this phrase you've seen, I'm sure, on all idea documents, investing in future and impacting real lives. We internally, each of us, made a personal promise to contribute to the realization of the vision. Personal. It was not demanded of anybody. But if you saw the way the people worked and the where the people engaged in the discussions, you could see there was a personal commitment to realize the vision. 
and there was a deep desire of having evidence to use and a responsibility to ensure there's change. <clears throat> now, if you are going to do research, you know, you all know, I'm not telling you anything new here, that you need good research culture. Good research culture. To develop or to build a good research culture, you require a movement. And it's not a mandate. It doesn't come by a mandate. We all have been talking about mandates during COVID period. Mandated, mandated. The world is talking about mandates. You cannot decide that we put across a mandate to develop a research culture. Building research culture is, first of all, culture is like wind. It's like wind, you can't see it, but it blows, and you see the results when it is blowing. If it blows in your direction, you are lucky, and you have good sailing. But if it blows in the opposite direction, be sure you are not OK. Building a research culture requires or demands having new behaviors in place from all stakeholders. That is, from the director of IDI to the directors of departments and so on. Everybody behavior on how to get this done. Culture, research culture, cannot be built by a top-down top down directive that you do this and you do that. However, culture lives in the collective hearts and habits of people and the shared perceptions. That's where it lives. There was no directive to the academic alliance that we should do ABCD, but it was in the collective hearts and our self-perception. Authorities can demand compl uh, compliance many times. I was a leader at some point, and you demand compliance, but you can't dictate optimism, conviction, trust, or creativity. You have to build it slowly. So 20 years, this is what has been happening at IDI in research culture. I asked IDI to tell me, why do they think high quality research is possible here? Summarize it in one sentence. Because there's a research supportive ecosystem here, and a research culture which is, it's not yet on the top, but it is slowly growing. And there are many components to the uh, ecosystem. There's infrastructure here to support research, and Barbara has talked about it, collaborations and strategic partnerships with world-class uh, scientists. Uh, committed scientists in Uganda, partnership with Makere University, research capacity building, um, PhDs, postdocs, Barbara has talked about it. You remember I said, if the director has spoken, what is left to be talked about? Now, of course, there must be somebody in charge. And although you've seen these faces before, just to emphasize that without good directors of research, it would be impossible to have the achievements. And so these have been excellent directors. Dev Thomas, I think he's still your boss, you know, Hopkins. Oh, okay. He came here and spent time here and I couldn't believe that he took time off in Hopkins 
and did what he did here. Philippa Easterbrook was from the UK. She came, spent time, and she did it running between the UK and here. And of course, you know this. Face is right in the room. Barbara, Yuka says she does not, oh, where's the vice chancellor? You told me the vice chancellor was. <laughs> <laughs> Madam vice chancellor. She does not believe in the concept of African PhDs, for example. If you have it in your head, you are having something that doesn't sit well with yoga. And I agree with her. There's no African PhD. We should, PhDs are PhDs. And we should strive to build PhDs to that level. Um, of course, Andrew, you know very well, and Barbara, you know very well. I don't need to say more. So the directors played their part. They have done wonderfully well, and we need to continue. But of course, the directors of research were working under the IDI top top leads. Um, whereas Andrew is here as ED supporting the department, but at one time, as you saw in the previous slide, he was a director of research. And all these, in the interest of time, I shouldn't say more about those. Okay. Again, I asked the IDI to tell me <clears throat> what are some of the contributions to science that they are very proud of. And they mentioned these here. I don't want to go through those again because during the thematic sessions, I'm sure these are going to be highlighted. But they feel they have really contributed things they are very proud of. And one of the reasons <coughs> they think those are great contributions to science is over here. That because the results from those studies have contributed to policy and influenced practice, uh, not only in Uganda, but regionally and beyond. I'm sure those issues are gonna be emphasized in the thematic uh, discussions. And here is just pulling up a few papers to show that, to back up what they say, um, the publications that arose. But as you heard, they have gone above a thousand publications mark. You can't put a thousand publications here to illustrate the point. So I pulled up these, I pulled up these, and as you see, the other was Lancet. He has New England Journal of Medicine. There's PLOS, High Impact Factor Journals, New England Journal of Medicine again, uh, and so forth. Now, Scientific Advisory Committee, which Barbara did it, didn't talk about, unless I just missed it. We, in the history of IDI, from the beginning, a scientific advisory committee was established. And this was a committee composed of people of high repute across the world. People who talked about something on a subject matter, you listened you listen. And so they would come once a year, officially, but sometimes they came for a few other things and engaged with that year. But they came once a year and sat and discussed issues around research and science at IDI, and they gave wonderful advice. Here are the names, Paul, Volbading uh, from UCSF, and so forth. Unfortunately, Yup Lang, 
uh, passed on, a very committed scientist. Um, I think all the others. King Holmes was, <coughs> was the mover and shaker of uh, sexually transmitted infections. And he was so committed. When they started talking in the Scientific Advisory Committee, it looked like, you know, <laughs> time stopped and they would just continue talking. But not this director, E.D., last provided advice in 2013. As a scientific advisory committee, the question I ask is why? Was it deliberate that there should be no continuation with the scientific advisory committee? Not necessarily with these individuals, but others rotating through, or it was just an oversight. What is the future of, in the future, is there going to be the scientific advisory committee? So, again, I ask IDI, what do you think are the factors that are contributing to the good work that you've done? Governance. And I bought that. I bought all these 100%. Governance. Governance. Vice Chancellor, if there's anything to talk back to your colleagues and the council, the way they govern research is critically important. Otherwise, my career will not go very far. We will see ourselves dropping on the scorecard, going down all the time. I was actually impressed very much yesterday at the breakfast meeting, hearing all those presentations and the achievements of what, and I said, we need a hundred IDI-like structures in Makere. <coughs> Not only in health, but even in history, even in languages, and so forth. Location, the location being on Mlago Hill and being in Makere where there are many different professionals in this environment and partnership and collaboration, thank you. Partnership and collaboration is possible. The regulatory system has been mentioned. Sant uh, strategic positions always supporting government of Uganda priorities and so forth. And lastly, institutional culture that we've been talking about. Of course, there are other things that have supported uh, <coughs> research. <coughs> there was very strong collaboration with outside institutions. And one of those I thought I'd point out is, for example, collaboration with NIH. <clears throat> there was, and there still is, ISA in this country. Who knows what ISA stands for? Oh no, you can't. <laughs> you are not eligible to vote. <clears throat> ISA, please. Anybody? Yes, sir. International Center of Excellence in Research. And he can talk about it because he's partly or largely because he's with the Rakai Health Science Program. <laughs> ISA has done a lot for the Rakai Health Science Program, the International Center of Excellence Research, providing equipment, human resource, IT support in different ways, and so on. Therefore, and IDI was a beneficiary in the earlier years on our ISA. And actually, the person who leads ISA, you know him. He works with IDI. I'm not sure 
why I, IDI has dropped off the list of ISA support. Probably because you are not asking the guy on support. And those are intramural funds. They are not extramural funds. They are intramural funds which they use to support the ISA. Unfortunately, the lady who initiated the formation of ISA in NIH and she bulldozed and argued strongly, she has just retired. And the farewell party was a few weeks ago. But we got some assurance that even if she has retired, uh, she was one of the deputies, this is going to go on in some way or form. So I would encourage you uh, that here yeah, we dropped the ball, but we can't pick it up. Now, what is the idea, uh, idea research ecosystem like? What is the context? And this is reminding you of what you know. First of all, you see idea in the center. It has got a uh, um, Malago campus. It's got one at Makerere, and there's one at Kasangati not far from here, 15 minutes drive or 20. And then IDEA is situated within Makerere University. And that gives it something. Uh, somebody was telling me, Kasozi, is Kasozi here today? No, I think he's Kasozi. He's the one with Africa CDC. Is he Kasozi? Kakoza, Kakoza. He, yes. <coughs> He was saying he's amazed with the collaboration that IDI has across Africa. When they go there, you're from Makerere, they walk on water. It's like walking on water. So the fact that this is in Makerere environment should not be taken lightly. Makerere still has a name out there. And I agree with him. When I go, wherever I go, <laughs> and I go many places, what is better than walking on water, walking in the air? You, you walk, you know, people want to hear from you and what you are saying. So there are all these things, funders, uh, scientific advisory board, which transformed into a REC, I guess, regula uh, regu regulators, Minister of Health, KCCA partners, and so forth. They all uh, contribute to the good environment. Now, what is being done in Uganda? I don't know whether you've seen these maps before, but still, briefly, it looks like, oh no, it, it's not it looks like, it is true. IDEA has spread itself across Uganda in a period of 20 years. Has got, and what I asked for is research, not service provider, service providing. I asked, let me see where IDEA is in terms of research in this country. And you can see the map. Karamoja, West Nile. Western Uganda, Central, and so forth. <clears throat> the question is, how good is the capacity to continue spreading across Uganda? It's not saying don't spread, but just to make sure that the capacity we have aligns well with the job to be done. And so they have done very well. And then in Africa, this is the picture. They have a presence, IDI, in these different countries. Of course, two main contributors to that <coughs> are AfriHealth, which was mentioned, and uh, the Africa CDC uh, MasterCard Foundation supported activity. Again, the same question. If we continue expanding across Africa, do we 
have adequate capacity and good capacity at that to support the activities there. And on the right hand side, you can see the, uh, where the support comes from that contributes to the work that is done here. I asked them a question. How have the friends contributed to research at IDI? I must be frank here. The responses were not very satisfying to me. But I'm quoting what they told me. <clears throat> that the Friends Council, members of the Friends Council, contribute to research idea conceptualization. They contribute during implementation, results dissemination, and new projects. Now, IDI prides in calling itself a center of excellence. And I put provocative questions to them. Why do you call yourself a center of excellence? Convince me that you are a center of excellence. Here are some of the responses. They produced several responses before. And I frowned at them. <laughs> so those would not really be seen as making you look like a son of excellence. But anyway, here is where we are. That there are people have reached out to them to benchmark. First of all, let's look nationally. To benchmark on what they are doing because they are impressed that good work is going on here. Sorry. And uh, one of them is National Drug Authority. They developed, they have developed products of high quality, and uh, one of those, Barbara would know it very well, because I think she's been invited to give talks about this safeguarding policy that they developed. NIH thinks that their policy, which was developed, was a very good one. Um, they are meeting high standards for financial reporting. Yesterday, the vice chancellor, as he told us, uh, IDI has been uh, presenting every year, as is required by the Constitution, to present in the annual general meeting the audit reports of the institution. And as long as the vice chancellor has been in office, uh, every year, unqualified audit reports. That means good financial reporting. And he told us a number of other things, uh, how he went to present in parliament and so on and so on. Attracting a high, highly competitive research funding. Of course, if you can succeed in getting research funding, which is highly competitive, and I'm not going to downplay our Mark Reef. Yes, those are good research funds. But when you are competing internationally and you become a winner, yes, that speaks volumes to what you are doing. They have been leading or trailblazing in a number of areas, global health, security, meningitis, uh, the aging cohort, uh, electronic clinic enterprise, and so forth. Scientific contributions that have guided policy, which we talked about earlier, and of course, the human resource capacity development that, again, Barbara talked about. The other thing that contributes to them perceiving that they are on the road to, and I ask this very specific question, show me the data on how you are doing with these thousand publications that have been made so far, how many people are first authors who are in this environment 
and say they are part of IDI as opposed to uh, being people from anywhere but not part of IDI. I mean, if you are somewhere out there, but you say this also IDI is my institution, that counts. So, uh, as you see over there, 1,260 publications have uh, been produced so far, and this data is, uh, is end of last week. Uh, 425 IDI affiliated first authors, and 308 as senior authors. That's definitely a good development, but of course we can do better. So, as I conclude, moving research forward, we need to engage in some deep ref reflections. And these are just a few examples. How will IDI optimally engage friends in the research? Remember I said that they told me how the Friends Council, members of the Friends Council are engaging in research, and I was lukewarm about it. Because the world today believes very much in engaging patients, of course, here we don't call them patients, engaging patients in research, engaging communities in research. Not only going there to disseminate results, this is what we found and this is what we found, but right from conceptualization of the research, of course for some research that may not be possible, but for others it is, right from conceptualization through implementation of the research project, through dissemination and, forth, and so forth. One of the reasons I was frowning is they're dealing with a research council. In the research council, we know how representation goes. The research council may not represent the feelings of the other friends in the institute. How do they generate the information they share with IDI? And then you turn to me and say, but how can we engage all of them? That's your homework. That's your homework. We need to engage better. And Andrew knows, because I think it was last year, I approached him and said, Andrew, I want to understand the engagement of friends and IDI in the research and so forth. How will IDI re-engage with a loyal, long-term long great researchers, collaborators, and generous philanthropic partners? Interestingly enough, yesterday in the evening, <coughs> During the day, I don't look at WhatsApp or any of those social media things because they consume your time, valuable time. What do I see? Uh, Keith McAdam sent me an email, and he was online. I didn't know. He said, I enjoyed it today, and so on, and he went on talking. To be frank, this is where I pulled this. He said, he's heard that in December, there will be a full-fledged celebration. And he hopes this will be an opportunity to re-engage. Read the sentence. That's where I got it from. But the ideas were running through my head. And remember the minister yesterday said, you talked of founding members, founding members. Dynamic people, where are they? Are they in the, what did she, she say? In the basement? Are they in the basement? I haven't seen them. I haven't. How do we re-engage 
with those people. I tell you, they were dynamic. And there should be others, of course, who are dynamic, who were not part of that group, but who are available elsewhere, and I would like to be part of it. Engagement of Scientific Advisory Committee. What do we think about having a vibrant Scientific Advisory Committee? How do we optimally utilize patient cohorts in research? And here, Barbara somehow touched this issue. You have cohorts that spread across Uganda in those areas where you do uh, paper work. Those are people, those are big sources. I have to put it diplomatically. Uh, a lot of implementation science research can be done with those people. And this is where engagement of friends will be very useful. So the friends should not stop at those who are at IDI, even those who are spread across the country. Clinical trials were also mentioned. I think the future, there's a great future in clinical trials. Why? There are many drugs, HIV drugs, that are being developed and being tried out. TB, <coughs> not so many, but there is. And also, on other infectious diseases. I think if IDI had vibrant clinical trials, international standards, it would make IDI stand out. Uh, Muju. Muju has got vibrant clinical trials. They are part of international networks. And I think IDEA should follow suit. What is the appetite for participation in major research networks? This arises from what I've said about clinical trials. And finally, how about being a, a, a pathfinder or linkage with industry? Since in the, in the um, director's talk yesterday, he said that we have to move out of the comfort zone. Everything we do makes us move out of the comfort zone. So get out of it, reach out to industry, and that would be great. I think that is the last slide. Thank you very much. I made sure I stop on time, which is put on the program, so that there would be no questions. <laughs> but also, hey. I want my last slide back. And also, you know, the last slide says, in case of questions, <laughs> contact IDI <laughs> at the forum. <laughs> Thank you very much. So for other questions, comments, contact IDI. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect way to end it. Thank you so much, Professor Nelson, for for very elaborate and very insightful presentation. It has actually trickled a lot of our minds. I, I want to indulge you for a minute. Or let me invite Dr. Andrew to perform one, one simple task here. Please, Dr. Andrew. Okay. Uh, this, I'm sure this will take uh, <laughs> Professor Sewangabu by surprise. First of all, thank you very much for a thought-provoking talk. But before COVID emerged, we'd wanted to pass on an award to Professor Sewankam, but then COVID became an issue. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to pass on a token of appreciation from the board and management for the many years of service to the Institute. And uh, as inaugural chair of the board, and I hope I've been to Professor Sewankambo's office. There are many accolades, but I, we hope this one will have a special place. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Am I ready? Yeah.
this plot. This plaque is presented to Nelson Sewan Campbell in recognition of his dedicated efforts towards establishing IDI at McKellar University. Professor Sewan Campbell was a founding member and inaugural chair of the board. He additionally played a pivotal role in establishing the McKinnon Knowledge Center at IDI. And signed Listen carefully. <laughs> June 14th, 2019. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, IDI, for recognizing IDI founder and a founder member. It's the moment to go for break. So our break, our break first is ready. But as we are taking breakfast, we shall have gallery walks around as we take our breakfast and then we should be able to come back for our continued plenary sessions and i think we sh keep reflecting on what professor saran kabaki represented i think it was very pro uh, proactive thank you so much i start inviting our colleagues for breakfast thank you so much Yes, thank you so much. So, we want to take this opportunity to take a photo moment with the, we, I think this is the first science fair. This idea Twent has brought very memorable time to have their board members attend this idea science fair. So, I want to take a photo with the idea board members and our presenters as others continue to take breakfast. Thank you. And our partners, yes. Yes, so the stairs down there, please. So a good morning once again. You are welcome back from your break, or you can continue with your breakfast while we delve into the science. And for those online, you are welcome back as well. Um, so we are going to go into our plenary presentations and discussion. And this is very serious science, so I hope you're ready to listen to all of it. Um, at this particular point, allow me to welcome back Dr. Barbara Castelnovo. She was earlier on introduced, but I will introduce her yet again. She is a clinician trained at the University of Milan and based in Uganda since 2002. She started working at IDI in 2004 as a senior medical officer and contributed to best practices in a scale-up of ART, antiretroviral therapy in Uganda. She's a current head of research at IDI and the head of capacity building supervising several scholars from Makere University and international collaborating institutions. She is the recipient of a senior fellowship from EDCTP on HIV, NCD, and aging. She's going to be giving us a presentation on longitudinal, longitudinal patient cohorts for impactful research and HIV care at IDI. Dr. Barbara, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I hope this time I can see better, yeah. It's much better, thank you. So, I'm here once again, and um, I'm sorry, I hope you will not get bored to uh, hear from me a second time in the same morning. Um, so, uh, really, this first presentation of the thematic areas is about uh, our longitudinal cohort, and uh, I wanted to present about how longitudinal cohorts at IDI impacted uh, research and HIV care. I think at IDI, but probably also beyond uh, IDI. So, core study by design are more inclusive than uh, randomized clinical trials. We all know we need randomized clinical trials, especially when you're rolling out new intervention or, uh, uh, or drugs to really understand safety and effectiveness. However, they are not very inclusive. They usually have very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria and a limited time of follow-up. While cohorts really are designed to follow up patients for a longer period of time, and also to detect events that uh, may have not been anticipated uh, 
uh, in uh, um, in, in clinical trials, so maybe, you know, like long-term effect that you can just detect in a 48 uh, weeks uh, uh, um, study. Usually core studies uh, generate hypotheses rather than uh, dr being driven by hypotheses. And although they are costly to be set up, uh, they actually can provide really useful information uh, to support the feasibility uh, and the efficacy of scaling up sub, some treatment or interventions. Uh, so another uh, importance really of, uh, of course studies is that many times you actually need data that is relevant to a certain context. Uh, context. And so for example, in the area of people with HIV, you cannot simply assume that some outcomes uh, or response to drugs are going to be the same once you go from one setting to another setting. For example, in our setting we have different population of course, but also demographics, uh, laboratory facilities, human resources, uh, and also different epidemiology of opportunistic infections. So the main limitation saying that, and that's why I think that it's really important that we actually collect and use observational data and core data of course, there are limitations to the study design, and really uh, the main one is really the quality of the data. There are others, like for example, confounding by indication, failure to uh, assess causality, but when you really look at uh, um, cohorts that are assembled using routine collected data, the main issue with this, it's really like the quality, and so missing or incorrect. Mm -hmm. So core studies at IDI were started in the early days. I already gave you the talk of the journey of IDI, but actually cohorts have a very similar journey. And the first cohorts were actually envisioned initially by the, ac the Academic Alliance. So I remember when I joined IDI, the first research cohort was in planning. And so there was already really, the initially, immediately, uh, it was recognized that it was so important to start collecting systematically and good quality data on people starting treatment uh, at the IDI, because these were one of the first clinic where art was going to be rolled out in Uganda, and we really, nobody knew about how people they were going to be adhering to drug, if they were going to have viral suppression, if they were going to have opportunistic infection after starting art. There was really no data. What we know today, it's really what we try to collect these days, but there was really, nobody really knew what was going to happen. So I think that since the, I would say really the early days, system were set up to ensure that this data was systematically collected to be able one day really to provide results that were meaningful. And so I try to summarize relevant questions that uh, uh, were answered uh, by the cohort uh, studies at IDI in the last 20 years. And so I really think that these are the questions IDI contributed to, and then I will show you some of these answers. Uh, so it was really about the rollout of art, when to start, which drugs, uh, how best to monitor antiretroviral treatment, how would the patient respond to treatment, immunologically also, virologically, which are the best model of chaos, and also how do we manage other comorbidities, uh, where comorbidities can be opportunistic infections, but also, uh, as we are seeing in the, in, the, you know, in the current days, not necessarily only uh, infections, uh, but also non-communicable diseases. So um, I would say again, the importance of the structures. I think the projector is doing something to these slides because my titles were not like this, they were on one line. So I just want to say that there is something with the projector that is um, not aligning really. So um, I would just say really that why I think that IDI, particularly the Mulago Clinic, was an ideal site to start and host most of this cohort. And it was really about infrastructure and systems. First of all, um, there was a clinic, which up to now has over 30,000 patients that were ever registered. Uh, it was one of the first center in Uganda to receive free art and uh, uh, for routine HIV care and treatment. 
And then this was a really unique opportunity to start one of the first cohorts in Uganda. And also I think the fact that IDI in 2007 started shifting to become a specialized clinic. Uh, some IT help, I don't know what I did. Um, so to, to, to become a specialized clinic, uh, was also, yeah, that became actually, a, yeah, full screen. Uh, was actually a strength of, uh, in a way, idea, because in that way, as our population became more and more complex, we had the opportunity to start uh, uh, sub cohorts of you know, somehow uh, particularly uh, individuals with particular conditions. Um, so again, I think really this slide shows the, how we adapted the, um, the need of collecting, uh, uh, of collecting observational data with actually the evolution of the art scale up and epidemiology of uh, HIV in Uganda. I talked about the first cohort, the first court in 2004, the research court that was envisioned by uh, the Academic Alliance, uh, was really set up because there was need to track the early uh, outcomes uh, during the first scale up. Eventually it was extending to five years first and then 10 years first. I was the study coordinator at some point. <laughs> so, uh, and in parallel to that, because IDI clinic grew so fast, uh, I think that uh, we decided it was also important uh, to consider that clinic as a routine cohort. We refer to a routine cohort because it's really program. It was not, uh, they were not like study specific forms or doctors or staff, but you know, it's also very important to track outcomes when you look at the large program and you go a bit beyond you know, the uh, longitudinal cohort research environment. As I mentioned, uh, um, there was a transformation in IDI with opening a lot of specialist clinics, uh, and this started forming sub-cohorts, which actually had additional data collected for this. And for example, we had the TB and HIV integrated clinic cohort. We had uh, the sexual reproductive health cohort, uh, which uh, enrolled, uh, this is a routine course. We, I'm calling them codes, but it's really program data, just that we uh, adjusted our system to collect uh, more uh, uh, information, for example, the baby's outcomes for the uh, pregnant mothers. In 2014, we actually started a research cohort that was IDI-led, uh, and at that time, what happened is that we realized the patients of our first cohort that survived 10 years on art. And so that was already, I think, uh, a great, uh, milestone to see this, uh, that people can actually survive on that. And so we really thought, okay, what if we can, can you know, you should actually follow up these uh, individuals, at least for another 10 years, uh, in a court setting. And so that was what we called the longer term art cohort, starting in 2014. Um, and uh, I think the last uh, cohort that was initiated was in 2010. Uh, it's a cohort of people uh, that are 60 and above living with HIV. Uh, and this is because, again, we realized that people, especially in the clinics uh, located at Mulago, we had uh, at least 1,000 that are over 60. And there is really need to track uh, outcomes of people who are aging with HIV because um, they are at risk of uh, accelerating aging and uh, uh, increased risk of uh, non-communicable diseases and geriatric syndromes. So again, I wanted just to show here how it was really crucial, the role of this infrastructure. I think th all of this was possible because of this certain things uh, that were happening in IDI and at Mulago. I mentioned already the number of patients that we had. The fact that we also had a translational lab and the core lab was really important because we could have reliable lab results, but also the opportunity of storing samples. Uh, on the lower quadrant there, you can see also we had uh, the opportunity uh, through our 
uh, statistic unit, QA, QC team, to really ensure that our data was complete and accurate. As I mentioned before, this is one of the main problems with the, uh, observational data. And then ICA. ICA, for those who don't know, is our electronic medical record system which is used uh, in the clinic, and you can see on the right side of the screen, there are two snapshots. One shows the, the upper one, the summary of a patient, and the lower one, like what you enter during a routine clinic visit. So for our routine cohort, really, our data is extracted from this electronic medical record. And then our great uh, IT department was actually able uh, to build different models for the specialist cohorts. So for example, for the TB HIV integrated clinic, uh, we have a whole model that tracks TB outcomes. And so for the maternal health clinic, we have another model who is actually, which is actually able to collect information about the baby's outcome. And this was in house. And so the exciting thing is also that when, whenever we come up with a new idea, they, you know, if it is reasonable, uh, you know, they actually el help us to implement and that information we can collect. I just wanted to show you um, this. Uh, so to, sh to demonstrate that even in uh, our routine cohort, we have good qu quality of data. So this is a publication from IDI. I just would like you to focus on maybe the first line, new opportunistic infection as an example. So before ICA, so before this uh, uh, electronic medic, uh, um, uh, medical record system we have at IDI, the number of missing data was 54.6, and after the implementation was 1.9. Similarly, if you look at incorrect data, before the implementation of ICA, <coughs> the percentage was 26.2, and after was only 2.1. And this is really like quality of clinical trials, when you have like one, two percent of data that is either missing or incorrect. And so that's why I think it's important to present this uh, to show that really, yes, it's observational data, it's not a clinical trial, but at least uh, we are sure that the quality of the data that we are analyzing is good. Okay. So here is a, s a table with a summary of our quotes, and it's quite busy, and I'm not going to go through really all of this. Eh? It's really summarizing the number of patients and the follow-up visits that they had, the procedures that they had. Eh? And I've summarized for the research cohort, routine, post-TB cohort, long-term, and geriatric. So as I mentioned already, the second column uh, is the routine core. This is really like what really happens in routine in our clinic. So like may happen in any other program in Uganda, uh, patients come in, they ask how they are, collect their adherence, opportunistic infection, collect their drugs. Uh, um, art is monitored according to what is happening, you know, if it is in the guidelines. So if it is CD4 count monitoring, CD4 count. If it is viral load, it's viral load. While, if you really look at the other cohort, particularly research cohort, long-term and geriatric cohort, these are really strictly research cohort for which we put actually, um, was put extra funding uh, in order to collect more that you would do normally in routine. So for example, hematology, biochemistry, collecting systematically CD4 count, viral load, uh, and also to actually store, uh, store plasma or cells, uh, depending on, on, on the cohorts. Uh, and so on this research cohort, there was much more information collected on the patient and much more lab, uh, that, you know, lab uh, work that was done really to be able to characterize better uh, what was happening in, uh, in this cohort. The, um, the research co first research cohort, the one I told you about the first 10 years on art is closed, so the post-TB cohort, but all the other courts are open. So routine court, of course, will always remain open uh, because it's a program. <coughs> Our long term, we are actually almost clocking the end of it because uh, we enrolled in 2014 and we are almost approaching 2024. So that would be, for now, at least the end of that one. And then also the geriatric court, the funding is only for two years, but uh, so it should also end next year. But they are, at the moment, they are still, uh, they, we are still doing follow-up, although the enrollment uh, is complete. Uh, 
Now, I will really just go and, uh, on and giving you some examples of the impact of the IDI core studies and showing your results. Um, again, I'm sorry, these are busy tables. I'll try actually to summarize them even more for you. So each of the statements that is given really in these tables uh, is a publication. Um, I've published it somewhere else and all these sentences are referenced. Uh, so, about re really when to start art, uh, all our cohorts found out that first, uh, mortality was really high, uh, and the occurrence of opportunistic infection on patients just starting off art was extremely high, including TB, which occurred mostly in the first three months. And so, of course, the um, information you can get out of these studies is that you need to start people much as early as you can. When you start people late, they will still die, unfortunately, especially in the first three months, or get severe opportunistic infections. Now, regarding drugs, we have different studies done at different time, but from the research cohort, we really found at the beginning that the drugs we were given to our patients were way too toxic, particularly stavudin. So most of our patients were actually either losing weight, getting lipodystrophy, and that resulted in toxicity and frequent switch to other uh, antiretroviral treatment, so drug substitution. But we also found out that, for example, uh, given zidovudin containing regimen, uh, were patients who were getting this regimen were more likely to get suboptimal immune uh, reconstitution. So anyway, th this is all uh, you know, things that have contributed, we believe, not just IDI, clearly, but to, uh, you know, to, the, um, to develop a, a, a body of literature that shows that the drugs that were given initially to our patients were not the best one. And in fact, we know in 2008, Ministry of Health shifted drastically to um, give everyone, if possible, tenofovir. Uh, we also found uh, in the, our routine cohort uh, in, on Stavudin, we actually had uh, uh, a high mortality on people who developed lactic acidosis. So not just, uh, you know, like having lipodystrophy or not doing so well, but really we had mortality because of that. I think of lately, as I mentioned before, the, um, the, um, we are really focusing on study a bit more, the safety profile of dolutegravir. This is now with the new cohort, clearly not with the old cohort. Particularly, um, we were uh, one of the few groups that uh, actually uh, documented dolutegravir-associated apoglycemia and patients switched to dolutegravir after being long time on some other regimen. And it's not been actually uh, seen in many other places, and we think it's because of the level of pretreatment of our patients somehow had, um, uh, had impacted the, the response uh, uh, of uh, patients to, to dolutegravir. So again, when you look out to monitor, again, uh, we got basic information both from our research cohort and our routine cohort, and I'm going to again to summarize. So, from our research cohort in the early days, we have learned that when you have people who, are, who come with skin manifestations that, they, that disappeared after starting art and then reappear, that could be really an indication of virological failure. And so did help us in the, in the early days to know sometimes if you have few viral loads you can use for some of your patients that actually if someone comes back with a prurigo that had disappeared, you should do a viral load because probably these people are actually feeling treatment. But we also learn other things, for example, that you need to repeat viral load before switching people to, um, to a second regimen. Remember, those days there were no WHO guidelines for re repeating a viral load. So we're talking about when viral load was not included. But we already knew that you have to repeat a viral load from the data in our cohort because most of people were resuppressing on the second viral load. So that's what we learned about uh, from our research cohort. From our routine cohort, we also learned that really uh, immunologic criteria for detecting treatment failure uh, actually lead to a lot of uh, kind of missed, you miss people you need to switch, but you also switch people who don't need switching. And I, I think in IDI, we really had a lot of publication about documenting all those delaying switching uh, when you uh, actually use immunologic criteria. 
and we kept publishing because uh, we thought it was really important in trying to lobby for viral loads in resource limited setting. Uh, it was really like kind of a blind game to try to understand who was failing after and who was not when we're using immunologic criteria. Um, I think IDI also contributed to models of care and understand which models of care are working and are safe. For example, uh, um, let's just shift on the routine clinic. I think that has the most uh, uh, interesting results. Uh, IDI was one of the first clinics uh, in Uganda who tried task shifting. Uh, and that was merely due to the fact that we had 500 people a day that were lining up. Uh, and it was, I mean, it was usually, it was literally, you know, we'd open the door and it was like a critical mass of people and you just wonder how we're going to clear the line today here. And so we started with really task shifting, empowering nurses uh, to be able to see patients that were stable and also pharmacists to just give out drug refills. I know that now it seems to all of you an obvious thing to do because everybody does it. Uh, but when we did it uh, we, uh, for the first time, people were actually saying, you can't do that. Nurse cannot prescribe drugs. Pharmacists cannot just ask, are you okay, and give out the drugs, and then you walk away. Um, so what was, is now the norm, there was really pioneer work. And we were able to demonstrate that this model, of course, improved the patient flow. Patient was staying like two, three hours less in the clinic, eh? but also that there were no negative outcomes in terms of loss to follow up uh, or morbidity or mortality. And so this is, I think, really informed first our program that it was the right thing to do, and then hopefully also other programs. Uh, okay, so our course, they also had a lot of sub-studies. And uh, so I, I think also this sub-study, and some people who actually did the sub-studies are in the room. So uh, I hope I haven't missed any of them, but I possibly I could. Uh, so first of all, I, I just want to say, these uh, research studies, they were really great platforms for uh, idea investigators, for local investigators. So imagine if you already have a cohort of patients uh, for where they're coming, someone is paying for the transport, someone is collecting their labs, and you are a scholar or a student or a junior investigator, uh, you don't need a lot of resources to say, oh, well, I have a research idea, let me try this on the IDI cohort. And so this is exactly what happened. Now, most of the people who published there today, they're big professors, but when they did this, they were not. <laughs> <So> <laughs> So I will start with actually the crack screening. The, I think is one, one of the first studies of me I did at IDI, if not the first one, is it? it? <laughs> and he was able actually to demonstrate that in settings where the, uh, you have a certain, this thing is its, its own life. He had to demonstrate that in a setting where uh, actually, uh, you know, a cryptococcus is uh, quite prevalent, it is actually cost effective to screen everyone uh, with a CD4 count less than 100. Uh, and this is cost effective in preventing disease and death. Uh, and if you just give art alone without prophylaxis, uh, actually this is not enough. People will still uh, develop uh, cryptococcal meningitis and you know, maybe die. But you need, uh, you need to detect uh, and then you need to treat uh, to give prophylaxis. Uh, there was also a study on the prevalence of hepatitis B in our population by Dr. Ochama. And uh, they found actually that uh, uh, hepatitis B co-infection in 9%, which is, uh, I mean, it's still quite substantial. But they, I think the nice result of that study is that, is that uh, the risk of uh, uh, ART-related hepatotoxicity was actually low even with the people who were, who were co-infected. And that's what uh, we really wanted to know. If people were co-infected with hepatitis B, were at higher risk of liver toxicity, and they were not. Um, other people have looked uh, at, at you, they used actually the core studies uh, as a kind of machine learning uh, training place where they were able to train model to predict uh, early virologic suppression and then applying these models to other, uh, to other cohorts and, uh, uh, and validate them. Um, there was a sub-study looking at uh, prevalence of uh, uh, subclinical malaria, antigenemia, and uh, it found that it was low, really, in our population, uh, probably due to the long-term success of art, and also at this was the time where there was still cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. So I don't know if this is still completely true. 
again, some more studies from our collaborators. So there was some immune, um, uh, immunologic work that was done that actually showed, uh, um, th that actually, s that actually showed that even in patients with uh, uh, long-term viral suppression, uh, you still uh, have subgroup with suboptimal CD4 count reconstitution, and this group really uh, has uh, um, T cell activation and exhaustion uh, and alteration of the natural killer population. And also another uh, finding um, of another sub-study was really that even when a patient reach normal level of CD4 count, uh, you still have uh, immune dysfunction. And that probably calls again for an early start of art. Uh, we also had a couple of studies looking at, uh, uh, at uh, bone health. Uh, one of the studies was able to demonstrate that you can use, uh, so to measure really bone density, um, you need to use DEXA, which is extremely expensive. I think it's $180. So obviously nobody can do it in routine. Even in research, it's almost not sustainable. Uh, so we try to validate an alternative system, uh, which is using an ultrasound. It's called calcaneal ultrasound. Uh, and by measuring like certain, uh, with an ultrasound, certain part of the bones, then you can actually see if there is uh, bone loss. So it's not a perfect tool from our study, but it's a good screening tool. So that could actually, uh, actually we are using it for our, um, for our geriatric cohort, we are doing, uh, we are using uh, ultrasound, uh, calcaneal ultrasound to measure their bone density. Uh, and also another study done with the using DEXA uh, shows that uh, higher body mass index is actually protective for bone loss. Uh, and uh, again, this is another result from our cohort. I think, yes. So. I'm about to close this. What I uh, wanted to close is what about like lesson learned, more about impact. So I think courts remain an important resource to, infor to inform programs. I try to give you as many results as I can, but I have many more, you know, and these were just, I think, examples on how can use core data, how can you can add sub studies uh, from lab research to oper uh, operational research and so on, and be able to, co to anyway inform your program or other programs. Uh, I think it was a great investment, the one of IDI for observational cohort, because they were really able to answer to a lot of questions. Uh, I think also with the time, uh, investigators uh, have gained a lot of experience in study design, how to develop the tools, uh, and also how to analyze them in-house. The first cohort were really designed by senior people, and people like, for example, me, as I said, I was a study coordinator of some of these people in their room. They came as young fellows to do some studies, but now they design their own cohort. You know, they know how to design, how to implement, what is relevant, how to get funding from the cohort. So this is also, I think, shows, you know, like, again, goes back to the capacity building that is always built at IDI at each and every level. Uh, I definitely think that one of the reasons why this was successful is because of the infrastructure I showed you. And so it is, you need to build first, I, I think, capacity for infrastructure, and then you can put cohorts on top, not the other way around. So I think it was really a great place to do that. Um, so, I think really that some results from our court have put us and Macarena University at the center of the response uh, of the HIV epidemic, especially at the beginning. Uh, being able to document some of these outcomes was really uh, important. Several students uh, have also used the clinical research platform and they are still, uh, so even I uh, talked about the one of the early days, but as we speak, uh, there are actually fellows at Macarere, uh, fellows in our D43 grant, fellows in our EDCTP uh, geriatric cohort that, that are actually using this cohort at platforms uh, for their research questions. Uh, and so I also think that ma because many of the people involved in this quarter at IDI are also part of panels at the level of Ministry of Health, by actually, you know, like kind of documenting this experience, was, we're always able to be relevant with, the, you know, the most recent data to inform uh, uh, even committees at uh, uh, national levels. 
I also wanted to show how the ID course, they went, they went a bit international. So there is this great meeting, which this year is happening tomorrow and Friday. So this year we cannot be present, but <coughs> since 2008, uh, IDI has always featured in uh, the international workshop uh, on HIV and hepatitis observational database. This is an annual meeting, and I can assure you, IDI is actually, I think, the only court, the African court that is back there every single year with something. There are some other, very few, but we are really, really been constant for the last 16 years, so 14 years. So we are really, we only been present. In the IDEA, in uh, 2011, IDI courts were also awarded as one of the center of excellence by the ND network. This was an African network. And also, the IDI cohorts, uh, especially the IDI routine cohort at Mulago, contributes to the IDEA network. IDEA is International Epidemiology Databases to Evaluate AIDS, and is an international consortium that was started in 2006 by NIH. And uh, uh, 2.2 million people living with HIV are included, and we can give our contribution. There are a lot, <coughs> really, of publication from the IDEA network, which include the IDI data and authors. So here are my acknowledgments. Uh, again, I want to uh, thank all the staff at IDI uh, from our department, but also from the programs, because as I said, some of this data was really collected in routine, which means that so many nurses and doctors and counselors, uh, and uh, you know, for example, in the clinic department has entered the data that we've been able to analyze. Uh, the IT department, uh, as I said, I'm really, uh, uh, we've really been so privileged to work with a department <coughs> that has always listened to clinicians when we wanted to build some tools to collect data and also always wanted to go to the extra mile when someone of us says, oh, but now I think we need to collect more data about this condition or this disease. And of lately, I would say also our statistical team that's been able really to help us with REDCap to add information to uh, our cohorts. Of course, our court participants and all the IDI investigators for their contribution in the protocol writing, study implementation, and disseminations of court data. Um, our funders, of course, the first cohorts were uh, really, you know, there was like really Pfizer funding that went into the cohort. IDI has put a lot of core funding into the uh, um, IDI routine cohort and in the long-term alt court, which is the one that is uh, uh, running. And uh, I also want to thank, of course, and I have to recognize the funding from EDCTP for the geriatric cohort. Thank you. I do know that, so, I, I know that this session is supposed to be followed by, I think, uh, Ans uh, questions. I don't know how long because we are running a bit late with the program. Hmm? But there are the people in the room. Okay. I don't know if you need it. Uh, Sarah? Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's on. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, in at one point you said because of the prevalence of uh, opportunistic infection, it was necessary to screen, cost effective to screen, detect, and give prophylax and treat and your treatment was prophylaxis. How can you, having detected, then treat using prophylaxis? Can I go one by one, or do you, do you collect? Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much for that great presentation and the different cohorts. My question is, um, have we explored expanding these cohorts or pulling data from other 
Ugandan cohorts, because I'm sure there are many different cohorts that are uh, that we can pull the data to have bigger national cohort. And um, also asking a, quest a second question, how we can expand the ISEA database to these cohorts so that we can pull related data. Thank you. So great presentation, Barbara. Um, I wanted to, one, acknowledge some of the rural places where we went and all of the people that um, we were just reminiscing about Chiboga and I would just like to recognize some of the district hospitals and their ability to really help us gather data and, and I think they were fantastic, the DHOs and everyone else who worked in those places. But I would urge you also to think about how to be part of bigger cohorts, as Domley was saying. Empath has made an entire business out of having a gigantic cohort. They invite international investigators to come and do work who pay to participate every year. They pay several thousand dollars just to be part of Ampath, where they can send trainees. And it turns out to be a money-making venture that then funds the cohort. So just something to think about. Um, Let me say by answering, as maybe people think for a question. So I think for you can, and Damali, I don't have an, an answer, but something like you can mention to think about. Uh, I'm aware that other courts, definitely in the country, um, so interestingly, some of them contribute to the uh, idea network, huh? but we never try to pull ourselves together. So maybe, yes. Maybe it's really time to put together like data. Of course, it's collected in a different way, but uh, of course, there are, there are ways. Uh, and uh, I know we have Agnes also here in the room that explained to me how, you know, there are, there are really methods to pull data, even when it is correct, collected in a different way. Uh, so maybe that, that, that could really be like something to look maybe in the next. Uh, five, ten, ten years. I mean, something really. T we have all this amount of data, and then probably we will find a better use. So I take a note of that, and thank you so much for the um, for the suggestion. Now, to the board chair. So, uh, sorry, I was very fast. So these are people, and David, may correct me if I'm wrong. So these are people who had actually asymptomatic. Uh, cryptococcemia, which means it's in the blood. It's not yet caused what is now the ultimate problem of cryptococcus is meningitis. And so <coughs> if you don't screen them, what is actually going to happen is that eventually they are going to get meningitis. So it's, much, so it's actually secondary prophylaxis eh, to prevent meningitis. So the infection in the blood is already there. Now, <coughs> this becomes cost effective in a country like Uganda to screen everyone because it's in people who have less than uh, 100 CD4 count, eh, this problem is quite frequent. So I think they sh you should do it anywhere, you know, but if you're really going to look uh, also about the cost factor, it's really cost effective. If you don't do it, you are going to end up pay more because these people will eventually get meningitis uh, and then you are going to pay m much more money. So yeah. I hope it's more clear now. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sorry for the uh, confusion earlier. Been warned is the last one. Uh, Barbara, my comment again was about, yes, the, the need to move away from, uh, and again, in addition to Damali's question about the need to pull data together. They've been, there's a lot of advancements around uh, harmonizing data and democratizing data for public good. We need to think about methods that can help us transform the data we've collected for 20 years at IDI, the cohorts all over the years, and move them together, harmonize them, standardize them, and make them comparable with other cohorts for bigger collaborative um, data science-led projects. So I'll be happy to discuss more on that. I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Barbara, for giving us an understanding of the cohorts.
Thank you so much. And I really take the, uh, all the advice that has come as likely the next step for that. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to, you know, to see actually that there is more work to do with the, the court. But I also, uh, I know many people are attending, uh, even online, so I also want to encourage people, especially junior investigators, uh, who wants to write an abstract, they have a research question that they think can be answered in our cohort, to please approach us, because we really have the data. And I firmly believe this is really also really a platform for junior investigators to start doing their own research, even when, when they don't have money. We have the patients, we have the data, we have the samples, and we are very happy if we can train someone who is more junior on how they conduct their analysis uh, and to publish it. Thank you. So our next, sec our next presentation is going to be from the Cryptococcal Meningitis team. And I would like to invite um, Fiona Cresswell to actually chair the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm really just um, honored to be introducing um, Professor David Mayer, who's going to um, share lots of information about the last um, 10 years plus of uh, meningitis research in Uganda. Um, Professor Mayer is someone who excels on many fronts, uh, not only an exceptional scientist with, only, with over 200 publications, um, but is also a brilliant physician and often seen on the wards in Malago, training the next generation of doctors. Um, national cricketer on the side but also at the same time really a brilliant leader and has built a world-class research team um, on brain infections and really put U Uganda on the map for brain infection research. Um, and just in the last three years, over a thousand patients with brain infections have been recruited into the cohort from Chirudu and Malago Hospital. Um, and um, the team have been performing cross-disciplinary research on epidemiology, immunology, diagnostics and therapeutics um, and you're going to hear about some of that today um, and we heard from Professor Soen Cambo about research culture and I think the team that Professor Mayer has built really exemplifies that um, because it's a very cohesive and self-motivated team um, who are really working together to pursue excellence in, in meningitis research um, so it's my great pleasure to hand over to you Professor Mayer. Uh, thank you, Fiona, I, I, for your kind introduction. I was about to give this spot to somebody else to present, but then I realized I would miss the opportunity to reminisce, as, as Yuka said, <laughs> over the last uh, 18 years. I think we really go back 2005, I believe, is, is when we, our research group really started. Uh, I hope the technology, this is not uh, IDI. I, <laughs> the IT people, I'm not sure what happened to this, but I think it, it, uh, something needs to be done. I, I begin off with a quote, and, and this is a quote from Haile Gerima, who's an Ethiopian filmmaker. You know, he says, to move forward, you, you must reclaim the past. In the past, you find the future and understand the present. And I thought it was a brilliant quotation for this, for as we think about looking at the last 20 years, obviously looking forward as well for um, IDI as a whole. Our team, as I said, you know, it's, it's grown over the years and many of you who've been part of th that culture, as, as Fiona said, uh, th there's been a contribution from, from very many people. Uh, if you look at the, I know I can't point, but, but that gentleman right there, Professor Paul Bojanen, who was at the University of Minnesota for many years and recently moved to the University of Rochester, was really, if you, call, if you want to call him, the grandfather of, of this uh, research group. And having come here as uh, an IDSA trainer for the HIV course, he then sort of became curious and eventually uh, brought me on board and David Bulware, Professor David Bulware, who is at the University of Minnesota. And, you know, we, we have 
really never looked back. And, and we have had a growing collaboration across uh, the world. The, team, the team's focus has really been um, adults with HIV-related meningitis. And I think as Fiona pointed out, you know, that has sort of just spawned uh, multidisciplinary um, growth of different research areas. And, and we have, we've had a team that, as you can see, uh, I, I keep telling the team that, that when we started way back, I was everything. <laughs> And they don't like to hear that anymore. But, but, but you can see how the team has really grown uh, to just involve so many facets and so many people uh, that have helped us be really productive. I think one or two years ago, we, we had a, a team of uh, people that you know, deal with team building, sort of come and work with the team. And one of the outcomes was really what we thought our vision was. And you know, we thought we are a vibrant state of the art meningitis research and training hub, uh, delivering quality healthcare and influencing public uh, health policy. I added impacting people and saving lives because I think in many ways, that's what we have embodied over um, the, the last couple of years. And as you will hear from uh, some of the slides that I will present. Our major objectives have really been to improve diagnostics, uh, improve therapeutics, to understand the pathogenesis of uh, meningitis syndromes. We've really wanted to impact policy and in some ways we, we've been able to do that. Building capacity not just for the individuals that work with the team and are affiliated with the team, but for health systems as well. And we've obviously wanted to improve outcomes and I think the other piece has been to determine cost effectiveness of these interventions. The epidemiology of meningitis is, is something we have, we have learned about over the years and we definitely continue to learn. But I think if you look at studies that we, we did between 2015 and 2017, clearly demonstrating that cryptococcal meningitis was the major um, etiology of, Cryptococcus neoformans was really the major etiology of meningitis among individuals with HIV. And if you look at the other aspects, obviously TB meningitis uh, is, is fairly there between 8 to 10%. Uh, we also have individuals with symptomatic cryptococcal antigenemia. They do have symptoms, but do not have specific evidence of uh, cryptococcal meningitis. An interesting uh, cohort of individuals and obviously individuals who show up with um, bacterial viral meningitis. And there's that unknown group, which again, continues to demand investigation. Uh, we have sort of moved a little bit into uh, TB meningitis as well. And just a little data that shows that, you know, TB meningitis remains uh, fairly significant as a, as a clinical problem. Uh, I think before we, we had better diagnostics, most of these patients were, I think once they came to the wards, you know, people just thought they had some sort of bacterial meningitis and they ended up getting uh, antibiotics but not really uh, anti-TB therapy. And, and no wonder the death rates were really high. But over time, as, and as I will highlight, you know, the TB diagnostics have improved and we have certainly been a part of uh, that journey as well. So just in terms of the diagnostics, th there's really been a broad landscape of um, the, the work that we have been doing over the years. You know, ranging from low-tech uh, point-of-care tests to medium, um, you know, tests including your uh, expert ultra and as well as the high-end uh, specialist lab uh, work that we've been involved in with other uh, partners. And just quickly going through, so with cryptococcal disease, obviously the Krag lateral flow assay, which was developed in 20, around 2010, 2011, and really changing the, um, the diagnostics around cryptococcal disease. Uh, I mean, to have a test that gives you about 99% sensitivity and 99% specificity, I think is, is really great. And that test has obviously gone on, I think, to save lives. You know, that's just to say the least. Uh, cryptococcal antigenemia, I think, as 
Professor Yuka highlighted, you know, some of this work started in Chiboga, which I, I, we don't have many fellows going out there these days, but, but certainly contributing to, to what we now understand as, as good interventions. For TB, we've also had, um, you know, had involvement in validation studies around uh, the expert, the regular expert previously, and now the regular, uh, rather the expert ultra, the Alea TB LAM, the Fuji LAM, which has had some problems more recently. And, but we've also looked at other uh, biomarkers like CSF lactate. And for all CNS infections, so broadly looking at uh, the BioFire PCR-based platforms. And in 2022, you know, we had our first nature communications paper, which was really a, a complex paper looking at machine learning as far as uh, TB diagnostics uh, were concerned. And, and hopefully that's, that's work that will eventually uh, be able to have knowledge transfer and technology transfer to, to the bedside and hopefully improve um, diagnostics of meningeal syndromes. Looking at therapies over the last, again, 18 years or so, we, we've had a couple of studies. Some of these have been strategy trials. Some of them have been uh, phase three trials, phase two trials. But I'll just highlight a few. I think the COT trial in 2014 uh, with this New England Journal of Medicine paper that was looking at the timing or answering the question around when should you initiate antiretroviral therapy if an individual has had uh, cryptococcal meningitis. And Professor Yuka was obviously heavily involved in that. She was head of research at the time and certainly supported this a lot. Uh, I think sometimes you, you answer, well, the contribution I think has also been as part of our group to show what doesn't work. And a couple of years ago, there was, uh, I think, some data that suggested that cetraline, which is an SSRI antidepressant, was useful for cryptococcal disease. And you know, those were phase one and some phase two studies. But eventually, we went on to do this phase three trial that demonstrated that it did not work as adjunctive uh, therapy. And We've also had uh, the AMBITION trial, which was a multi-center, uh, multinational trial, and Uganda contributed, uh, I think, 40%, about 40% of the entire uh, patient population that was uh, enrolled. But it was really answering the question, can you use single-dose liposoma uh, with a high at a high dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram for cryptococcal meningitis? And that work is now part of um, the WHO guidelines. I think the other interesting trial that we've been involved with has been this uh, ENACT trial that's really looking at, can you take um, a lipid nanocrystal formulation of amphotericin as an oral drug and use it to treat individuals with cryptococcal meningitis? And that work continues. We are now, we've completed the phase one and phase two trials and hopefully we will have a phase three trial going. But certainly we are demonstrating that there is promise in using oral amphotericin for cryptococcal meningitis. And I also highlight the, right, and this was a trial that was part of uh, uh, Fiona Creswell's uh, PhD that was really looking at the use of high dose oral and intravenous rifampicin for the treatment of tuberculosis uh, meningitis, which was a RIFT trial. And finally, we have the HARVEST trial, which I've just uh, highlighted with that logo. And that's really looking at the use of high-dose rifampicin for TB meningitis. An ongoing trial, again, uh, multi-site, multinational, and Uganda is leading the recruitment numbers for that trial. There's the improved trial, which is ongoing, that's really looking at the use of, um, of rifampicin as well uh, for individuals who may have cryptococcal meningitis, uh, but you're sort of trying to figure out whether you can prevent, it's really a TB preventive trial, and that's being run by Jane Ellis, who is a PhD candidate. And the final one that I didn't highlight there is an, a cohort, now that we've just spoken about cohorts, we, we have an ongoing cohort that's really, that's enrolling 
individuals who have had cryptococcal meningitis. And we've had people come in to, I think the farthest down is probably coming to three years now. And we're trying to answer the questions around what happens to individuals who've had cryptococcal meningitis, you know, over a long period of time. When does uh, cryptococcal, um, the CSF Krag test turn negative? So these individuals have agreed to have lumbar punctures two, three, four years after they've had uh, infection. And, and so we think that's going to be an interesting uh, study uh, as well to answer some of those questions. In, in terms of pathogenesis, I think there's, there's always, with infectious diseases, it, it's always exciting to look at host pathogen interactions. And we have certainly had the opportunity to uh, do some of these studies and continue to do that. And the pathogenesis not just of TB, but the pathogenesis of uh, cryptococcal disease as well. And some viral um, meningitides as well that, that among, among the patients that we see. So we've had a couple of studies and, you know, whether those have been uh, just focused on host-directed therapies or the management of core infections and the management of intracranial pressure and how ART interacts with the host and pathogens. Uh, so Dr. Musubire looked at neutrophils in cryptococcal disease. Uh, we've had others looking at antiretroviral therapy. With, uh, with other opportunistic infections, comorbid infections. We are also, um, we've had the opportunity to continue and continue to do autopsy studies that are really highlighting, uh, you know, whether that's drug levels uh, after individuals have died or just the pathogenesis of what happens in, in their uh, CNS. We've also, we continue to look at chemokines and cytokines as part of the immune system and the uh, interaction with meningitis, uh, CSF biomarkers, uh, CD4 counts, especially among patients who have high CD4 counts but present with cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, CSF pressure, again, that continues to be an area of investigation. How do you best control it to prevent and reduce mortality? For TB, I think looking at TB bacillary load uh, through, um, you know, just PCR-based uh, testing with cycle thresholds, and CMV as, as well. In terms of policy and guidelines and what our impact has been, the, I talked about the ambition regimen that's uh, already now really part of the first line therapy for cryptococcal meningitis. The, we contributed data for the expert ultra policy recommendation, especially around the diagnosis of TB meningitis. I mentioned the court trial and ART timing after cryptococcal meningitis, and we've certainly contributed data for approval of the CRAG LFA as part of the FDA approval. Uh, in terms of WHO uh, recommendations around CRAG screening and preemptive treatment, again, dating back to the Chivoga days, uh, which, which contributed to some of this data, and the cohort that uh, uh, Barbara highlighted, and I think one of the exciting things that we have uh, been involved with has been the partnership with the Ministry of Health to train healthcare providers, and not just on crag screening, but implementation of cryptococcal meningitis recommendations. I think people, people can easily get confused about what exactly are you using now in terms of uh, treatment of cryptococcal meningitis, because it's just been, the studies have you know, just brought to light the fact that you can continue to improve uh, the regimens that you're using. And so, yeah, the, the facilities out there really need a lot of uh, support in terms of following what uh, needs to be done or what's recommended. So we haven't just stuck to the patients and the lab and, and publishing papers. We've certainly been involved in community engagement uh, initiatives and especially around uh, World AIDS Day, we try to go out to do public engagement activities, whether that's TV or, or radio, and uh, that's been going on since 2018. We've also had a circus event in Kamocha, uh, where you know a lot of people came and and we talked. There was a skit that the IDI uh, drama team was heavily involved in that, uh, just trying to 
talk to people in the communities about um, diagnosis of meningitis and the, the fact that lumbar punctures can be done without necessarily uh, being, you know, having negative impacts. And we continue to have this medical education with healthcare providers across many clinics, in, in not just around Kampala, but certainly in other areas. And, and I mean, that has had a twofold uh, benefit. One is just providing that information to healthcare providers, but it's also helped us enroll patients as well because they typically get to refer uh, patients to us. So we, we see that as, as an important aspect of the, the work that we do. A very short video, uh, and then we will have three or four more slides after this. I remember how I came where we are now in 1979 to train as a doctor. Unfortunately, by the year 2000, after graduating as a doctor, I discovered I had got infected with HIV. I've had TB about five times, including MDR TB. I had cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, which is common in the terminal AIDS. And then I developed meningitis. But by God's grace, I didn't die. We consider just HIV AIDS alone, uh, you know, the the seroprevalence or the surveys that the Ministry of Health does have suggested that it's about 7% of people are infected with HIV. I think it's about 50,000 new infections every year. Openness and awareness is really critical in, in the sort of fight against HIV uh, because stigma is one of the biggest uh, challenges. So, you know, there are effective treatments for HIV, yet a lot of people are scared to come forward and test. There's concerns about taking tablets home and loved ones finding them. Um, getting seen coming into clinic. People often think it's a death sentence. They don't realize it can be treated with as little as one pill once a day. Hey Rachel, our results are back. Are you ready to receive them? There you are. Unfortunately, your HIV positive. It's okay. It will all be fine. Okay? One of the issues of stigma is that when you mention HIV or AIDS, people say, oh my God, I've died. That's not true. And that's what I always tell people that, look, if you do the right things, you can live a normal life. If you have uh, an undetectable viral load, that means you, are, you cannot transmit the HIV to someone else. So the goal is to make sure everyone knows their status. If you are positive, you have to start treatment as soon as possible. We were very lucky to receive um, a public engagement grant from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We've done TV and radio um, events because you know, many people are scared of healthcare. They don't like going to clinics, yet they, they will be in the, the villages listening to radio. And so we've done some testimonials from patients who've given their story about surviving advanced HIV disease. But we decided to sort of go upstream to see how can we prevent those individuals once they have the infection. How do I see the future of HIV AIDS? I think one of the things that is very clear is that there has to be continued funding. We need to think about a cure though. Um, and there's a lot of research going on. Can you move it to the next slide? I'm not sure what this does. Okay. Yeah, so just coming almost to the end of my talk, I, I couldn't um, leave this talk without talking about this meeting that we, we've had. Uh, so for the last three decades, there's been an international conference on cryptococcus and cryptococcal disease.
that's been exclusively held in the developed world. And, you know, for the first time this year, we were supposed to have it hosted in 2020, you know, it eventually came to the African continent, a place where the majority of people with cryptococcal meningitis are. And it was exciting to host it, and obviously IDI played the, the honors to, to host this meeting. And I think it's, it's testament of, of where we have come from, and, and I think where we are going, just in terms of the impact and influence that, that the IDI, I believe, is, is having uh, on policy and uh, research and impact on change of guidelines and, and on all of that. So we, we are certainly grateful that the uh, that over the last, you know, 20 years or so, you know, we've developed these incredible partnerships through the research that we've been doing. And, and that those partnerships definitely continue to grow. The, the capacity development, you know, we've had more than 150 papers in the last one and a half decades. Uh, that works up to about 10, 12 papers a year, which is an incredible resource. We, you know, incredible impact, I think, not just for the, the people who are doing the research, but I think for the contribution that we have uh, for Makere broadly, and, and, and IDEA is certainly contributing to that. With almost th more than 30 grants over the last 15 years, there, there's been an incredible uh, aspect of supporting the translational lab, which, which, uh, which has grown uh, over the years uh, because of the the work that we have been doing as well. Uh, we've had this multi-site, multinational site uh, coordination. IDI is the hosting coordination center for the harvest trial happening in Indonesia and South Africa as well. And I'd already oh. mentioned the partnership with the Ministry of Health. The list of individuals there is, you know, people that have had training through the support of the, the the research group uh, for fellowships, bachelors, masters, and PhD uh, trainees. Uh, there have obviously been many fellows I haven't listed who have come through the, the program. And we, it's, it's really been uh, rewarding, I think, to, to see numerous young people uh, start, develop, and grow their research careers. Um, like many colleagues here, obviously, the last 20 years, have contributed to some of us graying, but it's exciting. The future, what do we want to see? One, I think, is a zero incidence of cryptococcal meningitis, and that clearly will require uh, an excellent screening program, screening and treatment program. I just highlight very quickly um, our, the part of, we're part of this strategy. It's an international global strategy to end cryptococcal meningitis deaths by 2030 really looking at the setting of high-level targets, uh, focusing on how to increase and sustain donor support, uh, areas of country implementation which continue to be important, and how to address barriers to access to drugs and, and care. And, and then, of course, continuing to um, foster research funding uh, as well. And the, the other aspect is reducing mortality of HIV-associated meningitis. TB meningitis, I think, continues to be really problematic. So that's an area we, we really need to work on. We, we also see, we want to see enhanced immunology research. It's, it's amazing how, how much we're able to do now. Uh, of course, because of all the partners that have been involved. I think if you just take the example of flow cytometry, uh, we, the IDI has had capacity to only look at eight colors, yeah. eight parameters. Um, and now there's the possibility of looking at way more than 30 parameters just on a single cell. And we, we don't have to ship samples to, to the US or to other places now because some of this work is being done uh, here. And I think more importantly, you know, we, having a productive, happy and motivated team um, that is impacting policy and improving human lives is, is something we definitely want to continue to see. Uh, we acknowledge all the partners and especially the IDI for housing us. I think Andrew 
all, well, usually uses the word flagship <laughs> for, for whenever he's talking about the, the cryptococcal meningitis group. And we've certainly been well supported by the Institute to, uh, to make sure that this research uh, happens and that the impact we've had continues. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mayor, Professor Mayor, for that very exciting presentation. We'll open up the floor for questions. And I'd also like to encourage our online audience to post their questions or lift their hands so we can open up the mic for them. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I didn't clap my hands because I wanted to say it myself. Thank you. Uh, I hear talk about last mile. I hear talk about AIDS-free, HIV-free society yeah. in 2030. Yeah. But I'm still perturbed by 7% uh, prevalence rate. Is it prevalence? Prevalence. And the lingering stigma. <laughs> who, who is this person? Where does he come from? Who yeah. still thinks stigma is, has a point? <laughs> Why stigma about what? So, but my real question is this um, cryptococcal meningitis, you've studied it a lot. Isn't there any behavioral component? Is there nothing we ordinary people can do to prevent ourselves getting cryptococcal meningitis? Well, Stephen, I'm sure you can speak loud. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can go ahead and then he'll. Yeah, so I'm going to add on to that. I think that it would be great if the cryptococcal group could also consider the concept of late presentation. It continues to plague many yeah. places. It's not just here, it's everywhere. And I think that if we continue to have late presentation, we're going to continue to have cryptococcal meningitis. And so you might have to cone back and think a little bit more about not just doing your um, public service announcements about cryptococcus, but also considering the people who are still in the shadows and don't feel comfortable getting tested. So yeah. I appreciated the, the video, and I hope that you're thinking about that as well. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Professor Mayor, for this detailed and insightful mm -hmm. I think mine's on the community engagement component. Yeah. I know you, you said you got a grant to, uh, from London School, but how can we make it sustainable so that we don't wait to hear for it to be funded to go into community yeah. engagement activities for Kratokoko? Can we leverage within the existing structures and see how it can, it can be a continuous process? Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mayor for this work. Uh, my question or comment is about cryptococo and the One Health approach. Since it is an ubiquitous organism, what do you have in store in this area? Thank you. Th thanks, David. Yeah. First of all, for me on a personal note is appreciation. You know, I went through your hand <laughs> and I keep reminding you that. So thanks for the good job. Yeah. So I, I think mine would be a, a slightly different. Yeah. The, the crypto program has been at the center stage of a lot of uh, developments, treatment of logarithms, diagnostics. Yeah. But as, uh, as Africa is moving into a lot of uh, industrialization, my question to you, how have, we made, how have we moved to make a business sense in terms of intellectual property for some of these products? Specifically like the Krug LFA, 
which um, I was privileged to contribute to the validation. Thanks. Okay, are there questions online or maybe we'll, maybe I'll take this first. So, Professor Logoba, good, good question. Uh, I, I think the, the challenge of HIV, you know, over the next seven years is, is still going to be huge. I, I don't think that we are, it's good to have targets, absolutely, but seven years away, I think in 2020 we thought 2030 was very far but now it's, it's only s six years away, more or less. And yes, there there's continues to be a lot of stigma, and I think as Professor Yuka was saying, there are individuals who, who will just not show up. I think the, the, social, the social aspects of HIV, uh, I think, get undermined by, perhaps by us clinicians a lot there's a huge component of, because it is a social disease, and, and that's, that's hard to deal with. It's not just about giving people a pill or a vaccine and that's it. But I think the social aspect of HIV will remain difficult to grapple with uh, over the next seven years. I, I don't know whether that's the name of that person, stigma, I, I believe it is. But, but that's, I think that's what we need to, to continue fighting. How do we prevent cryptococcal meningitis? I think the one answer is that remain HIV free. That's, <laughs> that's, that's one thing. Because we've certainly seen that from the 80s when HIV sort of showed up, especially around uh, Eastern Central Africa, that's when the cases of cryptococcal meningitis, you know, sporadically increased. There's one case report, and I always think about this case, Professor, uh, what's his name, Nzaro, I think it was Professor Nzaro. You know, they published a case of an Asian gentleman, 1964, who had had uh, cryptococcal meningitis. Came to Malago, diagnosis couldn't be made. Uh, they flew him to the UK and they made the diagnosis. And he was treated with a drug which is not available widely in Africa up to now. And yet we have all these patients with cryptococcal meningitis. So, so that's, uh, yeah, I think just avoiding, remaining HIV free, I think is a broad, uh, broad answer to that question. Uh, of course, there are people who have uh, other, you know, problems that lead to them depending on drugs you know, for example, people who have had kidney transplants, but I think they're usually put on prophylaxis, uh, at least in the US, I think that's what they do. And, you know, yeah, you're, they usually advise that you limit your um, environmental exposure, you know, to gardens and places like that. Uh, Professor, you can point to lead presentation. I think that that's a huge problem. If we come back to, I'll sort of take that together with uh, Dr. Stephen Okoboy's uh, question around the sustainability of, um, of community engagement. And I, I think it, it can't, it has to be broader than just cryptococcal disease, as it were. And one has to sort of focus a little bit on advanced HIV disease, because I think those are the patients who, who, need, to, uh, who, who need to be targeted. The, I think one of the things that we have tried is certainly incorporating, I mean, first of all, you hope that you will have a long, uh, sustained period of research funding. I think that's the, that's the basis that you need. And then within, within that have components of this community engagement. Because, I, I mean, it does cost money, you know, to either send people out there or go to, on the airwaves. It, it does cost money. And the question is where that money is coming from. I think the easiest thing I would assume is that you incorporate, we all incorporate, we are all doing, looking at different diseases. But I think incorporating community engagement as part of those, uh, part of the research I think is, is really important. As I've mentioned, the, I think for us, the, the advantage has also been that if we go out there, then people will send us patients who will be part of our, participants. So, so we sort of view that as something that we will continually be doing. Uh, they, I've spoken before 
about uh, messaging around advanced HIV disease. You know, those of you who are here way, 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 way back, you know, billboards used to have messaging around, have you tested ABC? Yeah, exactly. But, but I, I keep challenging the people at the Ministry of Health, why don't we have billboards around advanced HIV disease? Do people, you know, do people understand what that is? And, and of course the social, civil society says we are sugarcoating uh, HIV, we are sugarcoating AIDS by calling it advanced HIV disease, and we are contributing to the stigma. I, I don't know, but I, yeah. That's, that's something that we, I think messaging needs to improve. In terms of, uh, you know, the principal asked about uh, one, the One Health approach. The, the interesting thing is that the studies that we have done around um, environmental sampling have yielded almost nothing. I, I know that, at least that's for Uganda. The studies in Malawi, I think, suggested that, Botswana and Malawi suggested that eucalyptus trees had carried cryptococcus neoformans. And I know the studies from the US suggested, you know, uh, pigeons, right? Uh, but I'd, for some reason, we, we haven't really found a concrete, the concrete evidence of where do you find uh, crypto. But having said that, I think it's important that we incorporate the One Health approach in, in terms of advanced HIV disease broadly. And whether that's thinking about things like toxoplasmosis, for which we see some of the patients that, that, that come to, to the hospital. I, I agree that we need to think about how to um, develop that. For Dr. Francis, uh, IPs, I think that remains a huge, huge complicated area. We, we still live in the, I think in a phase of development, especially around Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are not yet developing the technologies, right? Te developing the point of care tests, for example. So we are st I think we are still at the place where we work with partners to validate what they have developed. We all hope that we will move to the next stage, right, of developing our own, primarily developing our own diagnostics. And I think that's when you can start talking about intellectual property rights. So, yeah, our economies need to grow. If we are not internally funding research, I'm not sure how we are going to talk about intellectual property rights. Uh, yeah, so, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a huge area that we obviously need to work towards becoming. Um, and you're in the right space for doing some of those things. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Were there some online, sorry. Were there some online questions? Yeah. The first is from Andrew Maluki um, to Prof Mayer. How have you been able to mentor your team via career enhancement in your project? Grateful for the empowerment you have shown. Also, simple answer to that. I think we demand. So our team demands that if you're, if you're part of the team as a medical officer, you must have a sub-project you're doing. You can't sort of just, you know, come in to work every day and just see patients. You need to think about a research question and we, we don't hoard data and say, oh, this is data for people who are at a certain level to use. We, the data we collect is free. We have two, I think some of the trials that we've completed that date, the databases are already available in the public domain. Some students have used them uh, as well, the COT trial and I think the ASTRO trial. So I, I think in some ways we, um, yeah, we just try to make sure that there's engagement by, by everyone. We've had, of the 150 papers I mentioned, I think s between seven and 10 of those papers have been published, first authored by nurses. I know some groups think, oh, there's only a certain card of people who should publish, but, but we've made this really open. And I, I think that's part of the reason that, um, well, I say we've been productive, but of course it's you to judge. But, but I think, you know, we wouldn't have published as much if people were not personally 
owning something, however small, within the, the larger uh, project as well. Was there Great. a second? And then, yeah, final question online from Collins and Kunda. Thanks, Prof, for the presentation. How do you see the trajectory of crypto screening in the face of long-acting ART? Um, doesn't say whether that's treatment or prevention, but um, yeah, how often should one screen for crypto and could long-acting ART contribute to late presentation? Late presentation. I, I, I'm, I'm going to rephrase his question for him. <laughs> I, I think he brings up a good point about long-acting ART. Not in the context of, I think the way I view it is that it will be helpful for preventing, I think, many opportunistic infections, not just, uh, not just cryptococcal disease. I think if people are, I mean, if you look at the current data now, the prevalence of cryptococcal antigenemia among people who are not suppressed is 4%. That's already way above the prevalence you need in order to have a cost-effective crack screening program. Meaning that for you to have, you require a prevalence, I think, of about 0.3%, 0 0.3 to 1% crack prevalence in order for your crack screening program to be cost-effective. So if you have people who are on long-acting ART, and are uh, virologically suppressed, <coughs> it essentially means that you will have fewer people becoming virologically unsuppressed, if you want, and therefore being at risk of having opportunistic infections. So if there's any reason why we should pursue long-acting ART, I think it's precisely for this reason. It will eventually be more cost-effective for programs. Even if it starts out as being expensive now, I think you will have fewer people coming in with uh, OIs, and that includes your TB and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so something to pursue. I, I know he, he sort of, he, he asked the question in a different way, but I, just my thoughts on long-acting ART. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Professor Mayer, for that very exciting presentation on cryptococcal meningitis and TB meningitis. Right now, we are moving into the very exciting waters on um, HIV prevention. And this is going to be done by um, Dr. Timothy Mwonge, who is a public health specialist and the head of programs at IDI Kasangati. He's a member of the Uganda National HIV Prevention Working Group at the Ministry of Health. And over the past 12 years, Dr. Mwonge has worked closely with a team of researchers at the International Clinical Research Center at the University of Washington and Harvard Medical School on a number of HIV prevention trials and has co-authored over 18 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He's currently working on HIV care and prevention studies among key and vulnerable populations, including refugees. So you're welcome, Dr. Timothy. Thank you very much for uh, that uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, chroni the chronicles of uh, uh, HIV prevention research, and uh, this is a history of uh, work that has been done uh, before. Um, sorry. Uh, in 2003, uh, some of these statements were unheard of, uh, looking at several different couples. Uh, having uh, testing for HIV uh, was leading more to separation uh, between couples. Uh, but in 2023 now, we can uh, see uh, on this, in this picture a quote uh, from a woman in South Africa saying, my husband knows I'm HIV positive and we're still together. And this uh, comes uh, up with uh, work that has been done over the period of time. Uh, the genesis of HIV prevention research in uh, IDI uh, started in 2003 when uh, Professor Connie Kellam and uh, a team of researchers, uh, Professor Eli Katavira and Alan Ronald uh, and others, uh, came together and started up this consortium to do uh, uh, a, 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 a trial among uh, several different couples to look at uh, herpes simplex virus uh, uh, among uh, discordant couples. 
and this uh, looked at uh, 2,205 uh, people that were enrolled and followed up uh, over a period of 24 months. And IDI was one of the, uh, was the highest enrolling site uh, over the uh, 14 sites in Eastern and Southern Africa. So the partners uh, HSV study, transmission study, uh, got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, information, looking at a drug that could boost war against the HIV pandemic. And, and this uh, news came up uh, that TAPI's medication uh, did not reduce the risk of HIV transmission from individuals uh, within HIV uh, and those that had uh, uh, genital herpes, but demonstrated uh, modest reduction in disease progression. And uh, a cyclover was used uh, in, uh, this, in this trial. So some of the publications that uh, uh, impacted or led us to uh, the other, the next steps, I'll be talking more about that in the subsequent slides, uh, looking at a, cy a cyclover and transmission of HIV from persons who are infected with uh, HIV and HSV2. Uh, and this, uh, from the uh, uh, previous, study, previous slide, uh, looking at daily acyclover and then decrease of herpes simplex uh, among uh, these uh, couples was not, uh, was not, uh, was not so uh, significant. So this led to uh, more, uh, more publications looking at heterosexual transmission after initiation of uh, antiretroviral therapy, and those were still in the cohort, uh, in the cohort uh, trials. So I'm highlighting a few of uh, these papers, uh, but however, this slide is very busy, but uh, I picked out uh, a few papers that I highlighted in uh, the previous studies, and all these were from uh, the partners' uh, happy simplex uh, uh, study. From here, uh, we went uh, to the partners' PrEP study, and this was a huge uh, trial looking at 4,700 uh, several different couples in Uganda, Kenya, and uh, uh, we enrolled, uh, this was 2008 2012, we enrolled 582 several different uh, couples in, uh, in, 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 in Uganda. And uh, this was, the design is um, randomizing uh, participants to Tenofova alone, uh, FTC and uh, TDF, which, is, which was uh, Truvada and placebo. But along the way, uh, as DMC uh, met, uh, the placebo arm was removed, then we proceeded with the FTC and and, and TDF. The primary endpoint was infection of HIV uh, in the negative partner, and the co primary uh, uh, endpoint was safety. On uh, July 16, 2012, uh, there was this uh, groundbreaking uh, news on the CNN, which uh, uh, was FDA approval of uh, Truvada uh, as a drug that uh, prevented uh, HIV infection. And this came from uh, the work that had been done uh, in this population. And uh, when you look at that paper at the uh, top right, uh, looking at antiretroviral prophylaxis for HIV uh, prevention, and this was near elimination of uh, HIV transmission within uh, several different uh, couples. And then uh, subsequently, uh, uh, we looked at uh, the detection of uh, uh, RNA, uh, HIV RNA, in uh, seminal uh, fluids. But uh, this also came up, uh, other things that came up were adherence. And Jessica Haberil uh, led a team that looked at adherence of PrEP uh, among uh, this uh, sub cohort. So um, there were other quotations, like I had mentioned uh, in the previous slides about uh, TDF alone, then TDF FTC, uh, which, was, uh, which was better. So uh, there are other uh, 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 quotations that came up about which uh, would be better. And then uh, what was uh, taken up was uh, TDF, FTC, uh, Tuvada. However, uh, during the trial, as we're doing safety, we were doing um, uh, screening for renal, uh, renal uh, function. And this was done every three months. Kenneth Mugwanya led uh, a paper looking at glomerular filtration uh, function among uninfected, uh, uninfected men and women, and this also uh, impacted on change in policy, and now we are doing uh, creatinine, uh, creatinine testing every six months and then annually as, uh, as we move uh, forward. Then the other was about pregnancy. Uh, was this, this safe during, uh, for women that are uh, intending to get pregnant? Is it safe during pregnancy? Is it safe in breastfeeding? And uh, when you look at a paper on the uh, top right side, 
uh, led by Nelly Mugo, and, and this was uh, looking at the outcomes, and this was safe. Uh, Andrew Mujujira uh, looked at uh, ART initiations, uh, not associated with the risk behavior among heterosexual uh, women, among people that had virus that um, uh, had just started uh, ART initiation. And this uh, led us to a uh, subsequent uh, study that I'll mention shortly. But the, this is a summary, again, a clog over the previous slides that I had mentioned, the publications that came out of, of that. So the paper that I talked about uh, for Andrew Mujujira, the, uh, the, the led by Andrew Mujujira, is um, was looking at ART uh, as uh, ART during the period when a, a person had just initiated ART. So there is that gap of about six months. So we went into the partners demonstration study, and this was done in Uganda and Kenya, and looking at PrEP as a bridge for ART, and uh, this. Is, is looking at those six months before we have viral load suppression. And this was evaluating scalable model for delivering both PrEP and ART. Uh, and we uh, looked at, uh, this was 2012 to 2016, and the IDI team enrolled 292 several different couples and followed up this for uh, two years. And we observed um, uh, four infections uh, among uh, these populations. And, and this was uh, 0 0.2 per 100 uh, person years which uh, was uh, scaled up. And these are the, some of the uh, publications from uh, the partners demonstration study. And uh, I'll just summarize as a summarize in the previous talk. We noticed that um, most of the work that was being done as quantitative uh, data collection needed to be supplemented with uh, qualitative, uh, qualitative work. And, and we see that um, this was uh, uh, a, good, a good booster of butter on the bread to uh, add on to the data that was uh, being uh, collected. Uh, for example, understanding uh, PrEP acceptability among priority populations, and this was done uh, among a study that was done among, uh, among uh, potential PrEP users before uh, Uganda national guidelines had endorsed use of, um, use of PrEP, but uh, we had uh, FDA and WHO uh, approval, so the guidelines were still in place, and they uh, were still not yet in place. And then how pregnant women living with HIV and their male partners, this is work that was done uh, in, uh, in Chitevi Health Center for, and uh, also looks at a qualitative analysis of HIV self-testing and, cell, uh, and secondary distribution processes in Uganda. Yeah, so that, that's the qualitative team, part of the qualitative team uh, at uh, IDI Kasangati, and, and we are looking at expounding on uh, the perceptions and details of, of research, and, and these are some of the uh, publications that I had indicated uh, also in the previous, previous slide. So this, uh, this was a summary of the HSV study, the Partners Prep study, and Partners Demonstration study, and, and these have impacted on um, uh, policy change uh, in country. And we've also done some, uh, uh, I know the previous speakers talked about first author papers that are led by, uh, by, by the uh, institute. And, and we've done uh, some work on um, uh, healthcare worker perspectives and uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this has uh, impacted on uh, training of healthcare workers, routine training of healthcare workers in Uganda and Kenya and then adherence of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis among female uh, sex workers. Uh, this was looking at diverse models of uh, PrEP delivery, and then also looking at uh, work that has been led by uh, Andrew Jujira, uh, looking at m uh, other uh, transgender stigma within trans uh, stigma uh, and sexually transmitted infections of trans men in Uganda, and HIV self-testing, as well as the effic effec effectiveness of testing uh, uh, testing on PrEP adherence among the gender diverse uh, sex workers in Uganda. So this is a, a summary of a, a graph of uh, the work that has been done over time. And uh, currently, and looking into the future, or inspiring into the future, and what we are doing now, uh, we are looking at um, the target populations, male partners of pregnant women with HIV, and, and we are doing uh, 
uh, work in Chitebi Health Center for adolescent girls and young women, male partners of young women, HIV, several different couples, sex workers, transgender people, people who use drugs, heterosexual men and women, and also uh, looking at the refugee populations. Then uh, the inspiration to uh, move ahead is, is, is to go beyond what, uh, what has been done over the uh, past 20 years. And, and looking at broadly neutralizing antibodies for uh, HIV prevention, looking at uh, methods of delivery of uh, prevention services to include, uh, to include uh, community pharmacies, to include peer-led uh, peer uh, delivery of, um, of, of, of PrEP. And, and, and this is uh, uh, also uh, working in collaboration with uh, the Ministry of Health to uh, kind of look into that direction. We're also looking at a, a newer population in, in our realm, which, is, uh, which are people who, use, uh, people who use drugs, and there's a subset of people who inject with the drugs, and, and looking at, uh, at longer-acting uh, PrEP formulations, which uh, include uh, carbotegravir, long-acting carbotegravir, which is um, yet to, uh, to come onto the, the guidelines in Uganda. Uh, so this is uh, the, uh, those are the collaborators uh, that we're working, Uganda AIDS Commission, UNCST, National Drug Authority, KCCA, uh, University of Alabama, University of Washington, and the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital. And this is uh, part of the team uh, that is uh, doing uh, the prevention work. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. I think for the, for the Sorry. people online, for you may need to use, yeah, you may, yes. Even my sure. shouting <laughs> won't <laughs> Okay, um, thanks for um, uh, presenting this amazing um, um, amount of work. And in fact, all of the presentations today have been amazing and very inspiring. <laughs> um, I had a question about the tightening and the recent uh, tightening of the law against homosexuality that's happened this week and whether you think that this um, will be problematic for us in this kind of research, but also what our response to this as researchers in HIV um, should be. And I know that that's probably a slightly unfair question and it's a controversial question, um, but um, I think it's important for us to uh, think uh, through the implications of this week's yeah. bill passing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Yeah, can, I, can I go ahead and answer or take a break? Yeah. So uh, thank you, Rose, for that question. So the law against uh, the law, the bill that is uh, in Parliament this week. So when we are designing uh, these studies, we look at the uh, initially there was a discussion with the Uganda AIDS Commission, looking at the incidence. And, and the statistics of uh, HIV in these populations. And, and we realized that data was not readily available to uh, help us move uh, further to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to prevent uh, HIV in this population. However, anecdotal data uh, from the Crane Survey and, 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 and other uh, areas within the Ghana AIDS Commission data was showing there is a disease burden within this population. So how do we get in to uh, reduce this uh, disease, uh, disease burden is by uh, working closely with the Ministry of Health, which has uh, policy guidelines on care and treatment for all Ugandans, regardless of, uh, of, of, of what uh, they, uh, regardless of uh, whatever they uh, associate with, uh, and looking at um, uh, HIV um, uh, prevention research. So what we're trying to do is uh, bring out this information, do the research and, and, and look at the disease burden and also look at ways of uh, preventing HIV transmission within, uh, within this population. So we go ahead and get uh, IRB approval, then we go ahead and get uh, 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 Ministry of Health endorsement uh, when we're doing the grant applications, but also uh, go ahead and get uh, UNCST approval, which is under the President's office to conduct this, uh, conduct this research. So in a way, we are looking at, um, at ways of reducing the disease burden within this population. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Timothy. It's a 
really fascinating presentation and an incredible amount of really productive work. I think Kabatekvir, perhaps truly one of the most incredible public health breakthroughs of the last decade, and I'm sure will have a big impact on preventing many, many HIV infections in future. Um, I wanted just to ask you about the sort of implementation in terms of maximizing impact. You know, there's one end of the spectrum where it can be quite medicalized, where you have a file and you have to go to a clinic and you have to have HIV testing every number of months. Or there's the other end, which is really demedicalizing it and putting it out in communities and pharmacies and really making it very accessible with minimal barriers. Um, just keen to get your thoughts on what you think is going to be the best approach. Thank you very much uh, for that question. So uh, yesterday at the executive breakfast, the CDC director talked about, uh, uh, the CDC national, uh, the country director, talked about uh, services being offered in the community, including uh, pharmacy delivery of uh, ART. And we're doing uh, a study on pharmacy delivery of, 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 of PrEP among adolescent girls and young women, and this is formative work, but all, uh, to try and uh, put the services closer to the community. But we're also looking at uh, peer-led uh, HIV prevention services delivery, and this includes all the services there are for uh, HIV prevention. And the peer-led is uh, training the peers uh, to uh, be able to uh, offer HIV self-testing kits to uh, the clients that are receiving HIV prevention services, as well as offering them refills for, uh, for their PrEP. And this is for the oral PrEP. So moving uh, away from that to the injectable, uh, injectable formulations, uh, I know that uh, uh, this is, is still being discussed at national level on uh, uh, giving, offering these services uh, in the community. But for the start, uh, it will be at the medical facilities, and then uh, pilots will be done uh, to uh, offer these services within uh, the communities. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. I actually had a small question oh, for you. Go ahead. It was you know, more related to what Dr. Rosalind said. And this is concerning the safety of your participants you know, after the bill that was passed yesterday and the wide range of emotions surrounding this topic, how do you ensure continuity, you know, of your studies that deal with this population, the safety of the participants, the safety of the staff? Because I know there's a lot in the communities that surround Kasangati. It has already been yeah. highlighted as a place where these people get treatment. How, how, how will you go about that? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. We are in discussions and we'll go back to uh, the bodies that gave us approval to uh, do this and then have a discussion with the peers in these communities to uh, find safe ways of delivering uh, HIV prevention. Uh, we're doing HIV prevention research, but also hearing back from, uh, for example, the national coordinator for uh, key populations has uh, worked closely with us in, in, in terms of um, service delivery. So we'll go back and have uh, that dialogue to come up with the uh, ideas and avenues of ensuring uh, safety. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Timothy. We haven't seen any questions online as of yet. If any come up, we shall let you know. Um, now I will go ahead and um, invite Dr. Stella Zawede Muyanja who is going to talk to us about um, implementation research. Dr. Stella is a research scientist with interest in implementation science. Her work is focused on using implementation research to improve delivery of TB care services in Uganda. She currently works with IDI as a senior operations research advisor to IDI's USAID healthcare improvement projects in Karamoja and Kampala. In this role, she provides technical support for the development and conduct of various implementation research studies. She has also been PI and co-PI on various research studies within IDI. Dr. Stella, you're welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I present this uh, on behalf of uh, myself, uh, the 
the TB Implementation Research Program, and also the IDI HIV Implementation Research Program that's housed under the Health System Strengthening Department. Okay, so, um, so just a brief intro. Um, in implementation science is the study of methods to promote the translation of research evidence uh, into routine practice. And the aim is to improve quality and effectiveness of healthcare services. And uh, we can use implementation science methods uh, before, uh, during, or after implementation. Uh, really, uh, before implementation, we use um, implementation science strategies to guide choice, the choice of implementation methods. Um, during implementation, we can uh, use it to understand what influences implementation outcomes. And afterwards, we can use it to evaluate um, our implementation and, and see how well we did. Um, so for implementation research, context matters. Uh, and this accounts for much of the difference between efficacy that we see in clinical trials and the effectiveness that we see in, in actual uh, life implementation. And we often use uh, a multidisciplinary approach um, with lots of, of frameworks and lots of ev uh, framework evaluations, and we focus on health systems um, rather than the individual. Uh, so implementation science is uh, a bit nascent, so it's relatively new um, and emerging field. The first dedicated journal uh, was in 20, 2006. Uh, implementation science, but since then there's been a rapid growth of implementation research work, particularly in low and middle income countries. Sorry, this is not moving. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's moved a bit too fast. So at the IDA, um, so like I said, implementation science is, is relatively new. So even at the IDI, we will not be talking about 20 years. We'll be talking about more the last 10 or so years. And most of this time has been dedicated to capacity building for implementation research in partnership with universities like uh, UCSF, Makere University, and Johns Hopkins University. Um, and during that time, we've also gotten some work done. So in 2018, we had our first ever program evaluation protocol that was approved by the IRB and, and um, encompassed all the work done in Kampala and Wachiso and the West Nile. And that uh, evaluation protocol is under the Health System Strengthening Department. And there have been a number of evaluations and and uh, manuscripts written out of it. And then in 2019, uh, uh, supported by USID, we also had a project evaluation protocol for the Defeat TB project, which was an above site mechanism supporting the NTLP. And we also supported uh, national evaluations and feasibility studies, and uh, also had came up with a couple of publications. Um, we took this, um, these uh, lessons learned and, and, and methods um, onto the Pact Karamoja project, which started in 2020, and also the LPHS project still housed under the HSS department. And in between there, we've had some funding from TB Reach uh, to do some work. So I, I will present to you in the next slides uh, a few selected program evaluations, pilot studies, and research studies that have informed um, guidelines and programming uh, in the country. Yeah, so um, the first one is from the Health System Strengthening Department, um, advancing evidence-based practice, um, the rollout of recency testing. And uh, this comes from the evidence that um, undetectable is untransmissible. So we know that uh, the transmission that we see is probably coming from people who are untreated. And, uh, and therefore fueling ongoing infections. So the HSS department has uh, went out to use recency testing to, to identify clusters of recent and ongoing transmission in order to target um, prevention and um, 
at linkage efforts in these communities. And uh, from 2020 to 2021, um, uh, they had over 12,000 people who are newly diagnosed with HIV and tested uh, 7,000 of these with recency testing and 11% of these had a recent HIV infection. In the greater Nebi region, um, it was still recency inf recent infections were about 10%. 70% um, of all recent infections are, are women, but we see that unlike Kampala where recent infections are clustered uh, among the younger, the younger adults. Uh, in the upcountry settings, it's uh, adults over 50. And uh, this has um, led to, and, and then they mapped the hotspots for these uh, recent infections, and then focused HIV prevention and linkage efforts to these places. Um, uh, then we had um, enhancing patient-centered care, and uh, this was uh, uh, done um, within the research department where we were supported by the WHO Stop TB partnership to train um, healthcare providers. So the evidence here uh, that we had was that uh, visit to private healthcare providers results in diagnostic delay and that 50% of all TB patients will first visit a private health provider before they come to the public facilities. So we needed to translate that evidence now um, into programming. So we, we trained um, the private healthcare providers, linked them to the national specimen referral system. We had phone-based results uh, dispatch and financial incentives for linkage to treatment. And um, in those two years, in the five districts, we had um, about 800 patients diagnosed with TB, and we had 92% linkage to treatment. Um, however, when we, uh, we, we analyzed the effect on, on delay to, to treatment, we found that there was no difference in uh, time between uh, symptom onset and TB diagnosis between uh, people who visited the private health facilities and the public health facilities. Um, and we don't know that this was because we intervened in the private health facilities, so that diagnostic delay um, sort of um, disappeared. But anyway, our conclusion was that it's possible to train and support private providers to engage in TB care, and these projects informed the current uh, Global Fund application for 2023. Um, then we also had uh, the improving linkage to treatment uh, still which was under the research department and the, the evidence there was that we know that timely linkage to treatment results in better outcomes but we had at that time almost a quarter of our patients not linking to treatment and we needed uh, patient-centered interventions to improve linkage to treatment. So we did a three-part study that had descriptive, formative and pilot implementation um, where we analyzed uh, facility data to describe the magnitude of loss to follow up and did formative studies using the COMBI model to describe these barriers. And then we did intervention development and piloting and we had a 30% improve, improvement in linkage to care. So this, uh, this study uh, brought to light uh, the problem of initial loss to follow up. Um, it started being discussed at the national level and it, it's very important in light of the new uh, treatment outcome definitions by WHO that, I, that Im include initial loss to follow up um, in the group that have uh, <laughs> loss to follow up. <laughs> so <laughs> then we also had another study uh, for um, uh, enhancing patient-centered care for patients with multi-drug resistant TB. Um, so we knew that um, community-based care resulted in better outcomes than health facility-based care, but we were still doing health facility-based care for MDRTB. Um, then we got oral treatment regimens, and we realized that, yes, now this is a possibility to translate this uh, research into practice. So we, we also did a three-part uh, formative st study, a three-part study that had a formative study, um, a pilot implementation, and currently the cost analysis is going on. We conducted a discrete choice experiment uh, among MDRTB patients to ascertain their choices for what would be an ideal model for community-based care. And then we did um, a quasi-experimental pre-post study 
to pilot that model. And it resulted in a 12% increase in treatment success. And we, we showed that it was possible to deliver um, uh, treatment for MDRTB in the community. Um, and then uh, for addressing health disparities, this is work from uh, the Health System Strengthening Department. Uh, there's been use of medical assistant, assisted therapy, um, use of opioid agon agonists um, to support uh, people who are um, addicted to drugs. And the objectives are to reduce mortality and morbidity among these patients and prevent transmission of HIV. Uh, this project is ongoing at uh, Butabika Hospital and uh, they've, they've enrolled um, over 400 patients and they've been able to uh, um, integrate them back into their families. They've also um, done different models of care like peer-led uh, uh, and DS DSDM, uh, that's differentiated service delivery programming uh, for medical medically assisted therapy and also introduced uh, PrEP services. So the challenges here of course are retention um, a, a number of patients get lost to follow up. Um, then also in promoting integrated care delivery, still this is work from HSS, um, we knew, we know that integrated care, at least from TBHIV integrated care, improves patient outcomes. But we also know that we are now faced with a situation where uh, improved art care, we have improved art care, we have an aging population and a rise in um, non-communicable diseases. So we need integrated management. So um, the, the HSS department piloted um, a baseline assessment uh, of NCD care at, at 72 facilities, and then they um, trained people and created data systems to enhance screening, diagnosis, and treatment of, of, multi of other mob comorbidities among patients with HIV. And um, here the main findings were that uh, the, there's quite, uh, there's a preva prevalence, sorry, of uh, quite a number of patients have um, comorbidities and they are poorly controlled uh, because of lack of integrated care. So um, this pilot study showed that um, NCD integration was possible and informed uh, the Ministry of Health guidelines on, inter on integrating NCD care with HIV care. Um, so then um, guiding adoption of digital interventions, we've, uh, we, the evidence here that we knew was that chest x-ray screening was more sensitive than the WHO symptom screen. And um, we, uh, now that we had um, uh, digit, digital chest x-rays and computer-aided diagnosis, uh, we, we, we needed to have um, a threshold score that was customized for our population. Um, so we did a, a study in Kitgum and uh, Gulu hospitals, um, widening the symptom screen to cough of any duration for all people, um, and then uh, having those people have an, um, an HIV, everyone having an HIV test if your HIV status was unknown, and having um, a chest x-ray and a gene expert. And we calculated the sensitivity and specificity of different threshold scores. Uh, what we found was the currently used threshold scores in country, which are in red, uh, have much lower sensitivity. And so we have, um, we have um, suggested uh, other threshold scores um, to the NTLP, and we've uh, suggested that we need to reconsider the threshold scores that we're using with our CAD. Um, yes, and this is the last one. So uh, also we've, um, this is work from HSS. Um, innovative HIV case identification strategies using assisted partner notifications and uh, social network strategies, uh, which have improved uh, the yield of HIV testing and also um, reached out to, to the men. And so those are the last 10 years. Um, what do the next 20 years hold in store? So there's going to be um, an increased demand uh, for to, to, to have to develop and test strategies to effectively implement um, evidence-based interventions. And this is across all program areas, across all diseases. Implementation science is going to become part and parcel of how we do things. Um, we are moving from clinical trials. Um, after clinical trials, uh, most uh, people are doing pragmatic trials. 
Um, for diagnostic tests, we are interested in accuracy, yes, but we are also interested in diagnostic yield in real-life populations. So there's going to be a lot of um, interest and a lot of focus on, on things like this. There's also a lot of interest now in our programs like um, HSS and the TB programs to reduce health disparities, uh, to develop strategies that improve access among vulnerable and underserved population, um, the increased use of formative studies and implementation science frameworks to make sure that our care uh, arrives at the last mile. Uh, we, are in, we are in a phase where we are adopting all sorts of digital interventions and we will need to develop strategies um, that address uh, the barriers to adoption for different populations. Um, then uh, patient-centered care has been front and center the last uh, 10 or so years, and it will continue to be. And we will continue to be required to identify patients' unique needs and preferences and to formulate inf implementation strategies that align to these needs. Uh, program evaluation is getting more rigorous. Uh, it's including uh, quality of care assessment, it's including um, uh, barriers and facilitators to in intervention uptake, and it's also beginning to demand that we, we say what will be the prerequisites for maintenance of these programs. And then integrated patient care is something that's not going away. We have aging populations, multimorbidity, and uh, the development and validation of tools for integrated care and evidence on, of how well these, tool work, these tools work in different populations will continue to be uh, front and center. Um, so all in all, I think implementation science is young, still growing, a lot of potential, and the next 20 years have a lot in store for us. Uh, our acknowledgments to all our partners and um, to the Ministry of Health, the district local governments where HSS works, and the health facility staff and the patients. Thank you. The floor is open for questions. Thank you very much for that great work you're doing in implementation science. Um, well, my question to you is about big data, which is a very big tool for, for you. How are you planning to utilize this in, in your next phase? Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very informative presentation. My observation is on integration. Uh, there's a lot of benefits on integration of service delivery. The example, the study which you did, NCDs and HIV care, uh, integrating their uh, service delivery. At the practical level, we find that in most of our health facilities, especially at uh, health center level four and below, they are poorly staffed. In some of them, you, f you find one health worker, a lone health worker uh, doing the work with the long lines. So what is your recommendation on how to do this very beneficial, you know, integrated approach vis-a-vis -vis poorly uh, staffed, you know, uh, health facility? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really interesting um, presentation. And I think it's such a, an important area of science and a really rapidly growing area. I wanted to ask about how you're going to sort of pull more people and train more people in the field of implementation science. Are, are there good courses available in Uganda? Is it something that Macquarie are looking at um, in terms of really trying to um, yeah, increase kind of capacity in this field or is most of the training currently um, external? Because I think, yeah, expanding the training within Uganda would be really beneficial if, if, if that's um, on the 
on people's agenda. Okay, so, so thank you. So I think before you can, so, so, mine is on, you talked about implement, I know you're doing implement science on TV. And from your slides, you, you hinted that you want to roll it across the research program. And I will cite for example, Professor David's mayor, most of his trials are clinical trials and they have influence policy. And Rav, I think where I stop is where you might actually start from. Because if a policy, so what strategies are you having in place to bring the entire different, you, know, you saw the research organogram, there are so many themes. How are you, what strategies have you put in place to make sure that we implement the science across the cascade? The second one you talked of was a discrete choice experiment. What were the choices? And which one was the most preferred and why? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so can I take this? Can I, can I just uh, okay. add? Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, for your presentation. Mine is to you and other researchers in the room. We, we, we kind of do, I want to pick your brain on uh, how we can move research to policy and, and reducing that time span uh, and, and also uh, post-research care for uh, our participants. We see that uh, when we do research, and then after the research, uh, we kind of uh, lag back. Uh, say, if we're doing a clinical trial of, uh, of a drug, we're mandated to uh, offer this drug to uh, participants post-research. Uh, but then uh, the question mainly is uh, to pick your brain and other research. I know there are other uh, uh, many uh, ideas, but just to, for us to think through how we can reduce this time between uh, having groundbreaking uh, research results and putting this into policy. Thank you. I guess I'm Stella, nice job. I, I always appreciate the way you think through your presentations. It was very well presented. Um, mine is a question about the difference between the studies where you're able to make a change. So we've been talking forever about why the lab register and the clinical register aren't linked. And so I, I was disruptively clapping because you came up with a way to have a metric that people would be judged by in order to accomplish that linkage so that we could have fewer loss to follow up after a positive diagnosis. But why in that study can you do that? And then in others, we don't manage to go that last bit so that it becomes part of the real policy that will make a difference. Not just that it's written down in a guideline, but there's a metric by which people are judged so that that thing will happen. Um, all right, thank you for your questions. Um, so I'll take them in order. So the first question was Prof. Damali about uh, big data. So yes, big data is something we are looking at. Um, there's a lot of data that has been generated through especially our outreach programs um, that is mostly unused and unanalyzed. And um, we really uh, need to partner with uh, the people who know how to you know, manipulate and analyze uh, big data in order for us to, to, to move forward and inform policy. So that is something that's going to be, that was missed in my presentation, but will be a very big focus in the coming years. Um, then there was a, a, someone who asked about uh, integration of N HIV and NCDs. Um, so the solution to poorly staffed health facilities is another implementation science mechanism, which is differentiated service delivery. So keeping people who don't need to see a healthcare worker every day out, you know, and focusing the healthcare workers' limited time and effort on those who are very, very sick. So if we can promote um, patient-centered care and self-management, and also community-based management, then we can reserve the health care workers' effort for those who really need it. Um, yes, then um, someone asked, what is our plan to pull more people, to train more people? So this is what <laughs> Joanita and I were having a discussion about just before uh, I came here. So yes, we do need to expand implementation research into all the programs. So. We do, what we need is uh, four core people seated in all those programs, you know, so we need a Nelson and a Stella everywhere, you know, so that we can, you know, like in every program, every program needs to have a Nelson equivalent or a Stella equivalent so that we can um, push the agenda of implementation research in all our programs. So we need to train more, uh, certainly. Um, there are some opportunities for training within Makere University, but we also need to have opportunities for training within 
uh, the IDI so that we can have some homegrown talent uh, that we then, you know, have placed in all these uh, program areas. Um, then, uh, Stephen, would you like to see me later about the discrete choice experiment? <laughs> because, yes, we had three, three choices and three levels for each choice. So, yeah. So, um, I I'll let you know. Um, and then there's a question about uh, research to policy. Um, so, there are different ways to do this, but I think the most effective way is to have the policy makers uh, really integrated into these research projects right at the beginning to, to n for them to know about these projects, for us to keep updating them, and for us to be part of these bodies where evidence is synthesized. So if um, we should be sitting on the NCC, for example, for TB, we should be, um, when they call for a global fund concept writing workshop, we should be there. We should, because these, these are the points at which what everybody knows is synthesized and then, you know, put into these big funding applications that then see that that model or that treatment or that gets rolled out. So um, I know IDEA is already represented on more than, you know, 12 uh, policy bodies, but we need to really be actively engaged with the policy makers because, um, Usually, uh, people will promote things that they are familiar with, that they understand really well, and they appreciate. And it takes time. It takes more than just one presentation to get someone to really understand and appreciate your work. Yes. So um, there was a question on post-research care. I think I'll throw that to the pro maybe Professor Mayer <laughs> or Dr. Yuka. <laughs> post-research care, yes. So, and so, just before you come in, uh, no, 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 I'm not. <laughs> yeah, so I was saying that I'm answering Dr. Yuka's question that I think the, pros that the difference between uh, the, the research studies that go into policy and the ones that don't is the difference in the level of engagement of policymakers. How early you engage them, how consistently you engage them. Yeah. So, so I was just going to say the, the Stellas and the Nelsons must start teaching, right? These focal persons. I, it's great to have a, a course that you do online or whatever from UCSF, but I think that some of the practical things can already start. The agres are here. So let's not think, oh, I can't do implementation science until I do this six month course at UCSF. I think there's already a lot of, um, you know, people that can, can, can help train that. And I, I just want to add that uh, for me, I think that we have to keep pushing the questions that are important for Uganda, that are important for this region, that we can't allow other people to set the agenda. I think the agenda has to be set by the people in this room and online and that work with this institute. Because sometimes I think that what's setting the agenda are not people who live, work, live and die here, right? So that's for me, and I think that that's been important to me since the day I stepped on the campus. I'm not answering the post-research thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, Timothy, that's a difficult question. I, I think it, it depends on the type of research that you're doing. I think if you're engaged in non-clinical trial research, maybe it makes it a little easier to just make sure that even the people who've been involved in the PrEP studies uh, anchored within uh, care programs where PrEP is offered, right? So, so that, that might be a little easy. If I, I guess there were, we've had a lot of studies here for drugs that were not yet available. That, I think that was always a debate, you know, what's going to happen when the study is complete? What's going to happen? I think the, I guess my response would be that the, there has to be a push from the people who are uh, engaged with the trials to just make sure that you're either talking to the company about post research availability, post trial availability of the drug. Uh, it might not be free, but maybe the advocacy to have the drug at a cheaper price. And I think that's, that's the question you're asking is an age old question. What happens? And, and yeah, especially in Africa, what do you do when the resources are not available and you, you've, you have this New England Journal 
publication that shows drug X is, is really good and efficacious, what happens to those guys who need that drug? But I think it's, it's wider advocacy on a, on a global scale, I think that needs to happen. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things which normally delays the translation of uh, research evidence to practice or policy is the other side of financial implication, the cost of the commodity. Uh, Professor Simon Kamo will vividly remember his contribution to implementation of uh, the crypt crypto treatment program in the country when uh, there was evidence that fluconazole can reduce you know, uh, uh, the initiation of uh, meningitis crypto. When uh, the alliance, academic alliance came on board, his group had a negotiation with the Pfizer for donation of Difulcan in this country. And they said to the ministry, we shall give you all the what? The drugs you need. And that made it possible. But before that, the ministry was registered and was saying, we don't have money in our budget. How can we implement the policy? But um, immediately that that negotiation went through, uh, then the implementation started, and up to now, Uganda has been doing well in treatment of crypto using the Diflocan program. So I'm just giving that as one example which can delay uh, the translation of evidence. Similarly, when there was evidence about uh, safe male circumcision, to translate it into policy, there was a very long you know, lag of time because of the discussion between Minister of Health and again the research group in the Rakai. Purely because we were saying, how are we going to finance you know, uh, this program? So let's also pay attention to the financial implication of the commodity uh, of the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. There's an online question from a satellite site in Karamoja. It's a comment, actually. It says, Dr. Stella, it is very clear that when the HSS and research departments work closely, we have a lot that can be done. We need to be very intentional to have these departments work closely. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all. There's, there's one more question. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zawete. Uh, just my question as regards the uh, implementation of research. Um, um, I'm just asking, is there, because uh, there's a lot of, uh, no, we have a lot of stakeholders, a, a number of stakeholders doing research. But then my, my, um, my pressing issue has always been, uh, can we have like, um, can we establish like a, uh, a central depo depository kit eh, where we can um, put all the data, uh, let's say on the side of the stakeholders. I want to give you an example. Most of the research is always bashed by government. Let's say if it is coming from the civil society, they always brand it as a, a secondary or non-tradition. So now as a, for effective uh, implementation of research going forward, can can we have like a, a central depository toolkit kind of something for for that? Is that possible? Anyone? Thank you. Um, so th thank you for your question. So we uh, research data is is difficult to have centralized um, because different research studies look at different things. But I think uh, we 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 do have. Um, national databases for care, for care and treatment, um, for for HIV, for TB, and and I think those are the the databases that ca that you can use for maybe secondary data analysis or 
or things like that. So, 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 so yes and no, yes, there are centralized databases for care and treatment, which can then be used um, f to answer research questions, uh, but separate research studies usually keep their data separately. Some more questions have come up online too. This will be the last talk before we break off for lunch. So there's one um, from Mote Walaban that says, what do you think about the implementation of strategies that have proven ineffective in the past? Is it something you're looking at in the next decade so that we have strategies that work not remaining in the lab or research papers? And I'll read the next one as well. Are we aware of people living with HIV who get diabetes due to the change in drugs? Now they are battling two issues impacting health greatly. What have we done about this rising trend? Um, okay, so uh, the first question, implementation and de-implementation. So yes, there's been some talk um, about uh, de-implementation. We, we, we um, emphasize the, like the uptake of interventions at work, but we don't normally emphasize the, like the stopping of interventions that have proved non-effective. So that is uh, something we, we need to look at um, in, in implementation research. Um, the question about um, HIV and, and uh, diabetes, I think that will be covered um, with, with the, the, the DTG, the work on that has been done by the research department on DTG. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stella. Thank you all. So we are going to break off for lunch now. We shall be reconvening at 2 for our online audience. Please come back at 2. And we shall reconvene with uh, more plenary presentations. But as it is now, the food is ready. We can go and enjoy ourselves. There are also exhibitions in the next room, so I'll encourage you to actually go and look at what the other departments are showing. Thank you. We, we are resuming our sessions. Uh, I know some of us are having, still having our lunch. But you know that we have a number of members virtually. So we'd actually be able to have them on board. Um, our next presentation uh, is supposed to be Rose. But I saw Rose here. And she's not. A Paul and Andrew, can you confirm whether Rose is going to present online or she's going to be back here? If not, we could actually give her a, a chance and jump to the next presentation. So as I wait for feedback, let me take the opportunity to thank my co-MC, who was driving us in the, the, the session that has been concluded. And we saw a lot, of, a lot of history in the last 20 years presented by different thematic areas. And it was evidence enough that we are producing high-impact scientific information. And we are able, able to reach high-impact journals, the New England Journal, and our results in press policy. But as Timothy raised one of the issues, how, they, uh, how, how do we really make sure that these policies are, these results, especially for trials that for pre, pre post, post, post trial access, how do we ensure? But Dr. Pio tried to give us an elaborate, elaborate response to that. I also want to thank the people, who have already, the scientists who have already presented, who accepted an invite, and for a number of delegates who are still within. So we should be able to, to start our. Uh, our next session, immediately last row steps in. But as she was waiting for, let me check. So this afternoon we have three plenary sessions. We have one by Professor Ochama on viral hepatitis and liver disease. 
a new, th a new thematic research within the institute, which is actually moving on well. We have from Dr. Guran Miriam on Kaposi Sakoma, and Rose is around, so we should go. I will introduce her, she settles down, and please, we can give, we can project our slides. So welcome back members online, on YouTube, and both, and both our web banner. I, I have the honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Rose. So Dr. Rose, is, she's a director, Academy for Health Innovation in Uganda, which is housed at the IDI. She's a medical doctor with an interest in innovation, research, and development. She's a PI on, on medical drone project, as well as evaluation of call for life interactive voice responses. Most of us have realized that call for life has been scaled up to different, different diseases, uh, more than HIV alone. She holds a, a joint appointment as a principal research associate in, clinical in a clinical school, Cambridge University, UK, and she's a chair, board of directors, Aga Khan Health Services, Uganda. Dr. Ross, you're most welcome to give us your talk on the power of point of care diagnostic for preventing infections, infectious diseases. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you um, so much. And um, the one the one bit that was relevant to this in my bio <laughs> um, was that I'm one of the team that leads the John Hopkins IDI point of care group for STIs, um, along with uh, fellow colleagues, some of whom are in the room, some of whom I think are online. So uh, Professor Yuka Manabi, who's here, who it's quite scary presenting in front of my boss on her, some of her slides. <laughs> um, Dr. Agnes Chiraga, who is around um, and is also one of our, our lead PIs on many of these studies. Um, but I have the privilege um, to, to go through um, right now. So is the clicker working? So I'm going to talk about point of care um, uh, tests in the context of infectious diseases and why they're important. So the reason why diagnostics um, are important, I think, has really come to light during the recent COVID pandemic. I think the whole world has realized how important testing for diseases are. Um, this commission, which includes um, many people from around the world, including our own um, ex-Africa um, CDC director, who's now running PEPFAR, suggests that half of the world do not have our access to diagnostic tests. And this then has an implication on many things, including um, universal health coverage, um, very much so on antimicrobial resistance and um, on uh, global health security. And we'll talk a bit, little bit about why um, that is as I go through the slides. If we are to ensure that um, we are getting uh, medication and treatment to people in the last mile setting, like in the rural um, places and hard to reach places, people in those areas need access to diagnosis so that they get the correct treatment. Um, and so it's very important that it's included uh, within that. And only when we have um, uh, uh, availability of diagnostics um, in a wider area will we be able to empower patients to make the correct decisions about treatment that they um, are going to need. And innovation without access is no innovation at all. Um, the academy team are going to be presenting their innovation slides um, tomorrow. But really, we cannot leave innovation in the hands of higher income countries and it not filter down to us. But more importantly, um, we should be in a position in Africa to be driving some of this innovation ourselves. So just on point of care tests, so the WHO has come up with um, a criteria called ASSURED, which um, explains what is important in a point of care test. So these need to be affordable, they need to be sensitive and specific, which means that they are accurate um, for people who require them. They need to be user-friendly, only um, minimum of three to four steps with minimum amounts of training. They need to be rapid. Um, they need to be enabling treatment when people first attend for care. So the whole point about a point of care test is you get treatment on the day um, that you get your test done. 
They shouldn't need refrigerated storage. They should be minimum um, equipment. And it should be easy to deliver these um, to end users. So our John Hopkins Point of Care Center is part of this larger Center for Innovative Diagnostics for Infectious Diseases uh, led by Professor Yuka. In the middle of this is our administrative core, which looks after the grant applications and the biorepository. And we'll see how the biorepository is created. There is a preclinical and development core based at Hopkins. And what this does is works with uh, diagnostic companies, systems engineering, to understand what is happening in the world of diagnostics and um, to start to engage with companies. There is um, a technology and a training core, which does needs assessment, works um, with clinicians, focus groups, uh, patients, all the way up to CDC STD directors to understand the needs um, for um, point of care and the needs assessments for point of care. We are part of the clinical and translation core, which includes work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which whilst it's in the US, it still seems to be very resource limited. It has more similarities with our young adults clinic than, than I you know, like to think about. It's, it's, it's limited resources, very high throughput clinic, lots and lots of burden of disease there. But also in Hopkins, there's an online um, uh, availability of STI kits, and then there's um, uh, testing within emergency departments. So we run a little site um, within this larger um, administrative core, and our samples also um, do go into the biorepository, which collects samples from all of these different settings. So... I kind of just mentioned this, but really this is the pipeline of how these point of tests are developed and supported through the center at Hopkins. So it starts with the scientific innovation and proof of concept. These are then presented by the companies or by the researchers that want to develop these point of care tests. And it goes through a rigorous process at Hopkins where all of the... Um, all of the um, statements that the companies make um, are tested, the, the tools are tested themselves. Um, the biorepository samples are made available to good candidates, not just to any old candidate, but really good candidate testing samples. And then um, what our role is in Uganda is that we help with the clinical testing side. So once all of these activities have happened, um, then we um, help to assess these within our uh, contents with the idea that this goes to impactful uh, use. So this is just a summary of the current portfolio of activities, um, just to give you an idea of um, the, the many grants that are going on. And what I'll do is go through some of these in a little bit more detail. But I just want to highlight on the right-hand side the many other staff, including um, Dr. Annette Onzia, who is our coordinator, um, and many of the other people within IDI have helped this work to happen. So. I'm going to give an overview of the timeline of how the center um, uh, has developed over time and then do a deep dive into some of our most recent studies that um, haven't been presented since last year. So this is the kind of evolution um, of the studies. We started off with this work around syphilis uh, back in 2014, uh, which led to a clinical trial looking at how we could get partners of women who test positive for syphilis in pregnancy tested because we found that in within IDI only about 17 percent of these partners were getting tested. We tried some different solutions including text messages to women, um, phone calls and it really didn't make any difference. The, the only thing that made a difference was when the partner engaged with antenatal care and came in with the lady. But around about this work, we did um, some um, qualitative research on um, uh, the male partner perspectives, and um, we did a needs analysis of healthcare workers on what kind of point of care tests that they would like in our environment using the IDI training database, and we did an evaluation of the Trinity point of care study. 
This uh, work led on to some work led by Dr. Agnes, um, which was the Megapox study, which was all of these gaming centers were popping up these uh, betting shops all around Kampala at the time. And we thought that this might be a place where, you know, young men at risk might be hanging out. So this research showed that there's quite a lot of um, STIs, especially syphilis in this population, but not yet HIV. So this group are at risk of getting HIV because they're definitely having unprotected sex, but this is a possible place where we can intervene. We also realized, or, or really led by Dr. Agnes, those that many, many, many people are just getting uh, treatment for their STIs at community pharmacies, at drug shops. So just walking into any community pharmacy and getting antibiotics. So this next piece of work that we started in 2020 was around trying to test people coming in for emergency contraception or with STI symptoms um, at community pharmacies. We also did an evaluation of um, the Mobinat uh, tool, and I'll go into some of the interesting findings uh, as we go through. Most recently, we've been layering on our work with drones onto some um, antimicrobial resistance work, and I'm also going to tell you about a spin-off implementation project that came out of this research. Another important pathway we've got is how our work, which in a slightly different direction, has led to um, some really important impact for urogenital gonorrhea surveillance. So for those of you who don't know, gonorrhea is a sentinel um, infection for monitoring the presence of antimicrobial resistance uh, globally. So in 2008, the UVRI sex worker cohort showed that there was ciprofloxacin resistance um, in um, uh, uh, commercial sex workers. And what's underneath, I don't know why, sorry, it's come up, but what's underneath um, um, the thing in 2010 is that Cipra was then taken off the, the national guidelines. Around about the same time, we were looking at um, our HIV population, our high-risk um, clinic in, in IDI and looking at predictors of chlamydia um, in this group. Um, uh, we also looked at ciprofloxacin resistance in this group, um, which showed a very high level around about the same time that it was being taken off um, the national guidelines. And that was work done by Dr. Emily Mabonga, who was here for a period of time. Uh, Professor Yuka met with the CDC Atlanta STI team, and they gave a donation for doing some um, gonorrhea sensitivity work um, for cephalosporins, and this led to work um, led by Francis Kukuza um, setting up um, Kampala sites for, for gonorrhea testing. Um, this was put into a research protocol um, along the lines of the WHO protocols. They added Ksenia and Koala, um, and then we were approved as a, um, a, a site for WHO surveillance in 2017 with WHO funding to make us an official site in 2022. So this was a kind of spin-off of, of the work, but it's led to some very important uh, work at IDI led by Francis on um, gonorrhea resistance. So diving into the, 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 the men with urethritis and gonorrhea a bit deeper, um, this was a project, um, the Mobinat project, um, that was done to evaluate a device, but also to collect additional epidemiological information on um, urethritis. So for those of you who are not medical, um, urethritis is a collection of symptoms in men, which includes pain on passing urine, discharge, inflammation. And it can be caused by a variety of different bugs. Having urethritis doesn't necessarily tell you what bug is there. Yet in Uganda, it's treated as just, you know, a catch-all antibiotics, what we call syndromic um, management. But understanding the bugs behind the infection is very important for understanding whether we're doing things right and understanding why antibiotics aren't working, why people are taking multiple courses of antibiotics, and what we can do about that to prevent further resistance. 
So what um, this study found is that the test that we used, the Mobinet test, was very sensitive and specific. If you remember the insured criteria, this was something that we needed to get above. And the WHO says, you know, over 80, but ideally around about 90% is necessary for this, which this tested very, very well. And also, um, the test result, when we looked at cifrofloxacin resistance, showed us that our cifrofloxacin resistance was very high, but also our... Um, our, our test was um, uh, working well for picking up ciprofloxacin resistance. It also showed that we had a very high burden of STIs in this group. 65% um, of them had uh, gonorrhea, 10% syphilis, 20% HIV. Now, these were people coming to STI clinics. So they were a self-selected high-risk population. But their condom use was very, very low. A lot of them were engaged in commercial sex activity, and ha over half of them um, drank a lot of alcohol when they were having sex. More worryingly than all of that was the fact that 40% of them had had antibiotics in the last two weeks before even coming to the clinic. So they treated themselves, their disease hadn't gone away, and then they were coming and getting treatment. And um, they um, also were showing resistance to all these bugs. One interesting thing is that we've long known that um, urethritis was caused by something called mycoplasma genitalium, and we used to call it nonspecific urethritis and just treat it with doxycycline. Um, this is the first study that has shown that mycoplasma genitalium is, avail is available, is, is um, prevalent um, in Uganda, um, and um, it's because we're, e we're, you know, with genomic testing, we can test for it much easier than, than we used to be able to do. So this led to some other work about pharyngeal gonorrhea. Now, having gonorrhea in your pharynx doesn't tend to call you symptoms, but it can mean that you can pass on gonorrhea very easily, and it's associated with the risk of antimicrobial resistance. And also, because it's Neisseria, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, because it's Neisseria, um, there is you know, an interest in the overlap between Neisseria meningitidis, which causes meningitis, and also Neisseria gonorrhea, both of which um, live in people's throats. So what this research was doing was trying to look at um, what the prevalence of it is here, what the antimicrobial resistance is. And so we were using a similar population, high-risk men in Kampala, and we also wanted to look at this in Kalangala in fishing men as well, um, because um, they are also have a very H high HIV prevalence, indicating that there's probably a lot of uh, untreated STIs. So um, in this study, we found about a 60% um, level of gonorrhea in our Kampala men and less in our Kalangala men. And so for the junior researchers here, this is just a point to note that in Kalangala, the study participants all talked to each other and they all found out that if you said that you had symptoms of urethritis, you would get some money. And so the reason we had a very low uptake was because we had a lot of people saying that they had symptoms because they were being encouraged by the financial con <laughs> contribution. So just to be aware, these things happen. In Kambala, it's a bigger population, but in a small population, word gets round. Um, so just a note um, to young researchers, or old researchers like me who forget these things. Um, but even having said that, there was still a 20% prevalence of gonorrhea. And these weren't people coming to a clinic. We just turned up on the island and said, we're going to test you guys. And still we found 20% of the people had gonorrhea. That's insanely high. Um, it was all resistant to ciprofloxacin, as we would expect. But you wouldn't necessarily expect this, because ciprofloxacin resistance should drop when you're not using ciprofloxacin for treatment. We haven't been using ciprofloxacin in our guidelines since 2017, 18, maybe even earlier, maybe 2016. So really, we should start to see some sensitivity to ciprofloxacin. But it's still getting used in drug shops. It's still getting used everywhere because people are still giving it out. And it's a shame because if we could get the sensitivity down, we could recycle these antibiotics. So this is another reason why antimicrobial stewardship is really, really important. We found new cases of HIV. So in terms of hunting down the last cases of HIV, where STIs are, there are HIV cases that we haven't yet picked up and quite a lot of syphilis uh, as well. 
In Kampala, um, because the data was a bit bigger, we did this here. Interesting things on here is that people um, who um, um, uh, were identifying um, as uh, gay and bisexual were a small part of this group. Only 30% of people said that they were having oral sex, and yet we found a lot of uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea. So the kind of conclusions of that is it's more common in older participants, but it's also common in people who are not self-identifying as having a risk. So if you just rely on what people say, then you're going to miss quite a lot of pharyngeal gonorrhea. And that's important because it can drive AMR uh, if it's not treated properly and if we don't test to check that the treatment has worked. We're going on to check whether the bugs in the urethra and the genital bugs and the pharyngeal bugs are the same. And this is some work that is being done on putting antimicrobial resistance testing in point of care tests. So normally antimicrobial resistance testing takes an entire lab and lots and lots of machinery and it's expensive and difficult to do. If we can add antimicrobial resistance testing to our point of care diagnostics, what that means is we will be able to tell people not only what bug they have, but what treatment is going to work for them for their bug. And so this is a really important next step in the evolution of point of care testing. So I want to just talk about the COFAS study. This is the one in the community pharmacies that I mentioned before. So this enrolled about 400 people. Half of them approximately came in with symptoms. Half of them were asymptomatic, but were like asking for emergency contraception or their girlfriend might have had a problem and you know they agreed to be tested as well. Within this population, remember this is people who've just walked in to any drug shop around the corner there was a 30% prevalence of um, uh, gonorrhea um, in women who were symptomatic. We had loads of trichomonas. We had quite a lot of HIV and syphilis. A third of the, the HIV cases hadn't been diagnosed before. And of the syphilis, we know that even when syphilis is treated, your test can remain positive. But when we went and interrogated this a bit more, a third of these cases of syphilis were active new infections. So a really high burden who are going and getting antibiotics over the counter in uh, public pharmacies. We then followed these people up. So they had an intervention, they were given treatment, we followed them up at day 30 and at day 90. They are still getting infections, even after they've had treatment. <laughs> you know, there was an HIV infection, maybe that was from before, but there was one HIV incident case. This is a high-risk population, um, you know, and, and they need uh, help and they need interventions. So just to go back to the point of today's work, which is how does our research translate into practice? And to pick up something that Nelson said um, earlier on, Prof. Nelson talked about engaging with our academic alliance. This piece of funding came to us through Professor Tom Quinn, which was academic alliance. Now, we don't work with him every day, but when this work came up and this money came up and Pfizer had it, he recommended them to us. So I would really, again, um, I know um, we've lost some of our bosses now, but hopefully they'll listen later. I think we really need to keep in touch with our Academic Alliance colleagues. So we were asked from the basis of our syphilis work to um, do an implementation project. There was some money left over. It was quite a lot of money that had to be spent in a short period of time. And the idea was to improve case management in women, their partners with syphilis in pregnancy, and follow up their babies, which has been difficult to do and hasn't been done before. So we had two parts of this project. The left-hand side is the follow-up of the babies. So that's women in high-risk pregnancies coming into Coempe, which is the high, has been the high-risk pregnancy center while Malago is being renovated. And mums who present late in pregnancy or have known to have syphilis and haven't been tested. And then on the right-hand side was just routine low-risk pregnancies in Kisenyi, uh, Kuala, and Kiswa, where we were following uh, people up. We sensitized in a year over 46,000 patients and all credit goes to the KCCA IDI team who have the entire infrastructure that are seeing these ladies and, and, and could help us get this project up and going um, very quickly with Dr. Zickler who was very instrumental in this. 
Um, over 11,000 women were tested. Um, and we treated 335 women for syphilis. Now remember, we only got 20% of male partners last time. This time we had nearly 100%, definitely over 90% of men were contacted. We got about 70% of them tested and then um, a significant proportion uh, treated. But we didn't do so well with the babies. So there were 113 positive mothers. And I'm putting this up because this is an area that really needs attention. Um, and, and this is something that we want to carry on. So 113 high-risk mums who haven't had syphilis treatment or who are presenting late. Of those nine who had, had bad pregnancy outcomes, so 10% were losing their babies. Now, some of this will be syphilis. Some of this, it's, it's a high-risk pregnancy unit, but some of this will be related to their syphilis. Of the number of babies, we managed to test 109. 36 of them were positive for syphilis. Um, the guidelines would suggest that even if the babies weren't positive for syphilis, the, the, the global guidelines, you should treat them. But you'll understand why we struggled. We managed to only get 13 mums to accept 10 days worth of antibiotic uh, penicillin for their kids. And when we were struggling so much, we then switched to a erythromycin syrup, which hasn't been got the data in babies, um, um, but we were trying to get something into the babies to get them treated. Um, but we also lost many mum and baby pairs because Koala is a center where people come from all over the country. Even though we were doing active follow-up, we, we, we struggled to find these mums. So we asked what the problem was. So they got lots of counseling. The babies were too small to receive injections. People didn't want their babies to have injections. They said their babies were perfect. My baby looks perfect. Why would you give my baby an injection? There's nothing wrong with my baby. And there's this sense that syphilis is not fatal. In another group, um, and I'm going to... I'm going to get this word wrong, so I'm looking at Noella, who can probably help me. In our other research, we found that men think that syphilis makes them powerful, makes them strong. Heroes? Bar Baraza? Uh, there's a term. The guys just told me upstairs. But, but it makes... Huh? Thank you. It makes men think that they're a hero because they've gone out and got syphilis and they've come back with it. We really have a lot to do in terms of educating people about STIs and about syphilis. This is a big problem. Um, and it's really affecting the health of our unborn children. So just because this is me, I can't talk about anything without talking about the technology that we're doing upstairs. So just give me a few minutes on this one and then we're towards the end. So technology to support point of care. We set up a syphilis registry for congenital newborns with syphilis that we've got in Uganda EMR. Um, we did lots of stakeholder engagement to make sure that everybody was happy about what this registry looks like. We now have to get people to use it, which is going to be more of a challenge than doing the tech side. The tech side's easy compared to, you know, behavioral change. But at least we have this in place, which can be a platform for future research um, and activities. Um, we use Call for Life um, within the STI people. You'll hear a bit about Call for Life tomorrow, but we used it for assisting partner notification in gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Um, and what this did was it didn't make the men come in and get tested more, but those who tested got treatment at a higher rate. So it's doing something, and we're just about to do some qualitative research to try and understand. We think it's probably the health tips that are encouraging people, the education, to get treatment. Our medical drones, we've flown some gonorrhea in the drone to make sure that gonorrhea organisms are viable when they've been jiggled around in a vibrating drone compared to on the boat. And we're pleased to report that 100% of our gonorrhea uh, organisms grew no matter what transport you transport them on. So in conclusion, um, our data confirms that Uganda is definitely a high burden country for curable STIs. These STIs at the moment can be treated. For example, pharyngeal gonorrhea is much higher than we expected. Our behavioral interventions for HIV that we've talked about for a long time are not being e embraced in some groups. And we've seen that condom use is not consistent. And we are not going to end our HIV epidemic until we can get on top of our STIs, but because we, we can see that they're a precursor um, to, to, to HIV.
Antimicro stewardship is weak. This is a problem area. But point of care diagnostics may be able to help in this setting um, to help prevent AMR and also give us an idea where the future hotspots for HIV are going to be. So we know that our work can inform public health programs because from the STOP study we did in the beginning, there is now STI, um, sorry, syphilis and HIV joint testing using ChemBio used in Kampala clinics. And our gonorrhea work has led to this WHO screening. We think we need to be innovative. The game shops, the, the, the drug shops, the pharmacies using drones, Call for Life, we need to think creatively about this. And we are going to start testing, hopefully, um, yeah, domestic workers as part of the, the um, um, uh, our coordinator Annette's um, MPH project. Everything that we do is um, underpinned by a strong and stable partnership with the STI AIDS control program, and that's due to Dr. Peter Chambadi, who's a great champion for our work, and we're very grateful for that. Our contribution to the Hopkins national biorepository, so they get samples from a lot of sources, but the Uganda contribution to that has been really great and really important. And we know that we have to justify ethically our samples going to um, outside of the country, but if the then samples can then be used to encourage the technology companies to do work in low income settings, which I know is um, a function of the point of care center, it in turn will help um, beyond Uganda. And our ultimate aim, aims are, as with everyone, to inform public health policies, to do some implementation science, and really help with LMICs. Um, just to give you a glimpse of what's possible, following the work that we've done, um, the, the center under Professor Yuka got money to rapidly develop and evaluate uh, COVID tests within the COVID pandemic and um, sent some of the work um, our way. And we've been doing some work in the tail end of our COVID um, epidemic um, where we're going to test some new technology with the samples that we've stored during this work. So here's a snapshot of some of the tests that we've evaluated or used or have been donated. Um, um, and they range from a big kind of machine that, 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 that um, gives a result to the very simple things that you know, we see in malaria, pregnancy, HIV testing. So future directions for point of care STIs. So these are the sort of studies that we're working on, either getting ready to go or, or writing uh, funding for. But I think that there's a bigger picture here. So with this platform, um, with the support of our partners and, and, and global collaborators, we want to use the work that we've done to extend wider, to extend to include emerging infections. We know how important diagnosis is. I think Dr. Moha is going to talk tomorrow on the fact that you have 24 hours when an outbreak occurs to diagnose that infection. Already Tanzania with their Marburg is four days behind or, or more than that, right? And that's because they haven't got access to the UVRI labs that we have. But if they had point of care tests, you know, they'd know what they were dealing with within minutes or within hours. Um, and this is a really important area that where we are situated, our specific privilege of being in Uganda gives us an opportunity to do um, this work. But we also want to link with the wider Makareri University with biomedical engineering, with the engineering department. I've had an engineering student in my office this morning to really see how we can build some capacity here. We are not going to have the chain of innovations that they have in Hopkins coming from the US, but we have great innovators here. We, we may be able to come up with appropriate technologies, or we may be able to borrow off patent technologies that we adapt and create and manufacture within our own environment. And I know the minister for STI is very in, in, engaged in this, and there's no reason why we shouldn't. It's not that we don't have capacity. We, we just need to think creatively. So that's homework for me to, to go and think about for the future. 
Um, this is our team, our senior team, and I just have to mention Gretchen, who works very closely with Dr. Yuka, and without her, none of this would happen. Um, but also our affiliated team within the wider IDI and the wider research community as round, um, including Dr. Joanita, um, Francis Kokoza did a lot of the work, um, and um, colleagues such as Kirsty Ladore, who are doing neonatal studies that have helped us uh, out. Uh, Richard, who's here, and the Translational Lab. So a lot of help. Noella, um, a lot of help from a lot of people in the room. So thank you. More. In, so sorry. Going back, our study team are amazing, including Dr. Um, Annette, um, and um, uh, we are ably helped by all of them. But also our study participants. We are asking them to share with us the most intimate details of their private lives, and they do so willingly with the desire to make life better for other people. And we must never forget how precious that is, and we must do nothing to kind of break the trust between those study participants and ourselves. Uh, thank you very much. And I think I've probably got five minutes for no, questions. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> we have a few minutes for for questions, any, any questions online, please, if, if, if they're there, please read them out. And then if there are any questions in-house, please let me know and uh, walk over to you. Please, Sarah, go ahead with online. Thank you, Dr. Rosanna. Um, I have a question online from Mote Waleban, who says, um, who thanks you for the presentation, and says, with this high ciprofloxacin resistance, what would you recommend for the widely used syndromic management of STIs in a resource-limited setting like Uganda? His second question is, was the study able to describe the microbiome in men with urethritis? Was it, dip was it different for Kampala and Kalangala? Was it different from the common ones already documented? That is gonorrhea, chlamydia, ureplasma, and vaginalis. Okay. And then what could have been the influence of co-infection in the cipro resistance? Thank you. Um, so, okay, so let me take the um, the first question. So since um, ciprofloxacin was removed uh, from the guidelines, um, uh, cefixime and ceftriaxone has been the alternative that we use in our setting. So we haven't used cipro for a long time. On the second question, so this was a pharyngeal study that we did in Kampala and Kalangala that I think you're referring to. And so we were only testing for gonorrhea because um, uh, things like trichomonas don't live in the throat. It was a specifically a small research project looking at gonorrhea. Kalangala is an interesting population. I've got a special interest in Kalangala. Um, uh, there has been some work done on different STIs um, in the Kalangala population, but within our studies at the moment, we haven't looked um, at the different conditions because this was specifically a pharyngeal study. And then the last question was about co-infection. The effect of co-infection on the antimicrobial resistance. Yes. So... The test that we do, the way it's done, it grows the gonorrhea because we're, we're doing, at the moment, what we've done is culture and sensitivity in country. We are sending the genotype, like the, 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 the actual bugs to Hopkins to have genotypic and phenotypic testing, but that hasn't happened yet. So what we've done in country is we've grown the gonorrhea and then we've done the, the sensitivity testing on that. So the sensitivity testing the, will be specifically for those gonorrhea bugs that we've grown. Um, the way that co-infection can, can cause an effect, um, is probably, well, okay, so so uh, bugs can share resistance with each other, but you will still have to have been exposed to antibiotics for another bug in order for the bugs to be sharing their, their antibiotic resistance uh, with each other. So you will have still needed to have other treatment in that situation. Thank you. Nice to get some input from people in global health security, but I think that there's a lot of room for antimicrobial stewardship. So, do you think there's any possibility that we get the pharmacies to stop just giving antibiotics 
Okay. Was that a prescription? Yeah, very good question. So we're just about to do a piece of work on that. Thank you for asking that question, Dr. Yuka. So um, we have a group of public health registrars from the UK kind of attached to the Fleming Fund project that are coming out, and we've just got IRB approval for them to do surveys with community pharmacies. So what we really want to understand is what can we do with the community pharmacies? Are they so driven by money that whatever we do, unless there's a national law to say that they can't give out antibiotics, which happens in other countries. Like in other countries, pharmacies can't give out antibiotics without approval from a doctor. So what is driving that? Would it take a law or is there any availability for movement within our setting to be able to um, either with a carrot without a stick, encourage antimicrobial stewardship within uh, pharmacies. So we're working with Moses Ochan from uh, Department of Pharmacy in Makareri to try and do that piece of work. So once that piece of work is done, hopefully we can lead that into the Fleming Fund work in communities, and hopefully that will give us some information that we can put in programming for the future, because I think that's a really important piece of work that, that needs to be done. Yeah, thanks for the question. And you didn't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rose, for, for that presentation. And I think it's a very important piece of work, which is really building up. There's <laughs> still a lot of work to do in that area. And it's one of our new thematic areas where I really want to develop into a full blown theme within the Institute. So as the Lord Professor Ochama slides, I will go ahead and introduce him. So Professor Chama is an associate professor, an academic hematologist at Makere University. He supervises the clinical services of GI and hepatology at Kirudos National Referral Hospital and Teaching Hospital. Professor Chama is ma major interest in interaction between viral hepatitis and HIV on liver disease and hypercellular carcinoma in resource limited setting, meaning Uganda. <laughs> yeah. In many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, hepatitis B infection is endemic and generalized HIV epidemic exists. Understanding the consequences of co-infection, including hypercellular carcinoma, is crucial to inform approaches of targeted screening or secondary prevention with the ART antiviral therapy. Currently, we ha they, they, they don't have, they, are, they have been involved in studies that, are, that have been on DTG in HIV-infected patients. In addition, they have been running studies on liver cancer and HIV impact on cystosomiasis. The theme called H2U, H2A, all those studies are under Professor Chama. So it's a pleasure to invite Professor Chama to make his presentation on viral hepatitis, liver disease in Uganda, two decades of experience. Professor, you're most welcome. Thank you.
Can I have the next slide? What lost you for some minutes? Okay. So all this uh, started in 2009. Um, um, we were observing a number of patients uh, dying from liver cancer in you know, what we will have some of them very young. We ended up at, we went to the, uh, to examine the Kampala cancer rating data, and we wanted to look at the trends of intracellular carcinoma uh, in central Uganda from 1960 to 1980, and then in 1991 to 2005, you know, between 1980 and 1990, there were issues, the data was not really collected, and so that was the time period we had, and we got data uh, from uh, of about uh, over 700 uh, patients uh, from that region. Now, briefly, the, what we found was that HPC rates were seven men, uh, but the incidence uh, increased significantly in women uh, in the two time period, uh, about 50%. Now, we didn't know why it was happening. Uh, the major event that took place by 1980 was the HIV infection. So we thought this increase could be because of HIV, or maybe we were having obesity um, in the women, women were becoming more obese, and uh, what about the role of other risk, uh, traditional risk factors like viral hepatitis and aflatoxin, and also alcohol, of course. Um, next. So we set up this. HIV and particular carcinoma study in Uganda, what we call the H2U consortium, and that was in 2015. Um, Liver cancer is common and is lethal. Uh, globally, it's the sixth most common cancer and fourth most common cause of cancer death in the world. It is endemic in South Carolina, Africa, probably because of the risk factors listed. And uh, the role of this so tobacco, uh, obesity, and the uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease, now of course, metabolic associated fatty liver disease, was not well defined. And the role of HIV, HIV, HIV infection was also needed a lot of uh, study uh, to be done so that we could understand it a bit more. So we established this consortium in 2015. Uh, in Uganda and HU, and the uh, next, and uh, the intention, the aim is to really solidify our capacity to conduct uh, multidisciplinary scientific investigation on this HIV associated HPC, and also to solidify the clinical cooperation and translational research infrastructure for the study of this. Uh, HIV associated liver uh, cancer and an advanced foundational understanding of the neurology mechanisms and clinical spectrum of HIV associated liver cancer. And to inform prevention and treatment strategies applicable to HIV associated liver cancer occurring in Uganda and similar research facilities. And uh, so we developed two projects. Project one was the uh, uh, HPC case control study, project two HPC screening study, and I will talk about them uh, briefly. And we also had the biomarker board where we were looking at the biology and after talking biomarkers. So I will start with project one. Um, in this study, we were recruiting the cases, uh, patients with HPC from Mulago. Uganda Cancer Institute and also in the north, uh, in the Cho, uh, Hospital. And the controls were recruited from Soma Ward and ENT Dental and Eye Clinic. And the objectives uh, were to determine the clinical uh, presentation of HPC cases and determine the impact of HIV infection on the clinical presentation and assess the social demographic and clinical determinants of mortality among HPC patients in an African setting. Of uh, high HIV prevalence and ARC. And then we define the cases clearly based on ultrasound scan and ultrasound protein 
and all into pathological diagnosis. We carried out extensive questionnaires, the clinical examination in lab tests, HIV, 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 alpha beta-proteins, and many others. And we also performed uh, histosomiasis uh, uh, tests to define um, the role of histo in this uh, population. Um, as a result of the term, uh, cases underwent telephone uh, follow up one, three, six, and twelve months later on um, as after enrollment to define micro uh, statistics. Uh, we had planned earlier on to, to really uh, recruit 600 cases and 600 controls, also so again to increase the controls to 1,200, so one to two. Now, briefly, uh, we found, uh, we, we analyzed um, data of 441 liver cancer cases. And this has just been a tested publication. But you can see that by one month from the time of diagnosis, 47% of these patients had already died. And by three months, this went to 71, by six months, 82%. And by one year, we had 87% uh, of the patients. And when they passed, in fact, we only find that the five cases um, who were still alive by 12 months for the government. Now, the median survival was 42 days from the time of diagnosis. That's just one and a half in a month. And the factors associated with mortality included surface antigen, liberated surface antigen, and then also elevated ASP. Now, um, HIV infection was associated with increased mortality rate. Uh, only among those with severe disease with uh, very low CD4 count. In fact, I, I, I should say that later on we, have, we, we noted that while hepatitis B increased the risk for liver uh, cancer by 24 times. And the CISO by three times when, we, when they were combined, CISO and, and hepatitis C, the risk went to seven times. So, the project through a screening study, we plan to screen 2,000 HIV positive patients at the IPI, and we conducted several, we conducted the questionnaires. This um, this time we added also fibro scans in this um, discussion. We did a lot of lab testing, that's the one that we were doing in project one. And the intention here was to see, because most of the patients that we saw in project one, they were dying because they were presenting late. And now we wanted to use this, try to see if we could pick patients who are at risk of developing liver cancer. and uh, and then see if we can pick the liver cancer at its earliest so that we uh, try to intervene uh, by giving injection, alcohol injection, at least to see uh, if this could improve the outcome a little bit. And uh, because for these persons who were at risk, high risk, and this includes also the type C and the type C and the high fibrosis score, we need them to follow them every six months with hypothetical protein at the same time. Um, we managed to get at least 400 uh, patients who were at risk in that group. We followed up and we followed them up uh, uh, for four years, six months. Unfortunately, we still ended up getting five patients with advanced liver cancer. Speaking our understanding, because initially we thought we get them right. So, like this time, we have tested the alpha cytokine in other terms, and we were, we were all fine. Six months later, they come with my proper liver cancer. And we see that question in our test. Is it the right thing to continue following the patient level uh, six months, maybe uh, three months, maybe better? But that is what we did, what we found. But of course, uh, those patients. Also, not a bite. Um, they live like all the other ones. Next, they, they pass on within a very short time. Next slide. So then we 
had much higher viral load for hepatitis C compared to those who are treated. It looks like cystomandonite tends to affect the hepatitis C species in it, which leads to multiplication of the virus. This is probably one of the reasons why we are seeing this high level of HPC in the combined infection network. So we are basically investigating two phenomena uh, association between Edmund's night and liver cancer and understanding if the relationship is modified by chronic liver co infection with liver HPC uh, and or HIV. And we will also explore the mechanistic linkages between liver cancer and chronic hepatitis infection. This treatment is indicated for both hepatitis C and cystomastomite. We want to take the advantage of pre and post treatment paradigms to understand how system might impact the system risk. And then what residual risk will remain when both infections are actually treated. This research result have a high likelihood of successfully contributing to reducing the burden and improving uh, understanding of liver cancer in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So the overriding of objective of this study is to investigate the diagnostic condition of liver cancer in cytomatonite to um, liver cancer, and specifically to characterize the impact of medical treatment of cystic chronic hepatitis B in Southern Africa and to correlate the dynamics of hepatitis B infection during physical treatment with changes in inflammatory cytokines and hepatitis B specific immunological response. Uh, and then to compare some of the components, including the CD uh, and HCD related application pathways, basically on the um, in the liver. Uh, tissue liver cells and also the uh, portal inflammatory tissue in HPV patients pre and post cystic treatment. So um, again, this is three phase of traditional cohort uh, linked to the previous studies that we, we have already been conducting, then the setting, and then the population into uh, include patients attending clinic for HPV and HIV, and we do physical testing at entry, and then uh, we plan to include 100 patients in this group, and then uh, we were hoping that uh, we, we find uh, at least 25 percent of these 100, which is really 25 patients with triple infection, uh, HPV, cystic, and HIV. Now, because of whatever we have been seeing between CISO and HPV, we've also set up this Uganda CISO multidisciplinary research center with colleagues, um, John Toki and the MRSP uh, here in the uh, next. And uh, the reason we are doing this is we are seeing, although you can see that this, you know, CISO is found partially in many places but the concentrations around it, um, Lake Victoria and Lake Albert. But we've seen a difference in mobility. Mobility seems to be uh, uh, more in the Albertine area compared to what we are seeing in the Lake Victoria area. And so we've had uh, a number of questions related to this. Uh, go on, uh, next slide. So these are some of the people that we are working with. Last for Liverpool, Cambridge, London School, and all the others that you can see there uh, in Uganda, we are working with the university, with infectious control, with the virus, with the and the parallel university. So, um, next, yeah, so uh, we think that there is some, we think that whatever is happening uh, in the differential mobility could be. Uh, because of differences in the parasite or the human host or even the worm itself. And uh, so next, so we have set ourselves now to try to study the human host uh, and then the parasite and the snail. So there are those three 
track and there are people who are going to collect snails um, and study those snails and then those who are extracting the parasites and looking at the parasites and then the group that is doing the human Next. So this is the epidemiological study that is dealing with the human health. Next. And this study we are going to do it in a chicken way on Lake Albert and also in a mining world. So I will now go on to talk about the society being certainly selected to be, and this will lead us to the discussion on, on um, the study that we did in, in West Nile. Now we have the ACC as a major cause of liver cancer, especially in the of poverty, and of course, sick story is also found mainly in the West Nile region, and there, both these are very common during the some countries in the tropics. Uh, so generally, this epidemic disease is just like this, so it's a neglected tropical disease, and there are many reasons why we epidemic disease is neglected. Next. And you know, because of stigma and discrimination, the last patient voice, the violent infection, so we have a large pool of patients who are actually not diagnosed with poverty, from plantancy, high burden, low income countries, lack of public or media um, representation is not a high profile disease. It was eclipsed by the higher profile infections like malaria and HIV. The poor education and knowledge and the um, lack of existing investment, lack of development, uh, infrastructure, poor quality data, and, and many other things. Next. So, because of that, you can see even funding with the data. Very poor, less dark blue, far, uh, and this follows uh, into the publication. Next. So, uh, so we, we can get a school of six persons who are infected, you know, and that no this is infection from 91% of those who are infected, and uh, 9% diagnosed. Now, we can't tell exactly how many of these are linked to care. Uh, and even when they are linked to care, how many are really engaged with care? And then we find those of treatment, patient health, and what about the viral load? How much suppression do we have in this patient? And then next, as a result of that, we set up ourselves to try to study um, this hepatitis C, integrating hepatitis C care into the HIV care system in a highly easy body and infected. And so we wanted to do a post on acceptability analysis. Um, next. So hepatitis C uh, is common uh, and the, in the in 2009, in 2020, the UNH report, you know, HIV was 1.5 million, but earlier on, HPV was uh, in about 4 million persons in Uganda. And uh, of course, that will be set up the strategy to be made by the like 2030. Right? But this elimination goal um, will require certain things, including strengthening the HPV care and prevention services. And the one way of doing this is of course to integrate the HPV care into everything HIV care. Why? Because uh, when you look at the HIV and the HIV, they have almost 80% overlap. So this would be the best one. It would be very good actually to get uh, these two uh, linked together. Um, so we do not have clear sensitivity and force involved in if you are going to integrate these, agents, uh, these two infections to be treated uh, under one roof. And so we set up this two for one project, which is the two infection for one outcome. And uh, in West Nile region, we have trained healthcare workers in assess their uh, accessibility and reduce the cost of integration. Um, so we did this in a lower regional, uh, the part of hospital, and the lower level facility, Kobo District Hospital. Now, two things. One, the, the two hospitals are HIV, 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 um, which 
generally have got better funding and well served. You have counselors who have um, the clinician, uh, and they also have the education is very poor funding um, under that. In the result, if we got this HDD demon infected patient into the HIV clinic and treat it like that, um, they will be treated better there um, next. And so we educated, we developed the curriculum and trained these healthcare workers, and that included various uh, staff, you know, from, from the hospital to our home street and post state assessment, and we also got it published um, um, last year. Uh, next. Now, for our stability and visibility, we did qualitative studies. We, we conducted 15 clinical managers, six uh, FDD, and, and various persons were involved in this case. Patients who were infected, more infected patients, HIV infected, uh, more infected patients, and HIV co infected patients, administrators in hospitals, and the healthcare workers. And they collected the information on the disability of integrating HPD and HIV care and sent the integrated service and willingness to recommend the use of integrated care service. Um, next. So we got very favorable data. Um, and we just um, got to be published this year. Uh, most patients and healthcare providers perceive this integration suitable and appropriate. Uh, several, uh, several reasons were cited, like convenience and increased access to HPV clinic care, and opportunities to receive more comprehensive care as minimum holistic HIV care, uh, including counseling, health education, and peer support. We got um, one major uh, challenge: the HIV infected patients say that. Um, we should not, uh, maybe we should change the name of the clinic because the HIV is in both, in both, um, in both people. And they are saying why we, we, we need to change the name. But now when we go there, we always have to see we say we have the HIV. And so stigma was the big uh, issue there. And, uh, so it's something that we are still trying to, to sort out. But I also want to say that we completed this, uh, this day about um, um, one and a half years ago, but today the clinic has been run out of the moment. It's important to you. So we developed, for the cost assessment, we developed pathways uh, for standalone clinics and integrated clinics in both hospitals. And these costs were based on fast personnel costs, fixed costs, consumer costs, utilities, medicines, labs, and then. Um, Assessment considered financial costs as a measure of the amount of money spent on resources used in the clinical care pathway and the annual cost per patient was simulated based on total amount of resources uh, spent for all the patients in the facility for hepatitis B or HIV care per year. Um, and then uh, next. Um, next. Okay, so. In summary, basically, there was a good, uh, there was good testing um, in the integrated pathway eh, compared to uh, the standalone clinic uh, because the difficult, the, the cost testing was uh, lower in a rural hospital compared to Kokoko. And the reason was because the, in a rural hospital, it was only the physician who was seeing the patient. Um, and meanwhile, in Kokoko, the clinical officers actually were seeing the patient, but mainly the clinical officers seeing the patient. But only all that was posted, and again, that uh, this paper has been published recently. Um, uh, so, um, then you can move on, I think, I'll talk about this. So, we, we showed that the breaking HPV is the pre existing HIV service model, is what acceptable and cost efficient. Uh, and therefore, has got the potential to improve adherence to HPV treatment as well as treatment outcomes. And we are actually, we, we, we were waiting for the last paper, which has just been published, and we want to start engaging um, the stakeholders, including the Ministry of Health, if this can be escalated into the other uh, hospitals as well. Next. So we've 
had a number of um, participating activities we uh, supported. We have uh, several of us who supported on this broad uh, this project that we are talking about. Uh, next. So, again, I acknowledge the government of Uganda for uh, some of the activities that we were doing, both training clinic administrators and participants, a project staff, and the funding from Gilead and the NIH. Um, so, it is next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Professor Chama. I know I oversee the studies, mostly regulatory and administrative aspects, but I didn't know the much details as you presented today. So it was a privilege to understand the science beyond the administration and the regulatory framework we have been offering. So thank you so much, and I've been very enlightened from today. So we have spot for questions, please. Online, if there are questions, please help us highlight them. And in-house, if you have a question, please just shoot up your hand, and we'll walk the mic to your place. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. There's a question online from Mary Goretti, a team in Karamoja, who says, uh, thank you, Professor Chama, for insights into hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm wondering if visceral leishmaniasis plays a role in HCC. If so, how can we explore more on it, specifically for patients with HIV co-infection in Karamoja region? Thank you. Professor Yuka, go ahead. Hi, Ponciano. It's Yuka. Very nice presentation, and it's so nice to see the, um, the outcomes of some of the work that started a while back. Um, I wanted to ask you more about schistosomiasis. So we've been, we thought about it a lot in the past. Um, you had done the upper GI bleed study with Kenny and others. And it strikes me that in places like Lake Albert and people who are constantly in Lake Victoria, that we should be prophylaxing, that we should be treating them intermittently because they're always going to be affected by the water, which is very infected. So are there any plans with your schistosomiasis group to consider whether or not you would do intermittent prophylaxis in people who have high exposure? Oh, thank you, Professor Chama. So we have one person online. Fred, go ahead and vocalize your question to Professor Chama. Thank you. Over to you, Fred. Fred, please go ahead and unmute and put forward your question. Okay, I, I think let's ask him to type if he's not able to vocalize so that we're able to get his, his contribution and insight. 
But I think, thank you so much, Professor Chama. The issue of capacity development in the H2U, I actually didn't know that you have PhD students in H2U, and I'm not been reporting on them. But from the presentation I saw, they have been postdoc doctors inside. So that's something for us to consolidate and report within the capacity development project. And that takes our scholarship profile to around 120 scholars within in-house. So thank you so much for that, 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 that contribution of capacity development. We are going to transition to our last presentations. Uh, and this presentation is going to be chaired by Dr. Philippa, and I will invite her to introduce the, panel, the, the speakers. But Dr. Gure has a recorded presentation, which will be played, but it will be available to respond to questions as they come in. Philippa, over to you. Introduce you. Introduce Miriam. Thank you. Yes, we're able to hear you. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Where we'll hear about uh, the HIV associated malignancies, uh, Kaposi sarcoma, and cervical cancer. Uh, the research group has been at IDI since 2006. Its initial focus was on Kaposi sarcoma. And at that time, Kaposi sarcoma diagnosis was mainly clinical. Patients were severely ill with very limited access to antiretroviral therapy. But since um, then, we've uh, started also work in 2015 in the area of cervical cancer research in people who have HIV as well as the general population. And our team has grown from just a small group at IDI, and it now includes teams in Embarara, Masaka, and Gulu within Uganda. Across Africa, we have presence in Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Malawi, and Botswana. We also have sites in, we also had sites in Nigeria and Cameroon. And uh, we've also since collaborated with several institutions in, in Africa, including Mohimbili, Moi, and Botswana universities, and have maintained a 17-year collaboration with the University of California, San Francisco, and also added new collaborations with Cornell, Arizona, Duke, Harvard, and Indiana universities. So our story is going to be told to you in two, in two phases. The first phase will be the KS, and the next will be the cervical cancer. Uh, Dr. Agre Semere, a physician and research scientist at IDI, and a regional PI for the East Africa IDEA Consortium, will present the KS story to you. The cervical cancer work will be presented by Professor Miriam Nakalembe. Professor Nakalembe is an obstetrician at the Macquarie University College of Health Sciences. She's also a lead investigator for the Uganda U54 Consortia with the UCSF and Indiana Universities. And she's a member of the Cervical Cancer Prevention Task Force at the Uganda Ministry of Health. Please well, join me to welcome uh, the two doctors, Dr. Semere and Professor Nakalembe. Dr. Semere, over to you. Hello. Hello. My name is Agus Semere. And on behalf of the HIV and cancer team at IDI, I'm delighted to share with you um, our story of how um, the work, our work has evolved over the last almost 17 years. Um, and the work is in two stories one about KS and the other about cervical cancer. And I will start with KS. This tells us um, in, in this uh, slide, we show a timeline of the evolution of HIV and cancer research at IDI, which started in 2006 with the biopsy service. In 2007, a major landmark clinical trial called the ACTS trial did look at ART and among patients with KS, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And later, we had various studies um, about in early case diagnosis, rapid case ascertainment in 2014, and in 2015, studied our initial work into cervical cancer and Later on, we've done a lot more diagnostic work. What, do we, what is our story with Kaposi's sarcoma? 
Kaposi sarcoma starts off in the early 80s as a hallmark of the HIV epidemic. It was also in, in 1996 discovered to be caused by a virus. And this is the Kaposi sarcoma associated virus, also known as the human herpes virus 8. Kaposi sarcoma at the beginning of HIV epidemic was one of the top three causes of death. Um, the other two being really TB and cryptococcal meningitis. Around that time, uh, when antiretroviral therapy was found to be effective against HIV, there was a couple of hypotheses that um, the different antiretroviral drugs who, who did have possible chemo, um, some effects, direct effects on KS outside the effects on the immune suppression. So this trial, which was a non-pharmaceutical trial, was run at IDI called the Antitroviral Therapy for AIDS Associated Caposarcoma Trial. And the aim was to see or find out whether a pot uh, protease inhibitor-based regimen was superior to a non-protease inhibitor regimen. What did we learn? We learned actually that there was no difference. In fact, after 48 weeks, mortality and, um, sorry, cumulative incidence of death or um, chemotherapy indication was no different uh, between those uh, on a PI-based versus non-PI-based regimen. To enable us to do this, uh, sorry, around this time, um, diagnosis was mostly clinical in what we call macroscopic or visual. Whenever biopsy was performed, it needed a lot more resources and someone needed to do a wage biopsy and this needed surgeons. And all of you know, we don't have that many surgeons and this would need <clears throat> theaters. And so most of the diagnosis of K Kaposi sarcoma case was relegated to the clinical approach. We needed something different. We, need, we started, cons and. To get most of our work started in 2006, we established a field of charge biopsy service at IDI. And this biopsy service um, has, over the years, uh, been expanded first locally to Masakan, Barara, and also sites in Kenya, um, in Eldoret and Chulaimbo. And now we have spread um, this all the way Rwanda, Tanzania, we have Ocean Road and uh, Mohimbiri, as well as Lilongwe in Malawi and Pavilion in Botswana. And this uh, ability to biopsy did come with some opportunities. However, to ensure that we have consistent performance of biopsy, we evolved, in, we came up with a task shifting. Um, program where we trained nurses and phlebotomists to actually be able to perform these biopsies. And over the last 17 years, we've had zero complication. As you can see there on the work, which was published by my colleague, Lake, um, Miriam Lake Oketa in 2015, the dark bars where the physician performed biopsies are reducing across um, Uganda mostly. However, we still have to convince some of our colleagues in some of the other countries to also take this on. It's not uh, universal yet because of institutional or structural um, differences in the countries. With biopsies being performed in this work, which we published in 2016, you can see that at the beginning of our work prior to 2007, less than 20% of our case was path confirmed. But by 2012, we are more than 50%. Um, we had a prevalence of bi uh, biopsy performance of over 50%. And this enabled us to actually now start making some very significant understanding into um, what exactly is happening in the population uh, in terms of epidemiology of KS amongst HIV infected adults. We started off with incidence and in this work, which was published uh, in 2016, 
we actually estimated the incidence of KS amongst <clears throat> patients um, with HIV infection to be at 32, uh, 321,000, uh, 321 per 100,000, which to help you understand, if I took the commonest cancer in the US, which has a uh, an incidence of 140 per, uh, per 100,000 person years, 321 is twice that. So patients with KS get twice as much more cancer as would be expected for the most common cancer, in this case, prostate cancer amongst men in the US. With this biopsy, the other metric of epidemiology is actually survival. And at the time prior to ART, mortality was over um, 50% in the range of 60 to 70% of those um, who have been diagnosed with KS. We started following up patients, but realized quickly that one of our biggest problem was loss to follow up. Loss to follow up at six months was as high, was almost 50%, especially in, um, in countries where we looked at this in uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda. Malawi had a unique retention program at the time we did this work. So we had to overcome, for us to understand survival, we had to overcome this problem. And we had looked at um, some methods we had also um, that were developed to study um, just mortality due to ART uh, amongst patients with HIV. We did update vital status by tracking those who are lost to follow up. This sort of um, work requires you then to use what we call the inverse probability weights in the estimation of mortality when you um, you are able to correct for the loss to follow up. And so in this work, which we published, which we did in 2017, um, we actually found mortality to be about 26% for those who were in, who had incident Kaposi sarcoma on ART. You will notice that we have three lines in this graph. Those with prevalent Kaposi sarcoma not on ART, incident Kaposi sarcoma not on ART, but and those with incident Kaposi sarcoma on ART, the ones with prevalent disease tend to have higher mortality. At one year, it was close to 40%. Please note, this is around between 2019 and 2012. Not that number of around um, just below 40% because I'm going to come back to it later. In this work, which was presented by my colleague, uh, Dr. Biakwaga, recently, just uh, last month at Croy, we did actually follow about um, 130, I think this is about 130 patients diagnosed with KS. You can see that by eight months, we're having 38% mortality. If I go back to the previous slide, you see actually that a prevalent case about one year is still about 38%. What's the story? 10 years down the road, down the road we still have close to 40% mortality for all patients diagnosed with KS. So the short story we are trying to tell you that while we thought we KS would have um, had better epidemiology over the years, this, it is still a problem, especially in terms of mortality. One of the issues that we had to deal with is with this high mortality was important of um, thinking about, the importance of thinking about early detection. We decided to engage a community, including traditional healers, healthcare workers, and some health center staff. In this work, we, we kept, um, which was funded by D43 training grant, we came up with training manuals for biomedical health workers. We trained community health providers and also um, our nursing assistants and traditional healers. These manuals have actually been used in Tanzania, Uganda, and in Tanzania and Zimbabwe, as well as in Uganda. We have also created patient education comics, radio plays, posters. We use these posters and we have translated these posters in many languages 
from Swahili to Nyankore and even in Chichewa and Malawi, as well as uh, in other languages across the region to use this message of look, show, test. Um, the delays and inaccuracies um, are also something we have to, had to grapple with. Importantly, um, most of our patients who will be biopsy, sometimes, as you can see in this slide, we're only able to communicate within a month of results to just 60% of our patients. The rest do not return. Partly it's because of the long turnaround time, and that's not a, the only problem. We have also over time noted that there are inaccuracies in some of the pathology that comes out. So there is a diagnostic problem, there are delays, and how do we get around some of these problems? We hypothesize that with a point of care diagnostic, we shall get around delays. And if it is very specific, it will also reduce the inaccuracies. So we went back to the central dogma of KSHV as a necessary causal agent for, a, for KS and thinking about it in terms of how we could change what is up until now a solid state pathology into a liquid and then check for KSHV DNA. This needed some new technology and so we worked with our colleagues from Cornell to come up with a portable um, uh, DNA amplification device and it uses what we call a loop mediated amplification, that's lump, and it's inexpensive, $250 non-volume pricing. We can imagine that if this is now volume price, the price can come down, and it uses multiple energy sources, all the way from electricity to just heating, as well as sunlight. We have piloted this device and tested um, about in the first test we did with 500 participants, all the tiny tests performed in US labs, but on samples collected from patients in Uganda. Um, we found at an optimal cutoff a sensitivity of 97% and specificity of 92% with an AUC of 9.6. This is very promising. And from this work, we decided to evaluate this device amongst labs in all the regions where we've set up these biopsy services. So as we speak, we have delivered this device to, um, of course it's in Uganda, but we are collecting samples all the way um, to Gulu, um, in, in Gulu at Lacho, uh, in Rwanda, in, uh, in Kenya, most of this is Western Kenya, um, through our work uh, with collaborators at, um, at Moi University and also in Tanzania at Ocean Road Cancer Institute and Mwimbili and Malawi at UNC Project Lilongwe as well as uh, at the University of Botswana. And from this, our aim is to validate that accuracy um, that we saw and in the pristine labs and see how well we operate um, in real-time, real-world labs. And it will give us the chance to know how well um, we could diagnose case as a point of care. We could also bypass biopsy altogether. How about just imaging straight? So we have piloted this reflectance confocal microscopy, which looks straight at tissue. And this device, though did have challenges, we still can develop it further um, to explore direct light microscopy. There were some lessons we learned and initially we are changing this to work on the cervix and my colleague Miriam will talk more about how we're using confocal microscopy there um, to look at cervical precancer. We have also done some translational work. Patients are dying with KS and we don't know why mortality is that high. My colleague, um, Dr. Biakwaga has led most of our translational work and including looking at immunoglobulin E, uh, looking at uh, KT, the KT pathway and catabolism. And this work um, is just the beginning because we do have um, other uh, planned work to try and understand um, 
the mechanisms related to mortality among patients with KS. Further, we would want to understand this diagnostic, ch diagnostic challenges, especially with respect to stigma. We've always known that patients with HIV do actually have stigma, but what about the intersection of HIV and cancer stigma? With colleagues, um, Sigrid Kulea at the University of Washington, we have delved into trying to understand the intersectional stigma, especially using mixed method approaches. Further, we want to understand diagnostic delays with a little bit deeper delve. And so this has enabled us, and this is work we are doing before we um, try and roll out our, our point of care diagnostic, we want to be sure we fully understand the mechanisms of um, diagnostic delays in relation in relation to KS. Um, we are not, or we don't treat cancer, but because we operate in a primary care space, we usually will test patients and refer them to care. So our interest is knowing how many of those people who are actually reach to oncology clinics. In work we did in Kenya, we looked at 500 or close to 600 individuals and realized that almost a third of them never reached the oncology clinic. And you can see here that chemotherapy initiation only reached 60% at 12 months and then 20% of these patients died. So these delays in initiating oncology care are rather bothersome. So why is it a, a cost issue? So we have looked at some cost effectiveness um, and really tried to show which drugs would be the best. But however, we've wondered whether there is a need to help patients navigate. So we're trying to look at the patient navigation strategy um, for advanced stage care. And this is work that is ongoing and is helping us to see if we can do things beyond just giving patients results and making sure they can get to places where they can get care. So in conclusion, our work has really influenced a couple of things. The ARC study, of course, informed the discussion and use of ART. Um, the, ED, the EDKS work, the early detection work, and has influenced um, the couple of guidelines in terms of um, identification, um, as well as um, these were the WHO guidelines that uh, we did influence in 2014. But even more recently, we did participate in the Uganda MOHHIV care treatment guideline development discussions to try and help um, identification and mostly referral of patients with KS. For the care story, I'll pause here and stop here. There's a little bit more, but I'll allow my colleague, Dr. Nakalembe, to take you through what we are doing um, with um, cervical cancer. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll be taking us through the uh, cancer part of our work. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let, let's move until the end of this slide deck. Okay, there we go. So uh, cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer mortality in Uganda and many low income countries. And uh, HIV infection is a very important risk factor. And as we know, cervical cancer is an AIDS defining illness. Even in the area of art, this, um, the incidence and mortality from cervical cancer has not changed much, especially in low income countries. So there is really need to get to innovative ways of preventing this cancer. And uh, so in our work, we looked at uh, the previous slide, please. 
we looked at the public health, the previous slide. We looked at the public health approach, previous slide. Yes, we looked at a public health approach to early detection of cervical cancer in Africa through a community-based self-administered screening program and mobile treatment. So in this project here, we evaluated the feasibility of uh, such an approach to cervical cancer prevention. And in our approach, we had uh, four specific components. We went into the community with a village health team delivered campaign to mobilize women to come for what we called health fairs, where we offered self-administered HPV screening after which we collected their video preference of notification of their results and went back and carried out mobile treatment within the community. So next slide, please. So this work uh, um, we did in the central western districts of Chiboga, Koima, and Changkwanzi. And uh, these districts, by that time, this is where we had uh, uh, IDI was in charge of HIV care in that region, and it particularly had a higher prevalence of HIV, around 10%, with uh, low health service provision. So the first step in our, uh, our approach was to engage the community leadership. So at the district level, we had discussions, introduced our project, held focus group discussions, with the um, key stakeholders, and after which we trained the village health teams about what they were going to do, and we devised a mobilization strategy for the community that included making announcements in marketplaces, churches, door-to-door -door invitations to the women in the market, trading centers, and so on. So uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So after the mobilization, which happened around two, around, which took place around two to three weeks, we went and held what we called the health affairs within the communities. We got locations that were convenient, like um, uh, the fields of schools uh, or community places, as you can see in those little pictures within the slide. And on the day of um, the health fair, we held health talks with the um, women, demonstrated the self-collection of the HPV swab. We created private tents within um, the locations where we were and uh, to ensure privacy. Then we collected the samples, brought them to our lab in the translational lab and did HPV testing. So we notified results to the women via SMS, phone calls, face-to-face uh, -face or return to the screening place. So uh, these uh, samples were tested for high-risk HPV. Uh, those who tested positive, we went back, we gave them appointments and we went back on different occasions and offered mobile treatment within health centers that were within the communities. And this treatment included using of cryotherapy that time and uh, LEAP where it was indicated. And those who had suspicious lesions were referred to Cancer Institute. So in our first part of this work, we saw very high interest from the women in the community, whereby 99% of those who came to the uh, venues were able to give us a sample for HPV testing. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, these women were mainly young women, 30 to 39 years. The prevalence of HIV was high, higher than the national average at 10%. And majority of them, 95% of them, had never screened for cervical cancer. Let's move to the next slide, please. So, when we looked at predictors, as is known in the literature, we found that being HIV positive was, um, uh, was uh, associated with a high risk, a double risk, two, twice, twofold risk of being found HPV positive. Let's move to the next slide, please. So when we looked at the cascade from the attendance at the fair screening, notification of results, up to treatment for those who are positive, 
we found that um, a lot of women were able to come back for their treatment appointments. 86% of our population of positive women were able to come back and get treatment. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, for the next part of our project, which is which started about three years back, we took this public health approach to another level where we integrated um, HPV vaccination to look at the uh, prevention of cervical cancer along the continuum of life from vaccination to screening. And we also included um, uh, Kenya, a site in Kenya, Western Kenya in the Kisumu area, and uh, where we are collaborating there with uh, the, our Kenyan counterparts. So in this one, we want to look at, we are looking at the uptake and acceptability of HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening offered together through the same approach. We also want to determine the factors that explain non-participation because there are women in the communities who did not come to the fairs even when the service was brought to next to their doors. And we also want to evaluate the cost and efficiency of our integrated public health approach. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, similar to what we had before, we do community engagement, we do health fairs, but this time we also do HPV vaccination, which we termed a mop-up vaccination for the girls who may have missed their first or second dose and they're eligible for the vaccine. Then we do the notification, we do the mobile treatment, and uh, we do two rounds of mobile treatments to mop up those who may not have come for the first appointment. So here at the fairs, we are doing interviews, but this time we are doing for those who come, but for some reason or the other, they do not have to take the service. Then those who come for treatment, we interview them to find out reasons that motivated them to return uh, to return for treatment. And after the fairs, we, we do community enumeration. Next slide, please. Um, as we see in this uh, picture, after the fairs, we do what we call a community enumeration. After we finish the whole round of notification and treatment, we go in those communities where we did the fairs and sample a representative sample of households and do interviews for eligible women or guardians of the girls who are eligible for vaccination. And in these interviews, we want to understand the uptake of the service and reasons for non-participation. Uh, let's move to the next, please. So interim conclusions from our public health approach. We have seen that a community-based campaign that offers HPV vaccination, self-collected HPV uh, swabs, and mobile treatment, they are really feasible and highly acceptable by residents. And um, we have found in our interviews, we have found few but recurring reasons for non-attendancy of these conveniently placed fairs within the rural communities. And we have found that competing responsibilities were the most prominent reasons why many women were not coming. And uh, there were also misperceptions about the safety, efficacy, or intent of the services. And this may be uh, difficult to modify. And uh, so these reasons form a, a rationale for modifying of our messaging and engagement of the community to maximize participation. Next slide, please. So our last, uh, our last project, we looked at new approaches for early detection of cervical cancer. And the goal, the overall goal here is to evaluate two novel diagnostic approaches with potential to use as point of care diagnostics. And we are looking at sensitivity and specificity. So in this project, we have two products where we are looking at confocal microscopy. My colleague, Dr. Agra mentioned this for KS. So we are transferring the same technology, but this time on the cervix. And uh, in the pilot, well, we did determine the acceptability and accuracy of this local smartphone microendoscope 
imaging technique for diagnosis of uh, high grade lesions on the cervix. The next project here is uh, we want to evaluate biomarkers, which may be potential uh, candidates for cervical, for as point of care test for cervical cancer screening. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, this is a picture showing the confocal microscope. On the, the picture on the right side, this is how it really looked in uh, physically a smartphone mounted on a, a more elaborate de device, which included a, a, a tube which went into the sub, which touched the cervix and other technological uh, engineering within there to work as a corposcope to capture images, to be able to store them and process them. And uh, so this smart focal, smartphone confocal endoscope uses optical components to give high resolution images. And uh, a probe uh, was placed directly on the cervical epithelium and was able to visualize uh, cells on the cervix. Next slide, please. So our study site for this, um, this pilot work was Kawempe National Referral, the Cancer Screening Clinic where about, um, about 300 to 400 women visit this clinic to receive uh, services for, related to cervical cancer screening and other gynecological malignancies. Next slide, please. So our preliminary findings from this work, we saw that we were able to get distinguishable cellular features on 68% of the images that we visualized 38% of them uh, were challenging to analyze due to motion artifacts. There were issues with the stability of the camera and that led to artifacts in some of the pictures. Then the key analysis findings we have so far, as you can see from these slides on the right, one is displaying what histopathology would give you and the up here is what our confocal imaging would give us. Then on the, as yeah, that's a uh, picture on the right side. So we see that this um, technology was able to pick up uh, cellular elements as bright objects. And the more the, the grade, depending on the, uh, what was happening in the cells on the, that particular cervical epithelium, we see that we have more more brightness of the uh, picture. And uh, so the higher the grade of the dysplasia, the higher was the average intensity of those bright objects. We looked at the sensitivity and specificity of detecting high-grade lesions, and we found that it performed fairly well compared to other screening tests we have, 86% and 79% respectively. Let's move. So we looked at the perceptions of women and uh, healthcare workers as far as uh, this device was concerned. We found that most women were comfortable with it and would, uh, would be screened again with the device. We found that um, most health workers were satisfied and willing to use this device. However, there were issues with uh, learning how to use the device. Next slide, please. So our conclusions from our preliminary work, these confocal images can potentially be used to capture useful information that can help us to diagnose uh, high-grade lesions on the cervix. Women were comfortable and willing to screen again with this device, and the nurses were satisfied and willing to use the device. So we are... Uh, uh, doing further development and uh, fine tuning and improving uh, the device uh, to improve its sensitivity and specificity and more work is needed to make it uh, easier to use uh, as you saw the responses of the health workers. Next slide, please. So that's our team and those are all our collaborators. Uh, for this uh, work we've just presented. And maybe for purposes of knowing our policy implications and so on,
our work um, as the new WHO guidelines came out uh, uh, recently supporting use of HPV testing as a primary screening test where it's affordable and feasible. We've moved as a country to develop um, national guidelines which are recommending that. And currently uh, HPV testing uh, is was already been rolled out through development partners and PEPFAR CDC. And IDEA is part of this work where HPV screening has been rolled out in about 640 at clinics in the country. And this work also contributed evidence to the currently drafted national guidelines for prevention and treatment of cervical cancer. And uh, we were part of that. We were at the core of developing that and supporting uh, guiding direction at the level of the Minister of Health in as far as cervical cancer screening and prevention and developing the strategies concerned. So thank you so much. I will hand over to the chair of the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you, the team, for, for the presentations. And I think this today's session, after listening to 20 idea, 20 presents for research, it emphasizes the issue of knowledge management and documentation at IDEA. And Paul, we're on the right track. It's one area we have actually not fared well. So it's open for, for questions at the moment. Let me start from Professor Yuka. So, uh, Agre and Miriam, it's really lovely to hear your talks. So, and congratulations, because I remember back to the ARC study, and it's so nice to hear how so many of the plans have come through. So I have two things uh, for Miriam. One, there are HPV uh, testing platforms that are getting more rapid, maybe 15 minutes. And it seems to me that that would really help in your, um, in your workflow. So uh, I see that you cut off the lamp at 29 minutes. Most of them run for close to 40 minutes, and I'm assuming that's because you wanted a, a quicker turnaround time and you sacrificed some specificity. That's the first question. The second one is, um, you know, you could leverage your women's clinics that you're having to look for breast cancer. There's now a full sort of mobile pathway where you can look at biomarkers using an expert. You can make a diagnosis of potential breast cancer. Or you can do breast ultrasound, and then you can do cryotherapy for early lesions. So I wonder if you're interested in that at all. You should come talk to me. Yes, Noella. No, Miriam, be noting the questions. Let's get uh, at least a number of them. Dr. Noella, over Thank to you. Thank you, Miriam, for uh, sharing that information on cervical cancer. Mine is a quick one just to inquire how much men are being involved uh, in cervical cancer screening. Thank you. Dr. Sarah, and then online also, if they are there, please read them out. Thank you. i um, reading a question online uh, from Opinira Winfred who appreciates the presentation and is asking, does IDI conduct community cancer sensitization in the areas of intervention? If yes, do you get more clients? Thank you. I think, uh, Agure, mine is to you specifically. You have not talked about the capacity development within the, the entire case consortium. Uh, any thoughts? On I think let's respond to that. Let's agree to start, then Miriam goes on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sort of I've started at the end. Yeah, I've been here. So the reason actually I recorded is um, coordinating a couple of things, and I wasn't sure whether at this particular time I'll be in the room. Um, for capacity building, you notice that my team, uh, my colleagues, Helen, uh, Miriam, Lake who is actually in Malawi, that's why she's not here with us, and she's probably uh, watching. And I have actually been contributing to the training, actually, of a couple of uh, researchers. And I was actually doing a count recently. Since 2013, I've actually trained 110 masters or PhD. And actually, if I look into the, through the room, there are so many people, including yourself, Stephen, who came through my epidemiology class. And so while our team might not have people who we are training on cancer epidemiology, we're actually encouraging a lot of people to join us. We're contributing to the entire team. Actually, Helen, Helen uh, Biakwaga and Miriam 
also run different training um, programs. So if we put together all of us, we're probably around, <laughs> we could be around 300 people that have come through us. Now that's only epidemiology. For implementation science, I do have a few people who I have also supported um, because of that uh, training as well. Um, but there's a part of capacity building which is trained through your research program, but there's a part of capacity building which is contribute to the entire whole. So I would say our team has done the latter, but the former is also not ignored because we are trying, we may not have a, an intentional capacity building program, but our intention is to get people who we work with through the program. Philippa and Dr. Hilda will tell you we want them to work through our material and publish and work. And so that is a very um, closely um, ensconced um, agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gure. I also asked purposely because I expected to see the three very significant trainings you run under the, the CARES consortium here because uh, this was one of the marketing tools for it. So, Dr. Miriam, if you can respond to those questions, then. I, I think Miriam okay. wanted me to clarify my question. Okay. So Number one, yes, Prof. Okay, yeah, so number one, a TB lamp often takes a bit of time. It can take up to like 40 minutes. So I didn't understand why you have a cutoff. There's no reason to have a cutoff. Why don't you just let the test run to completion? I've never seen anybody try to come up with a timing cutoff unless you were concerned about it being so long. Okay, noted that. Noted that. Okay, so, yeah, I don't understand. Do you know why they came up with a cutoff time? I don't understand that part. No, noted that. I think we'll discuss it with the people who developed, uh, but I, I appreciate the comment. Oh. Okay, because see, I think there's going to be tests that are faster and there and mm -hmm. would be able to run to completion and therefore have a higher specificity than the one you're using. All right. Then I uh, thank you for that. Then you talked about the women. Yes, uh, you're not the first person actually is commenting about having the women do the breast exams and whatever, extend the service beyond just screening for CS service. Uh, so I think uh, the invitation is very welcome. I'll reach out to you and we have further discussions. Then uh, Noel, I think, talked about male involvement. Yes, it's, um, it's something that when we are out there in the community and we are mobilizing the women to come and whatever, we get the questions from the men and uh, we get the support of the men to let their wives come. Though we do not really invite them to come for the fairs, but uh, yeah, we get their support to allow their women to come for the, for the fairs. Then finally, something to add on the capacity building. Uh, time could not allow us maybe to exhaust everything, but it's an opportunity for me to also add on what Dr. Green was talking about that training. Yes, yeah, still within our U54 consortia, we have uh, support for fellows, three fellows, one PhD student uh, who is being supported with uh, pilot funds for pilot projects. And uh, I think they are utilizing that well. Then we've also contributed, as you say, that capacity building is a whole thing to the institution and whatever. So where we are doing these researches, for example, we have built a lot of capacity in the Kawempe Cervical Cancer Screening Clinic, and this is uh, benefiting wider population. We have built capacity for the Uganda Cancer Institute Cervical Cancer Screening Clinic. We support them with equipment, we support them with supplies, so that more people, even beyond the research interests, may benefit from, from the service. Okay, any other questions online uh, or in-house before we conclude this? Guys online, anything? Okay, I, th I think we have come to the end of day one. And I want to take this opportunity to sincerely thank one, the members here, to sit up to this time. I, I sincerely thank you, and I hope you have learned a lot. Two, I want to thank my co-MC, Sarah, who was here at the second session. And three, I want to thank the organizing committee. They really have done good work. And the IT, IT team in particular. And then lastly, our presenters. Because without you, <laughs> there's no science fair. 
And I want to invite you to tomorrow, one of the most exciting days. Come and hear from Professor Yuka the next 20 years of IDI. And that's where you can actually craft your path. <laughs> never, never miss that. On top of that, at two, we have a mentorship session led by senior women scientists. And the chair is Professor Katriona. Please come and tap the blessings and get the knowledge for the next 20 years. Thank you so much and see you tomorrow. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. Have a lovely day.